Chapter 15, Meeting with the Devil It was already late at night as Haruzan Sarutobi had finalized the amount of paperwork for the day. The preparations for the Chunin exam's last phase was well underway with all the invitations already sent and all the dignitaries' attendance confirmation. Of course, some nobles had their own security detail, so the village had to account for them as well. The list of updated visitors were then set for screening by the Anbu personnel together with the Jonin commander. With that out of the way, Hiruzen only had to accommodate the shinobi visitors from other villages. In this case, so far, only the Kazekage had confirmed their presence. Other shinobi leaders were invited as well, but since there were no Jinan from other villages, it was rather obvious that neither Kiri, Kumo or Iwo would come. It would be rather surprising and suspicious, otherwise. Lighting up his pipe, the Sandaime Hokage now took his sweet time relaxing in the dark confines of his office, taking advantage of the full moon outside. Normally, the entire building would be lit up, but sometimes the old war veteran Hokage preferred it this way. Well, with lights on, people would invite themselves in and it's rather late to indulge someone tonight. Of course, the old man wouldn't be called the professor if his senses were dulled, just because he was inside his own office, surrounded by his personal onbu detail. Hence why he couldn't help but chuckle while puffing on his pipe. To believe that not one but two of my students would suddenly find the urge to revisit their own home. A couple of the Anbu hidden in the shadows looked at one another, wondering what was going on, before a chuckle alerted them. I don't know what you're talking about old man, all I'm interested in is keeping my research updated for my books. The Hokage just smiled in acknowledgement, before looking at the sudden appearance by his office window. A man with long white hair tied in a ponytail, wearing a short green shirt kimono and matching pants, under which he wore mesh armor that is visible at his wrists and ankles. He also wore hand guards, a black belt, traditional Japanese wooden sandals and a red haori with two yellow circles on each side. A giant scroll strapped on his back completed the appearance of the Sanin Jiraiya. His sudden and subtle appearance inside one of the most guarded places of Konoha, made everyone on edge, but the Anbu detail relaxed once they knew who this person was. I see, well I'm glad you warned me beforehand. At the very least, I will know to expect the increase in the list of complaints from the female population. His student chuckled and crossed his arms. I wonder why you bothered having your shinobi to search for me, sensei. The old man Hokage puffed more of his pipe, before getting off his chair and approaching the window of his office. The reason for that is quite clear, Jiraiya, as I'm sure you are aware, Jiraiya chuckled and placed his hands on his waist. As of right now, it's unclear what Orochimaru intends on doing. The village is hosting the Chunin exams and can't really afford to be on the lookout for an S-ranked criminal, lurking within our streets. Which is why I wish for you to stay put for now. The spy network could be set aside for this short while. The white-haired Sanin grunted at the order, perhaps the first order in quite a while, but he acquiesced in the end. Ha, huh, understood. I guess I can take the time and check on Konoha's onsens to pass the time, Hiruzen chuckled at that. I would guess it's quite a troublesome task for you, ha. Huh? Both senior shinobi laughed at that, until Jiraiya decided to change the subject. How is he doing? Hiruzen smirked at that, he was actually wishing that Jiraiya had not taken this long to broach the subject. Oh, deciding to check up on him, out of the blue, as to why the sudden interest, I wonder. Jiraiya frowned at the sudden jab, but didn't comment, as Hiruzen continued. He is doing quite well, it seems. Young Naruto-kun has displayed such an amazing set of skills these last few months. The Jonin sensei are actually fighting between themselves to become a part of his education. It was quite surprising to me too. If he continues on this path, I wouldn't be surprised if he received the Chunin promotion on his first try. Jiraiya whistled in recognition at the old man's praise for the kid. Well, he has good genes, after all. I do wonder if it's time to introduce myself to him and see for myself this progress. Perhaps, teach him a thing or two. The old man Hokage frowned, looking at his student with accusatory eyes. It's never too late to take responsibility, Jiraiya. Don't go there, sensei. The surly response wasn't surprising. The Sanin Jiraiya was known for his philandering ways and a goof in many ways. But the Hokage knew his student had more depth than that. While it couldn't be said that it was merely a front, it ended up escalating after the death of the Yondaime Hokage. Hiruzen knew his student's pain, he knew it too well. In the past, he would have pushed further. But, he had learned to restrain his mouth regarding his students' traumas, all of them. To this day, all three of them were still dealing with it. I won't. Now, allow this old man to go home for the night, Jiraiya. 
If you do try to peek at women, do be subtle about it, you know, as a favor to me. I can't promise that. The Hokage just laughed at Jiraiya's now more upbeat response, knowing that Jiraiya could sneak up anywhere in the elemental nations without most shinobi catching up. It just so happens that the perverted Sanin enjoyed being caught, especially by gorgeous women. Equals 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 with Naruto equals equals equals. A week has passed since the end of the second phase of the Chunin exams and Naruto had opted to take camp inside the cave where he first met his mentor. He had heard from Kurinai that she had managed to find a Kenjutsu specialist for him, but this so-called specialist would only be able to tutor him, in a couple of weeks and for a limited amount of time, which suited Naruto just fine. To receive tutorship by an Anbu was exciting enough for him. Also, he had his own set of goals to finalize by that time, namely a new Sutan technique and further improve the level of his Sutan control. Reaching the Nidimes level would take him perhaps many years, despite Naruto's constant use of cage bunshine to shorten the time needed. What Naruto needed right now were techniques that he could use with the water inside his body. Neji is a fast, close-ranged fighter and won't allow Naruto to use wider-scale ninjutsu. As such, going for quick and precise attacks is preferable. The Sutan Suiten no Jutsu, water release, water bullet technique, not only is easy to perform, but it's a highly versatile technique to use for middle range. He had other strategies, but against the Byakugan, those were rather limited. Against Sasuke, Naruto took the opportunity that he wasn't using his Sharingan when the fight began, but Neji won't have that handicap. Genjutsu and even Fuwinjutsu would be useless for him. The Nidime Scroll had a very nasty Genjutsu for Naruto to learn, but it required almost perfect chakra control, not to mention ample time to practice. Locking the enemy inside a perpetual darkness would aid him against Neji, but he wouldn't be able to learn it in one month's time. Regarding Fuinjutsu, Naruto didn't think he would be able to hide it from the Byakugan. He could have tried asking for Hinata's help in this, but his teammate was still recovering from her own fight against Neji. With this, he had already devised a general strategy to use against Neji, but Naruto was somewhat clueless about what Neji could use against him. Hinata had already used some of the Hyuga techniques against him, but Neji was more advanced and considered a genius among the clan. So, not only offensive but defense maneuvers needed to be taken care of. Right now, Naruto was taking a seat in the middle of the lake inside the cave, while extending his chakra throughout the water. Despite doing this exercise for a long time now, every time he closed his eyes, Naruto felt himself practically becoming one with the element. And every time he reached this state it felt like he was being observed by the Naidaim Hokage. The image would be forever engraved in his mind, the stern visage, the constant frown on both his mouth and eyebrows, with his arms crossed and the familiar and nostalgic throat sound that showed his displeasure at one of Naruto's mistakes. Not to mention the constant water whip that was ready to be used the second Naruto made a mistake, and boy were they many, especially in the beginning. Naruto stopped his exercise as soon as he stopped feeling his legs and he heard his stomach growling. Okay, guess it's time for some lunch. Opening his eyes and standing up, he turned to see ten clones fighting each other in pairs, while sticking to the slippery cave walls. He had one pair fighting using taijutsu, others with kunai and two pairs with kenjutsu. However, much to his lament, some of the clones started using ninjutsu as well. Sometimes, his clones tended to have a mind of their own and decided not to play by the rules. So, before they could destroy the sacred place, Naruto ended up releasing all of them. Sorting the gathered memory and experience from the clones, Naruto then walked outside the cave, before covering his eyes at the strong sun that suddenly reached him. There was a nice little stream of water nearby where Naruto could find some fish for lunch. However, the blonde was surprised when he heard four different sets of voices nearby. Three of them were easily enough to spot as he saw what appeared to be three women bathing together while throwing water at each other. The fourth sound was better described as giggling and it was coming from a small forest close to the water stream where Naruto would fish and where the women were bathing. The Janan became curious and walked closer to the sound, until he found what appeared to be an old man crouched behind some bushes, using a monocular. From the direction the old geezer was looking, it was clear that he was ogling at the three women. Oyo Jisen, what are you doing? The long white-haired man, though, didn't stop giggling and mumbling some incoherent words, probably about the three women bathing. Oi, I'm talking to you. This time, Naruto poked this strange man on his right shoulder, and he received a dismissive wave in return. Scram it kid, can't you see that I'm busy? A small tick appeared on Naruto's forehead, but he reined in his temper. His stomach was complaining too much and Naruto sometimes got cranky when he was hungry. Still, 
he had decided to ignore the perverted old man, before going back to the water stream and walking on top of the water, ignoring the women staring at him in awe at the display. In no time, Naruto got five fishes for himself and then gathered some wood for the fire. While waiting for his lunch to cook, Naruto took a seat close to the fire, while taking some time off from his training. It was nice sometimes to allow his body to cool off for a while after a gruesome training session. So, once the smell of cooked fish hit his nostrils, Naruto grabbed the first one and started eating. By the third fish, Naruto saw the same old man from before standing next to him. That's some nice fish you got there Gaki, mind sharing one? Naruto was still chewing on this third fish as he looked at the stranger. By looks alone, Naruto was clueless about who this old man was. He had a headband alright, meaning he was a shinobi, but he didn't recognize a hidden village with the oil symbol. Also, based on his sensor skills, it was quite obvious that this man was high jonin level, dare Naruto say that this guy was on par with the Sandaime, which was quite frightening. Though, the Jinan at least attempted to hide his surprise. I thought you were busy ogling at those women, but sure help yourself. Jiraiya simply smirked and took a seat next to Naruto, before picking up one of the fish still being cooked. I was indeed, checking them for my research. Naruto took the last fish and finished it quickly before this strange old man grabbed the last one, while ruminating about the next part of his own training, not much inclined into keeping a conversation with a stranger. Jiraiya, for his part, kept on eating his fish, subtly observing the quiet blonde in the meantime. While the Sanin didn't bother checking on him much these last few years, Jiraiya did remember that the kid was quite the hyperactive one in the academy. Naruto, then, realized that the old man was looking at him. So, ah, I don't think I've ever seen you around. You must be a shinobi based on that headband and the scroll on your back. Jiraiya also remembered Naruto being more aloof in the academy and not as attentive on details like this. The Sandaime did say that Naruto has improved. Naruto then saw the strange man behave even more strangely if possible, standing up and forming a kabuki pose. Ha, huh, I am not just a shinobi kid. I am the shinobi. The high and mighty Gama Sanin, Jiraiya. Jiraiya was counting on various possible reactions based on his boisterous introduction. However, when Naruto just blinked twice unimpressed, before staring at Jiraiya, the Gama Sanin stopped posing and awkwardly cleared his throat. Naruto, for his part, became quite confused. If he was speaking the truth about being one of the Sanin, then Naruto truly wondered if all the Sanin were this weird. Since he didn't get to meet Orochimaru, Jiraiya was actually the first Sanin he laid his eyes on. Ah, are all the Sanin like you, then? Jiraiya snorted at the comparison. No, I am one of a kind. I see, well, it's nice meeting you. I will have to get back to my training now. Naruto bowed slightly in respect and then turned his back on Jiraiya, but the Sanin quickly appeared in front of Naruto. Wow there, what's the rush? I didn't even get your name, kid. Oh right, sorry, Uzumaki Naruto. Now excuse me. Jiraiya just placed his hand on Naruto's shoulder before the Jinan tried to turn again. There you go, trying to flee again. So, why are you training so hard for? Naruto sighed at the strange insistence but decided to humor the old man for a bit. Perhaps after asking his questions, Jiraiya would leave him alone. I am training for the Chunin exam finals and my first fight is against a Hyuga one year my senior. Oh that's interesting, if you want some pointers, just ask and the gallant Jiraiya shall provide. You don't need to bother with me, I bet you must have more important things to do, thanks for the offer, though. Once more, Naruto tried leaving, but once more Jiraiya stopped him this time with a heavy sigh. He didn't believe that Naruto would openly refuse help especially not from him of all people. It kind of stung the perverted Sanin to realize that the Jinan just didn't want much to do with him, though he should have realized the consequence of not showing up to check on him much. Still, it couldn't be said that Jiraiya just gave up that easily. You know Gaki, many shinobi out there would thank the heavens to be tutored by the one who taught the Yondaime Hokage. This time it got the desired effect as he had finally got the kid's attention. Wow, seriously. You taught the Yondaime? Before meeting the Naidaime, Naruto worshipped the Yondaime Hokage. Ha ha, sure did. Now are you interested in me helping you? I guess, it's just that I don't want to focus on something that it would take too long to learn and master. After Hyuga Neji, there are also other fights to plan for. Jiraiya nodded in approval at the kid's concern. It's a good thinking indeed to focus on mastering what you already know instead of trying to learn something new in such a short amount of time. Well, 
I happen to have a nifty little technique to teach you. It's easy to learn and you can use in plenty of situations. Jiraiya could tell that Naruto's chakra capacity was high enough, which surprised him. Jiraiya at first wanted to teach the kid to use the fox's chakra for this, but it wasn't needed, at least not right now. It's called Kushios no Jutsu, summoning technique. Naruto's mouth opened slightly and Jiraiya could have sworn that a little drool came out. Really, you are teaching me the Kushios, but you have to have a summoning contract for that, right? The Sanin was caught by surprise that the kid knew about this technique, before he got to explain what it is. Oh you seem to know your stuff kid, interesting. Yes, you need to form a summoning contract with an animal species and through space and time, you summon the animal to aid you through ninjutsu. It just so happens that I have the contract with the toads, just like I gave it to the Yondame, when he was your age. The glint in Naruto's eyes at the prospect of having the same contract as the Yondame was simply too much to pass by. So, how do I start? Jiraiya smiled and sacrificed some blood from his finger, before going through a small sequence of hand seals. When Jiraiya slammed his hand on the ground, Naruto focused on the written kanji that spread on the floor, before the sanin was enveloped in smoke. Instantly, Naruto's sensor caught another presence and when the smoke settled, he was in awe when he saw Jiraiya standing on top of a large red toad carrying a scroll on its mouth. The toad's tongue then expanded and the scroll was handed to Naruto. Open that scroll and sign your name in blood, Naruto. The Janan did as instructed and opened it to see many empty slots with only two names written. Naruto did as instructed and opened it to see many slots already signed. Quickly doing as instructed, he bit his finger and signed his name with blood. Jiraiya admitted to being quite enthused about the kid's first attempt. Usually, the Kushios required a considerable amount of chakra just to summon the regular-sized toads. For Naruto to for instance summon the giant toads, he would need the aid of the fox's chakra for that. However, there are many toads that Naruto could summon with the chakra he is right now at his disposal. Now, Perform the hand seal sequence and release a strong amount of chakra at once. The blonde Janan looked back at his sensei for the day with a question mark clearly on his face. What is it, Gaki? You said just now, a strong amount of chakra. But could you give me an estimate of the necessary amount? For instance, the amount of a B-ranked ninjutsu would suffice? Now, Jiraiya understood why the kid was drawing the attention of the other teachers. Wow, that would be a nice amount, yeah you could use that much and summon a kick-ass toad. Go for it. Naruto nodded and went through the hand seal sequence he saw Jiraiya perform, before slamming his stretched hand on the ground. Just like the white-haired Sanin, an assortment of kanji spread around Naruto's hand, before a sizable smoke erupted around him, making Jiraiya smirk knowingly. Yeah, good genes, indeed. While he didn't know which toad would appear, he knew the kid's first attempt to be successful. When the smoke was released, Jiraiya whistled in great appreciation. Naruto blinked twice at the sudden appearance, before he looked quite ecstatic as well. For as this toad in Jiraiya's mind was similar in appearance to one of his favorites named Gamahiro, though instead of having two swords strapped on its back, this toad carried a single white-handle katana sword strapped on a black obi. And this toad was perhaps the same size as the toad that Jiraiya was standing on right now. Wow Gaki, are you sure you're just a Janan? Jiraiya asked in a sincere but baffled question and Naruto couldn't help but scratch his head at the praise. Jiraiya then chuckled at his reaction. So you're our new summoner huh, what's your name? Naruto then turned to the animal next to him and bowed in respect, earning a respectable nod from the animal who crossed its arms. Plus, the toad's eyes landed on Naruto's own sword as well. Ah, Uzumaki Naruto, a pleasure to meet you ah. Call me Gamatsurugi, sword, a pleasure to meet you as well, Uzumaki Naruto. I see you're a practitioner of the sword. Interesting. Feel free to call me anytime you need assistance. Naruto accepted, before Gamatsurugi released himself back to wherever the toads came from. Jiraiya had also released the toad that carried the scroll and landed safely on the ground, while he observed an introspective Naruto. A chuckle escaped from the perverted Sanin's mouth as he then turned his back on Naruto and was about to leave. Ah Jiraiya-sama, I appreciate you teaching me the Kushios, thanks a lot. Jiraiya always prided himself of being a pervert and able to get a rise out of everyone for his perks. However, the genuine expression of appreciation on Naruto's face was too much for Jiraiya. It somewhat made the perverted Sanin remind himself of the Yondame Hokage. A genius in the making quite like Naruto is and also respectful to others, which is a surprise, considering that, to his knowledge, the kid pretty much had no one to raise him at least not properly. 
Stop with the Samadhar Gaki. Call me Jiraiya and you're welcome. I could give you more if you wish. The night is still young after all. Naruto smiled at the offer and appreciated. Wow, this is too much already. But, thank you, once more, Jiraiya. I still need to train more. Jiraiya this time didn't offer any resistance as he saw the kid wave goodbye and run up the water stream, just as the sky turned orange. The Sanin found the kid quite intriguing as he remembered Hiruzen's words the other day about how Naruto was surprising everyone with his abilities. For him to grasp the concept of the Kushio so fast means that the kid must have at least a basic to intermediate knowledge of Fuinjutsu and space-time ninjutsu. Plus, the fact that Naruto had summoned a warrior toad on his first try showed Jiraiya that the kid has a firm grasp of his own chakra capacity, which was even more surprising. Having not only an abundance of his own chakra, plus the colossal chakra from the Kyubi no Yoko, meant that the kid would find chakra control to be his dire weakness. Now, the perverted Sanin found himself quite curious about what else Naruto could do. Initially, I was staying because Sensei ordered me to, but now I'm actually curious to see the Gaki's matches. Equals 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 one week later equals equals equals. With only two weeks left for the finals, Naruto had opted to change a couple of things in his training regimen. The reason being that today was the day that Kurenai would introduce him to his Kenjutsu tutor, and he figured that keeping his stamina at optimal levels was paramount for a physically demanding training. Just remembering the level of concentration needed to train the art of the sword under the Nidime was tortuous enough. As such, he now found himself dressed in only his pants as he took a seat on top of Gamot Tsurugi's head, while both calmly meditated beneath one of the many waterfalls located in the outskirts of the village. Naruto had often summoned his newfound partner ever since he learned how to summon from Jiraiya. They would train together as Naruto found out that Gamot Tsurugi not only was a sword practitioner but a suit and user as well as all toads tends to be. Hell, he was even able to expel oil from his mouth if needed be, which was quite the tool to have. Despite him not knowing any katan techniques, there was always the nasty explosive tag to use to ignite the oil beam. Oh the possibilities. As such, right now, as he calmly meditated, Naruto's consciousness slowly drifted from the outside world into the inside world. Ever since he learned this exercise from the Nidime, Naruto had continuously passed his chakra through each and every chakra coil inside his body. Doing this, allowed him to ease the strain both in his chakra as well as his mind as he focused solely on the feel of his chakra. Right now, there were no Chunin exams, no mission to focus on, no skill he needed to grasp, nothing. Just the continuous and relaxing feeling of passing his chakra throughout his Tenketsu. So immersed was him that when Naruto next opened his eyes, he was not at the lake with the waterfall, but rather inside what appeared to be a rather creepy and dark sewage system of some kind with pipes on the walls and water reaching his ankles. He could see blue energy passing through the pipes at a fast speed. When he touched one of the pipes, familiarity overcame him at the feel of his own chakra. However, Naruto frowned once he looked at the pipes from the adjacent wall. There was energy passing through those as well, but it was red not blue. As soon as he touched the pipes with the red energy, Naruto was surprised to hear a beastly growl nearby. What the hell is that? The Jinan started walking slowly towards the sound as he wondered what could possibly be. Considering that he is somehow inside his own mind, since he had felt his own chakra, Naruto shuddered to believe this could be what he was thinking. Despite the Nidime telling Naruto that he was the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Yoko, this was the first time that Naruto ever came close to knowing just what that precisely entailed. And as he walked through the sewage walls, he then stepped inside a vast room that had an enormous looking cage in the middle. Looking up, he saw the pipes from before going inside the cage as well. His eyes also focused on the single seal parchment that stood in the middle of the cage. He could also hear the heavy growl inside as well and he gulped in fright at the possibility of seeing the very creature that made his life a living hell for the first years of his life. True to his fear, the same red energy appeared inside the cage, followed by long teeth and bloody red eyes that looked at Naruto promising bloody murder. So, I finally get to meet my jailer, ha, huh? ever since the Nidime Hokage told you about me, I truly expected you to appear sooner. Naruto gasped at the mention of the name, before wondering just how much the fox knows. Truth be told, this was the first time Naruto was having a conversation with someone about the very reason why he had evolved so much. The fox, for his part, merely laughed at the surprise, already knowing deep down about the human being's true nature. Ha, huh, what, so you keep on using everyone around you meanwhile you lie to all of them about what truly happened to you three years ago, interesting. No, actually, not interesting, it's quite the very foundation of you humans, 
to hold on to lies and deceit. Truly makes me hate your species beyond measure. Naruto recovered fast when he heard the accusation coming from the gigantic fox. What are you talking about, I don't use anyone, and I certainly did not lie to anyone. QB just chuckled at the denial. Imbecile, you cannot hide from me, I see through you. Everyone is so surprised and so astonished about your so-called growth, your so-called skills, how pathetic. Instead of showing everyone what you can do, you hide it like a worthless human. You complain about the old geezer Hokage for not telling you about me, but you also keep secrets from him, from everyone. So tell me, you still naively believe you don't take advantage of your peers, of your sensei, especially that woman who seems so eager to teach Genjutsu to you. And they say I'm the demon. I don't use Kurenai sensei, I helped her save Yakumo after she helped me with Genjutsu. So stop with your accusation here. Naruto was finding this conversation very annoying indeed. True, that Naruto kept his real growth from everyone, but that's what it means to be a shinobi. To reveal everything you can do means ridding the advantage of surprise. Though, Naruto was finding that perhaps the fox cared little about the workings of the shinobi mindset. What's more pathetic is to see your denial, but I actually grew tired of looking at your worthless face, human. Speak your mind, here and now. Naruto took a step back as the fox started screaming at him now. What you crave is quite clear, it's what you all crave, you and everyone else. It's power isn't it, you want my chakra to be stronger. You wish to demand I give you my chakra. Come on, human, speak. I don't want anything. No sooner had Naruto said his piece and quite vigorously, the fox stopped his oppressive nature and turned to look at his jailer more closely. Oh. What nonsense are you speaking, I know how much you desire to be strong. You're a fool if you think you can fool me. Naruto tried to hold his ground, but this amount of killing intent was at least a hundred times what both the Nidaim and Zabuza could produce combined. Still, the blonde tried holding his own. They were inside his own mind after all. I meant what I said, QB. Everything I conquered I did with my own sweat, my own chakra. Sure, I had help. I won't deny that I did. The Nidaim helped shape my foundation, since the academy wouldn't even bother looking at me. It was thanks to him that I am where I am right now. Without a good foundation, everything else falls apart. And the others helped me as well. Asuma Sensei, Kurenai Sensei, Kasuki Oji-san and even Jiraiya with the summoning just now. It's thanks to them, I am now more complete and thanks to them I am able to grow stronger now, using my own strength from here on out. This time, human and demon looked at each other's eyes, while the fox growled in defiance at Naruto's words. Still, Naruto needed to address the elephant in the room, and he did so by looking down as his own image looked back at him from the water reflection. I don't know why you are in here or why the Yondaime placed you here, no one so far has decided to explain it to me and, quite frankly, I fear that I won't enjoy it when the truth finally comes, you know. I do know it sucks for you to be trapped here, instead of outside. I also do know and feel the hatred that everyone has for me because of you. I can't say I have all the answers here. I don't even know if you wish for me to use your chakra or not. I don't even know why the hell I was chosen to become your warden. QB, this time, only kept his usual growl, while hearing Naruto speak. As of right now, the best I can say is that I hope that we at least talk about this more often and together come up with something, moving forward. Talk, ha, huh, that's precious. Naruto also found himself concurring with an easing smile, despite the situation. He he, I know it's not much but at least it's better than me coming in here and demanding your chakra, isn't it? Hardly any better, just by looking at your blue eyes and blonde hair makes me want to rip your body to shreds. So, if you don't wish for my power, then be gone from my sight. Before Naruto could even respond, wondering what his eyes and hair color has to do with anything, the fox had thrown him out by force. When Naruto next opened his eyes, he found himself breathless and he was shaking a bit, much to his own surprise. Another surprise came when he opened his eyes and saw Kurenai Sensei standing close to the shore together with a long purple-haired Anbu woman by her side, both of them facing his direction. Deciding to wonder about the conversation he had with the fox for another time, Naruto stood up from Gamatsurugi's head and released the summon after appreciating the help. Meanwhile, Kurenai and the Anbu were busy conversing amongst each other, as Naruto waved at her from the lake. The Jinan crossed the lake in no time and grabbed the top of his blue outfit before hurling it on top of his shoulder. Hi there Naruto, I didn't know you can summon toads. The Janan scratched his head at the accusation laced in Kurenai's words. Well, I couldn't until just a week ago when I met Jiraiya. 
he decided to give me the contract to summon toads. Naruto found it strange that both Kurenai and Yuagao groaned at the mention of the Sanin's name. Little to his knowledge, pretty much every Chunin and above Kunoichi had been victimized by the Pebert's attempts of peeking. Why, what's wrong? Nothing. Kurenai responded with a sigh. It's just that let's say that his hobbies leave much to be desired and let's leave it at that. Naruto saw the female Anbu nodding along and then Naruto remembered just how he came to know the Sanin. Oh, yeah, when I first saw him, he was peeking at three women bathing and he was giggling, now I understand. Still, the boy caught the trap he ended up falling into when he saw the ire coming from the brunette sensei. It was just him peeking, Naruto? Naruto had quickly raised both hands at Kurenai to appease her. The Anbu was also discreetly raising her own killing intent. Wah, no, I didn't do anything. I was training nearby and went to the river when those women were bathing to catch some fishes for lunch. Jiraiya was already there looking at them with his monocular. Ha, huh, I will give you the benefit of the doubt for now, just don't follow in Jiraiya-sama's example. Clearing her throat, Kurenai then introduced Naruto to her Anbu friend. Well, like I promised, I managed to find you a Kenjutsu user to tutor you for the exams, though I can't tell you her name as you probably already know why. Naruto nodded and bowed at the female Anbu. Yes, I understand, though I kind of recognize the mask and the long purple hair. For what it's worth, I'm sorry for making you guys chase me around the village all those times. Kurenai looked at the Anbu, surprised to hear a chuckle, followed by her friend's comeback. Yeah, it was quite a hassle to chase a nine-year-old throughout the village, for sure, I didn't sign into Anbu for this. Though, it was quite irritating when you managed to evade us, evade me on occasion. The Anbu placed both hands on her hips and even inclined her body in a false accusatory mode, though Naruto didn't sense any form of malice coming from her. Kurenai found it quite humorous to see the interaction. Still, it's been a couple of weeks since she last saw him and she could tell that he has been training vigorously. Well, once again, I apologize and I appreciate you taking time out of your hefty schedule to help Ajanan out. Kurenai asked for my help, said that you're quite a gifted student, always eager to learn. Though, I won't be able to accompany you for long, I can still give you some pointers here and there. I understand, with the Chunin exam's finals approaching, security is a major concern. Though, I don't know how I should address you. Anbu-san, Niko-san, Niko-sensei? Oh Niko-sensei, I like the sound of that. I never had a student before. Kurenai by this point figured that she would leave the pair alone for now, so she bid them goodbye, saying that she needed to meet with Shino in his compound. Oh Kurenai sensei do you know about Hinata? How are her injuries? The brunette sensei turned to answer him. Naruto has been training ever since the end of the second phase and felt guilty for not checking on his teammates. Yes, she is much better now. She comes to my house quite often nowadays to hang out with Yakumo. We will all cheer for you in the finals, Naruto-kun. So train hard and make us proud. Will do. Thank you, Kurenai-sensei. The sensei then bid both Naruto and Yugao goodbye, leaving them alone. Okay then Naruto, please put back on your clothes and let us begin. Naruto muttered a quick apology and Yugao waved him off. Now, I won't bother trying to imprint a style on you. We don't have much time for that and I don't believe this is what you're looking for. Instead, I will attempt to correct any flaws I see in your movements while we spar. First, show me your ninjato. Naruto, now fully clothed, showed the sword while Yuagao inspected it from the hilt to the tip of the blade. Okay, good, you take good care of your weapon. That's an important part and I'm pleased that my first student understands that. Now, let's stop wasting both of our time here. The training ground then became alive with the noise of exertion from both parties and the sound of steel meeting steel as Yuagao focused on Naruto's footing as well as his blade reach, giving him pointers here and there. Equals 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 last week before the finals equals equals equals. With one week left for the finals and with Nico back in Anbu coordinating the village security, Naruto now found himself wandering close to the Nara compound. As he came back to the village, he managed to make a quick visit to Kurenai's house, knowing that Hinata and Yakumo were there as well. He was thrilled to see that she was almost completely healed after her fight with Neji. Hinata had expressed her concerns for Naruto perhaps taking his fight against Neji too far because of Neji's words to her in the second phase. Even if Naruto had found them distasteful, he was proud of her for giving the elder Hyuga quite the fight. So, right now, Naruto had stepped inside the Nara's main house and saw his teammate and their sensei locked in a shogi match, much to Naruto's chuckle. 
So this was Shikamaru's idea of training, in the end. Not that he was surprised. Hi there Shika, Asuma-sensei. Both players looked away from the shogi board and greeted the blonde, before Naruto took a seat close to them. Asuma had made his move, before turning to his other student. So Naruto, I trust that your training was fruitful these last three weeks. I had a nice chat with Jiraiya-sama and he gave me much praise about your accomplishments, Naruto chuckled at that, before Shikamaru looked at his friend. Wow, Naruto was tutored by Jiraiya of the Sanin? Shikamaru knew that he would eventually face Naruto if he wins against Tamari. Though, if Shika had any doubts that he could win against his teammate, he now firmly believed it would be best to simply withdraw. The Nara Brainiac had already thought of various scenarios for this exact battle and in none of those, he could see himself winning. I wouldn't say tutored, exactly. He just taught me one technique, that's all. We spent less than a day together. Asuma flinched at the move that Shikamaru made, before addressing Naruto. Kurenai sensei also told me about your other tutor. Oh don't worry, I won't tell to Shikamaru who or what you trained in. Don't bother, I will count my blessings by passing the first round. Shikamaru replied, before placing the final piece. This is my win, Asuma sensei. The Jonin sensei groaned in displeasure at losing once more. Yeah, I guess you did, Naruto laughed, as he saw the Nara yawn after the match and walk inside his house, but not before addressing Naruto. Naruto, after you and Asuma sensei trained today, my nagging mother told me to invite you to dinner. The blonde Janan nodded. Sure thing, tell Yoshino Obasan I will be here for dinner. Thanks. Shikamaru then closed the door, before Asuma got up and gave Naruto one of his trench knives. Okay Naruto, for this last week, we shall focus on your wind manipulation. The goal here is to focus both on power and control. Before Naruto asked for more clarification, he gasped once Asuma's own trench knife hummed to life in an explosion of wind chakra. Normally, the wind chakra would only surround the weapon, but right now the energy has grown so much that it resembles more like a sword made of wind. I will warn you beforehand that this will place great strain on your chakra coils. But for you to learn the more powerful and wider range wind techniques, you will need to get used to this feeling. Now, try to imitate what I'm doing. The blonde nodded and then focused wind chakra through the knife he was holding. Asuma approved as he saw the kid start small and then slowly add more chakra. He could see Naruto flinch and spasm on occasion. Wind chakra needs constant training and refinement. Like Asuma said, the wind change in chakra nature splits chakra in two and grinds them together. However, adding more power to it, it's easy to lose focus on containment, hence the reason for the pain Naruto was feeling right now. And Asuma smirked at that, knowing about his own bad experiences with it, before getting accustomed to it. Truth be told, the bearded Jonin never did focus on wider range techniques with Futon, but he got the feeling that with Naruto's chakra, his student could become a powerhouse. That's it, keep this up Naruto. Try keeping like this for 20 minutes and rest for 10. For my satisfaction, you'll be repeating this cycle at least 10 times. Wow, Asuma sensei, ah, that's kind of a vicious training, Asuma chuckled at the pained expression on his students. Ha, huh, consider it payback for ditching your sensei, now stop complaining. Naruto, despite the pain, managed to sweat drop at the accusation. Yeah, well, I deserve that, ah. Asuma waited three weeks for this as he kept quiet while hearing Jiraiya, Kurenai and even Yugao relaying about Naruto's training, praising him through it all. And since their training was happening close to the Nara compound, the entire Nara family heard it. Shikamaru groaned at his teammate's drive, while he had to listen to his mother saying that she wished that he would have half of Naruto's desire to improve. Meanwhile, Shikamaru's father Shikaku simply snickered both at Naruto for complaining about the pain and Shikamaru for trying to cover his ears while his nagging mother yelling at him. While Naruto trained his ass off, other Janan were also doing the exact same thing. Like Kakashi promised, he had focused on training Sakura and has even helped her develop her affinity for Doden and Jutsu, while slightly encouraging her to use her perfect chakra control for Genjutsu. Sasuke had even approached them and helped, despite his initial protest of wanting Kakashi to train him as well. The Uchiha still didn't swallow what Naruto did to him by using Sasuke's hatred for his brother against the Uchiha and it took Kakashi some time to explain that Naruto didn't actually use his brother's image, but rather enforced Sasuke's worst nightmare. Still, the Uchiha now wished to have a rematch more than ever with Naruto. Sakura sighed in dismay at that. She wondered what would have happened to Sasuke's ego had Naruto-senpai truly gone all out in that fight. 
Neji and Tenten trained together after the Hugo was healed. At first, Neji felt enraged that Hinata gave him so much trouble, but then he came to his senses. After all, he was pleased that his cousin was taking things seriously. Despite being a year older, Neji knew not to underestimate his next opponent. Lee was actually the only one who witnessed Naruto's fight against the Uchiha and despite his teammate still in the hospital recuperating from his injuries, Lee had explained with quite the enthusiasm how Naruto had defeated the Uchiha using Genjutsu, Fu and Jutsu and Kenjutsu. Neji knew from his cousin how much Naruto influenced herself moving forward. And despite Hinata apologizing to Neji for not betraying her own teammate by saying what he can do, Hinata had an entire list of good things to say about him. As such, with the exams approaching, the Janan from Konoha felt themselves ready for the next step towards the urine promotion. Chapter 16, Chunin Exams Part 3 By the end of the month between the second and third phases of the Chunin exams, the hidden village in the leaves became filled with all sorts of people, visitors, nobles, vendors, customers, merchants and even shinobi who would be participating in the final stage of the exams. As such, the Chunin, Jounin and even Anbu personnel worked day and night to ensure that everything went smoothly or as smoothly as possible. That's why it came as disturbing to the higher-ups when a mangled corpse was later found by the Anbu scout one day before the exams. One of the Anbu members, a long purple-haired woman wearing a cat mask, found herself having out-of-body experience as she looked down to see the dead body of her beloved. Hayate. Being an Anbu meant walking side by side with death almost every day. As such, witnessing the death of her teammates ended up being a part of the job description. Hence why none of her peers appeared overly shocked about seeing Hayate dead on the ground. However, witnessing the love of her life like this made Yuigao freeze. Her analytical mind fought bravely to overcome the huge pain in her heart, but eventually lost. Suddenly, her shoulders trembled with the mask covering the tears flowing from her eyes. Despite being the team's second in command, right now protocol just wasn't in her mind as she shunshined away, leaving her team behind to deal with the situation. Equals 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 the Hokage's office equals equals equals. Right after the event with Hayate's death, the Hokage had gathered all the Jounin to tell them the news. I had gathered everyone to relay the terrible news. This morning, a team from Anbu had found Gekko Hayate dead. Immediately after the Hokage relayed the terrible news, murmurs started to spread amongst the Jounin. The rumors had quickly started, of course. The fact that every available Jounin stood inside the village walls was of course troubling. If what happened to Hayate happened in a mission outside village walls was one thing, but with him here, no doubt this was the work of one of the shinobi teams from the other villages. But that sprang a thousand questions in itself. While Gekko Hayate was a Tokubutsu Jounin, his fame wasn't that high in the bounty station. No one would have risked breaching the village, risking arrest or worse, to hunt Hayate. And the Anbu personnel knew each and every shinobi from the other villages that came for the Chunin exams. None of them even bothered looking at the Chunin exams proctor, much less target him specifically. Anko and Kurenai came together to the meeting and both flinched at the news. Most of all, both were of the same mind, to find you a gao as soon as possible to be there for their friend. Is there any leads as to who could have done this, Hokage-sama? The Hokage turned to the aloof Kakashi. The details are scarce, I'm afraid. Traces of wind chakra were found in a first analysis, but we simply can't come to any conclusions at this point. As soon as this precise piece of evidence became known, everyone immediately made the connection with a shinobi from Sonagakur. And of course, the Hokage knew what everyone was thinking as soon as he opened his mouth. And I know that most of you would point fingers at one of the shinobi from Suna. Right now, I have the Anbu team scouting the Suna shinobi from the shadows, but so far nothing out of the norm. It was clear to the elder Hokage, though, that his Jounin personnel didn't enjoy hearing that their leader was seemingly dismissing Suna's involvement in this matter. What are your orders, Hokage-sama? The Hokage then turned to Iviki, in deep ponder as he puffed the pipe. Even though I can't immediately accuse Suna for Hayate's murder, whatever happened or whoever did this have relation to the Chunin exams. Stating the obvious, in everyone's mind. As such, placing every one of you in the stands is paramount right now. Iviki, gather with Shikaku and the Anbu personnel to increase security outside the stadium. Right now, we must at the ready for any possible threats looming, both inside and outside the stadium. Dismissed. No sooner had the Hokage said so, all available Jounin left the room in a shunshine, leaving the Hokage alone. Even his personal advisors had left, leaving Hiruzen Sarutobi alone. The walls close to Hiruzen's position suddenly shifted, before Jiraiya revealed himself, hidden in the room the entire time. 
What have you found thus far? As you said, none of the shinobi from Suna are behaving any differently. And no sign of Orochimaru as well, sensei. Hiruzen frowned at that. His prodigious student was slippery like that. Sneaking in and out of anywhere was one of the trades that made the snake sanin so dangerous. The Kaze Kage is due to arrive tomorrow, isn't he? Hiruzen nodded briefly, already knowing what his student was thinking. I have already placed a team of Anbu to escort him in his entourage since they crossed fire country. While the move in itself would cause suspicion, it is not outside the norm. Jiraiya scratched his chin, before turning to his sensei once more. Do you want me to stand by your side in the arena, tomorrow? Despite it being a show of strength, it's not like Konoha to show its hand beforehand. No, that would be ill-advised. If Orochimaru is truly behind all of this, then he will show himself when we least expect him to. It's best that you remain hidden until the threat is revealed. Jiraiya knew his sensei's line of thought and he didn't like it one bit. He will come for you, no doubt about that. Hiruzen nodded, concurring with his student. Indeed, but I can handle him if it comes to a direct standoff. It's the village that I'm worried about, Jiraiya. The Gama Sanin had his doubts leaving the Hokage alone against the snake. However, it would be naive to assume that Orochimaru won't place the village in jeopardy while he faced the Hokage. If it happens, this fight will be on the snake's terms. After all, a snake never attacks unless it's sure that the target won't be able to retaliate. However, Hiruzen was also quite lenient with the snake Sanin in the past. So, the perverted wondered if history would repeat itself if they faced each other. Hiruzen, for his part, took the Sanin's sudden quietness as humor. It could be said that Jiraiya was worried about his chances against the Sanin, or worried about the village, but Hiruzen couldn't really tell. What, you don't believe I can handle him, Jiraiya? I may be old, but I'm still more than able to teach my student a lesson or two. The Gama Sanin smirked at the old man's teasing, but it was an empty smile, quite unlike the Sanin's usual mood. Oh it's not that, I know how strong you can be, when pissed. The last time they sparred, Hiruzen mopped the floor with Jiraiya. What I doubt is whether or not you'll finally fight him seriously this time. As soon as Jiraiya finished the accusation, he saw the Hokage narrowing his eyebrows at him, even flaring his chakra and increasing his killing intent. Though, the pervert Sanin stared at the Hokage, just as serious. It was no secret between the elite of the village how Orochimaru's actions were only possible due to Hiruzen looking the other way at times. And despite sometimes leaving in denial about that, Hiruzen certainly couldn't fault Jiraiya for what he said. The hidden Anbu detail became uncomfortable in the room as the two powerhouses stared at each other. It was rare for most to see such tremendous energy nowadays, so one of the junior Anbu had fallen on the ground, with lack of air, due to the sudden attrition. After this, the pervert Sanin simply smirked, easing the situation. Well, see you tomorrow then, Sensei. The Hokage smirked with a nod as the Sanin left the room while the other Anbu assisted the unconscious junior Anbu. Equals 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 tuning exam stadium equals equals equals. The day of the exam finals, almost all of the Konoha citizens and the village's many visitors slowly marched towards the stadium. Many of the shinobi were already inside the stadium. The jounin were placed in different sections of the audience, while seemingly chatting and having a good time with one another. The chunin proctors were in one place, together with the jinan who participated in the exams. The most influential clans of the village had also a place for themselves, such as the Huga clan filling most of the seats. Many sets of white eyes and long robes filled the seats. However, one set of white eyes had chosen not to sit together with her family. Hinata had invited her best friend Yakumo to come together and cheer for Naruto and Shikamaru, though mainly for Naruto. The other Janan were seated together as well, with Ino and Choji sitting together with their respective clan members. Uchiha Sasuke was seated together with Kiba and Akamaru, though by the look on Sasuke's eyes, it was clear that he much preferred seating somewhere else. The Jaun and Sensei were all seated together, Kurenai, Kakashi, Asuma, and Gai. Anko had decided to tag along with her best friend as they looked down at the arena. Yesterday, right after leaving the Hokaye's office, both women had tried to search for the distraught Yuagao in pretty much all possible locations. Her house, which happened to be in a building filled with Anbu operatives, Yugao's favorite sushi restaurant and even the Anbu HQ where they would be sure that Yugao would be, but she was nowhere to be found. Kurenai had even gone to Naruto's training place to see if he had seen her, but Naruto had told her that it's been three days since Yugao sensei had last helped him train. Naruto was able to sense the distress in their chakra and became worried for his Kenjutsu sensei. 
Niko sensei couldn't spare him much of her time, because of the village's security, but they made do with the little time she had available and Naruto had found himself enjoying their spars immensely. Niko's tips had helped him immensely, in the end. Upon asking what happened with his temporary sensei, though Kuranai evaded the question, instead telling him to focus on his training for the exams. They had lastly tried in many of the village's bars and managed to find the distraught woman emptying her sorrows with a sake bottle. After that, they took Yugao back to Kuranai's house and took care of her the entire night. The poor woman had passed out in one of the rooms and hadn't woken up since. Do you think she will be alright? Kuranai exhaled hard at the question, pondering that herself. Despite needing to be here both for Shino's sake as well as the Hokaye's orders, Kuranai's heart went to her friend. Yuugao Chan is strong willed for sure, but she was head over heels for him. I can't imagine the pain she is in right now. The snake wielder then lifted her sleeves, before a brown snake came out. I've let one my snake summons to at least check on her from time to time, though I'd imagine that she can escape your house anytime and go back to the bar once more. They had talked extensively last night about whether or not they could keep the Anbu Kunoichi inside her house. Or if they ever should do that. No matter how much assistance they provide, unfortunately, this is something that Yugao needs to cope with. As both women's eyes flipped to Kakashi sitting next to Asuma, they knew that the scarecrow Jounin had gone through similar pains. Plus, Kakashi happened to be Yugao's role model while in Anbu. The man in question could very well play a role in aiding Yugao in this situation, but they doubted that Kakashi would effectively do anything about it. We should check on her the minute the exams are over, then. Anko nodded, concurring, before all eyes turned to the Hokaye seat just as the Kazekage arrived followed by two bodyguards. No sooner had the Hokage greeted the Kazekage and exchanged a few pleasantries, the Hokage had quickly announced the beginning of the Chunin exams as final round, before the Janan competitors entered the arena forming a line. Naruto, Neji, Shikamaru, Sakura, Dosu, Tamari, Konkuro, Shino, and Gara. They calmly entered the arena amongst the cheers of the crowd, before they gathered in the middle as a Konoha Jounin was there already waiting for them, wearing a blue bandana just like Hayate, though this man happened to be chewing a toothpick by the looks of things. Naruto was expecting that it would be the same proctor from the preliminaries. When the audience quieted down, the Jounin proctor named Shiranui Genma addressed the lined-up Jenins with the rules. Okay everyone, listen up. As you can see, the terrain is quite different than the other parts and this is a one-on-one -on -one fight until the last Jinan remains standing. The fights shall proceed until one is either dead or admits defeat, but I can step in at any time. Genma then allowed some time for everyone to acknowledge the rules or lack thereof, before continuing. Okay, so the first round is between Uzumaki Naruto and Hyuga Neji. The rest shall clear the arena right now. Shikamaru and Sakura had briefly wished good luck to Naruto, before the six Janan left the arena. Genma then stood on the side as Naruto and Neji at each other for a while. The two Janan had at each other for a while, both measuring each other up. However, before Genma could authorize the match, Naruto and Neji were quite surprised by the sudden noise from the crowd. It was not a noise of cheer, however, but of boos and curses and the blonde Janan didn't need to focus his hearing to see exactly what the crowd was saying. He looked around quietly as he observed the seemingly unison voice of the crowd patently obviously against him. His face betrayed nothing, already knowing how the village felt about him, still felt about him. This only helped him remember the last conversation he had with the fox and, strangely so, Naruto could sympathize with the fox's prejudgment on humans. After all, they were prejudging him right now, right? Amongst the crowd, the Janan looked around and were appalled at the sudden treatment. Hinata, in particular, looked saddened as her Byakugan could see Naruto's eyes as if he was standing right in front of her. She remembered the times when Naruto would be mistreated by the other teachers in the academy. How he would always take the blame, even though he was never to blame in the first place. Those scenes diminished in time and Hinata was surprised to see it coming to the surface once more. Yakumo looked saddened as well for her friend and remembered what Kuranai sensei said about Naruto housing the very demon who was responsible for wrecking the village 13 years ago. It was thanks to this example and her friend's bravery, that she learned to face and defeat her own demon. Like herself, Naruto's status as the fox's Jinchuriki was considered a top-level secret. The Jounin sensei wasn't much better either as Asuma and Kakashi had frowned at the crowd because of their behavior towards Naruto. And while Anko felt for the kid, as she knew quite well being on the receiving end of this same crowd, it was Kuranai's reaction that was the most surprising. She felt anger, rage and her fists trembled, wanting nothing but to shout to everyone to shut up immediately in defense of him. 
Imbeciles, the lot of them. How dare they? Anko saw her best friend lost in her ever composure, mumbling curses at the crowd and grinning. And while she knew that Kurnai wouldn't stand out, no matter how much she wanted to, Anko had no qualms about doing it for her friend's sake. And so, she just stood out and screamed to the top of her lungs with her fist high up in the air. Hey, you assholes, would you shut it already? Anko's shout had the desired effect as Kurinai looked up in surprise at her best friend with a silent, thank you. Everyone looked at the Tokubatsu Jounin in surprise, even Naruto down at the arena who was looking at both Anko and Kurinai and waved at them in appreciation. Asuma, Guy and Kakashi looked at the now sitting Anko who was crossing her arms and showing a full-out smile. Kurinai was smiling as well and looked at her best friend from the corner of her eye. Anko's outburst helped control some of the crowd, but the other section still kept on their cheer for Naruto's opponent. And Neji felt this, figuring he could use it to his benefit. It seems they don't care about you very much. Naruto then turned from looking at Kurinai to his opponent, who was smirking at him. After all, fate has already declared I will be the winner of this match and the crowd seems to agree with me. Yeah, saying they don't care about me is an understatement and, quite frankly, I don't care about whatever it is that they have to say about me. None of them knows me to really say anything. After all, Naruto really had no interest in whatever those nameless faces thought of him. The Jounin sensei all smirked at his tenacity for openly sending a major middle finger to everyone. Kurinai and Anko looked at each other with a smile and they saw his centered visage. Hinata and Yakumo were smiling as well just like the other Janan and even some of the Chunin, mainly those who saw the kid kicking ass in the preliminaries. Naruto's words, though, were like a ton of bricks to the Hokage as he listened intently to Naruto's words. It's enough for me that I have people I care about and that they care about me as well. Now, I'm quite interested in what you had said about fate, didn't know you were fate spokesperson, Neji. The Hugo wasn't deterred, however as he fell into position. Let us exchange fists and you'll see what I'm talking about. As soon as Neji fell into the Taijutsu stance and activated his Byakugan, the crowd cheered once more, in preparation for the fight. However, Naruto had the distinguished feeling that the people were cheering for the prized Hyuga. Well, not like he could do anything about that. The Naidime's apprentice had a clean plan to execute, so that was all that mattered. As soon as Genma authorized the match, Neji had barely moved his feet, when Naruto all but vanished from his sight in a blur of motion. The move alone left the crowd speechless as most of them weren't shinobi. Neji's eyes had followed the movement of Chakra and was surprised when his opponent appeared 10 meters behind the usual position. As soon as Naruto created a safe enough distance, he unleashed a great horde of shuriken from the ceiling patch inside his holster and unleashed the projectile straight at Neji's position. The Hyuga had quickly grabbed a kunai to defend himself from the projectiles, when he saw the opponent manifest hand seals. Up from the stands, Asuma smirked at his student for starting by the book against a Hyuga and using wind technique to boot. Fuutin Reposo, wind release, gale palm technique. The projectiles were propelled straight at Neji's position. His eyes managed to follow the speed of the projectiles, but when he tried to block with a kunai, the Hyuga genius was surprised to see his weapon almost breaking upon impact. Neji snarled at Naruto's plan. Despite him practicing with Tenten with projectiles, he had never seen weapons augmented by wind and jutsu before. Naruto wasn't deterred, however, as he once more used Shunshine to appear in random locations, while repeating the same strategy. Neji was then kept on his toes, trying in vain to evade the fast and dangerous projectiles from hurting him, while at least attempting to redirect the shuriken, since blocking it would break his kunai in half. Each time the Hyuga attempted to use his agility to shorten the distance, Naruto would use this strategy from a different spot, rendering his movement useless. The cheers from the stands all quieted down as they could easily see the QB brat controlling the tides of the battle. Sasuke was seething close to Kiba as he activated his Sharingan. Despite the dojutsu following where Naruto isn't even where he will be, those shuriken missiles were no joke. It was one thing to know where it will come from, but it was another thing entirely to evade an attack. Kurinai, Anko and Kakashi were looking intently at the strategy as Naruto appeared to have an endless supply of shuriken. Even Tenten who was sitting close to Lee gaped at the shuriken technique displayed by this Naruto. Neji was snarling in frustration as a couple of the weapons had managed to cause a couple of injuries on him. He cursed even more as Hinata's teammate was forcing him to show a move that he didn't want to show this early in the match. However, if he didn't do this, then Naruto's projectiles will eventually hit somewhere fatal. As such, no sooner had he evaded the last projectiles, Neji had fallen into a Hyuga stance that made Hyashi gape from the stands and Hinata's little sister Hanabi look at her father in curiosity. 
Hakazu Kaiden, 8 trigrams palm rotation. Naruto observed in surprise as Neji began to expel chakra through all of his tenketsu once, before spinning fast, forming a dome of blue chakra that blocked all of his projectiles. It was surprising because he had never seen Hinata do this before. His surprise was short-lived as he saw Neji stop spinning and use chakra on his feet to increase his speed and shorten the distance. The audience gasped as Neji soon stepped inside Naruto's defense and Neji himself used the Jukan in triumph as he targeted his opponent's tenketsu. Naruto, though, waited at the precise last second to use a fast shunshine as he knew his genjutsu wouldn't be the best alternative. Neji's fingers met with air, before he looked to his right as Naruto went through a single hand seal sequence more, before his chest inflated. Suten Suiden no Jutsu, Water Release, Water Bullet Technique. Neji didn't have time to be surprised at the second element being shown, before he was hit full in the chest and sent flying towards the arena wall like a missile. His back had hit the wall hard and he spit blood at the pain, before falling on the ground. From the stands, Kurunai admitted to being quite apprehensive when everyone saw Neji about to use Jukan on Naruto. However, she hid her apprehension well from most, but not from her best friend, who observed every bit of her mannerism when Naruto was concerned. It was indeed amusing. However, both women then turned to Kakashi as he was talking with the surprised Asuma. Asuma, did you know that Naruto's affinity for water is stronger than his winds? The smoking Jounin just grunted at his student once more for keeping things from him. At this point, Kakashi, I simply don't know anymore. Kurunai and Anko appeared lost during the discussion, so Kakashi explained. When we first saw him use elemental ninjutsu at Wave Country, all he had ever shown were wind techniques. To our knowledge, he had merely begun training in water techniques for a short while. Though, for the wind technique, he used a series of five hand seals. Do you know how many hand seals he used for this water technique just now? Kurunai then responded as she remembered only seeing him use the ram sign. Only one. Kakashi hummed at Kurunai. Precisely, so his proficiency with water is surprisingly higher than with wind. And the speed in which he finished the technique show an affinity for water that is quite rare. Anko couldn't care less about that, however, as she was having too much fun. Yeah, the Gaki is really kicking ass right there. First the Uchiha prick at the preliminaries and now the Hyuga genius. The Genjutsu mistress, despite it all, couldn't be surprised as she shared Anko's enthusiasm. She was already past Asuma's chagrin of being deceived by Naruto and his so-called hidden projects. In reality, while a Janan can turn to the Jounin sensei for training, it's not like learning skills on his own is forbidden and knowing Naruto like she does, or at least like she thinks she does, then Naruto must have many more skills available for him to use that no one knows. That only goes to show his tremendous potential in the future. And to believe that he was still due to use the Toad summoning or even the Kenjutsu he learned from Yugao. Back at the arena, Neji had already stood up and wiped the blood from his mouth. His Byakugan was blazing mad and the veins on his forehead pulsed in pain at the amount of chakra he was pouring into his eyes. Never before had he been this outmatched in a fight. And as he focused on Naruto's chakra flow, Neji was even more pissed to see a steady flow and high capacity still passing through his tenketsu. What infuriated him even more was to see Naruto's dark blue eyes focused on him the entire time, without showing anything but his attention to the match. Naruto didn't appear smug or even looked at Neji in a condescending manner. His eyes and facial expression betrayed nothing and Neji found himself doubting his resolve at this point. The Hyugas from the stands all had different opinions right now. Hinata was actually not surprised that Naruto-kun was winning this as he had shown to be quite crafty at fighting at long, medium and short distances. Her concern was for her cousin's mental stability. Hyashi was frowning and mumbling constantly and Hanabi couldn't tell if she should focus on the match or her father's rather funny expressions. At the arena, Neji had once more attempted to fight at close range and was surprised to see that Naruto had let him get closer. As such, it began a battle of taijutsu, much to everyone's surprise. However, still Neji's juke and strikes were being masterfully either evaded or redirected by Naruto's arms. Hinata beamed at seeing her senpai's expertise and she felt pride at herself for helping him train against the Jukan. Naruto keenly observed Neji's strikes, not only using his hands, but his legs as well, however he couldn't help but point out. You know, Hinata's strikes are much more troublesome to face than yours. That comment alone further irritated the Hyuga genius as the girl in question felt her face heating up at the praise and Yakumo giggled at her friend. Oh yes, how so? Neji was indeed struggling and managed to speak with a grunt. Your moves are faster and more aggressive, but your anger at me works against you. Hinata's moves are not directed by emotions, 
but rather as a means of counterattack and redirection. Hence why her Jukin style is more superior than the clan's standard style. That's why she managed to beat her sister and that's why she almost beat you at the preliminaries. At this point, Yakumo was on the verge of losing in her laughter as she saw Hinata mumbling for Naruto to stop praising her so much. Both of her hands were on her face and the bangs from her hair had cast a shadow over her forehead. The Hyuga patriarch had heard Naruto's explanation about the difference in style between Hinata and Neji and couldn't help but murmur in consideration, surprised to see this kid analyzing his clan's taijutsu. Neji at this point was livid and it showed in his stance. I'll show you the difference of skill between us. Hyashi this time opened his mouth in surprise as Neji had taken some distance and fell into a superior taijutsu stance for one of the Hyuga's main family techniques. As of right now, you're within the area of my 8 trigrams. Naruto took a step back at that as she observed Neji's chakra. He could feel most of his chakra being transferred to the legs and hands. Meaning that at this close range, Neji would be faster and more dangerous. However, it wouldn't make a difference in the end as it was time to finish this. Juknyo, Haki Rakuji and Shao, Gentle Fist Art, 8 Trigrams 64 Palms. Like Naruto expected, Neji had soon closed the gap between them and Naruto could see Neji's fingers glowing in blue chakra. With a move that surprised Neji, Naruto had quickly summoned a ninjato just as he was about to initiate the strikes. 2 strikes, 4 strikes, 8 strikes, 16 strikes and finally 64 strikes that would seal of the opponent's chakra. However, the Kenjutsu dance performed by Naruto right now made the Hyuga conscious about being within striking distance of the sword. And none of Neji's strikes ever managed to come close to become threatening. Kurenai and Anko looked at one another and smiled. Despite Yugao's current hardship with losing Hayate, they believed that the purple-haired woman would have wanted to see her student's performance just now. You introduced him to Yugao, didn't you Kurenai? The Genjutsu mistress smirked and nodded at Kakashi's reasonable assumption. Yeah, he did ask for a Kenjutsu specialist. Yuugao happens to be the best one I know. The scarecrow Jounin snorted as he then looked at the arena to see Naruto stop evading Neji's technique and use superior agility to step inside Neji's defense and stop his sword inches from the Hyuga's jugular just like Naruto did against Sasuke before their mission to wave country. Well, it's safe to say that Naruto's promotion is all but certain at this point. Kurenai actually beamed at Kakashi's remark, remembering her conversation with Naruto in her apartment. He was well on his path to greatness, and she found herself desperately wanting to be a part of it. Down at the arena, Neji had his Byakugan activated, and he still looked down to see the sword about to slice his neck off with a bare move of Naruto's wrist. Ha, huh, winner of this match, Uzumaki Naruto. The Hugo was surprised when the proctor approached the two with his hands inside his pockets, while chewing the toothpick. Face it, kid. You were outmatched from the start. And allowing him to kill a fellow shinobi just isn't my cup of tea. Naruto then resealed the sword back inside the seal where it came from and Genma chuckled at the display, reminding himself of another genius blonde shinobi who used fuenjutsu. The stadium was rock silent at this point as no one could have anticipated such a result. The betting pools had all indicated that Neji would mop the floor with Naruto. However, as the match progressed, those who placed their money on Neji became angry at seeing their sure bet evaporate. Still, the majority of the audience wanted to see a good match and as soon as Genma announced the winner, they all cheered enthusiastically. Naruto had bowed to Genma and then gave his back to Neji as the medics appeared to tend to his injuries. As soon as Naruto appeared in the Janan box of competitors, he was met with different stares. Sakura, if possible, looked even more incredulous at what she would be up against if she passes her rounds. Tamari and Konkuro both focused at him with concern as well as did Dosu. Gara was glaring bloody murder at Naruto with a maniac smile on his face. And Shikamaru, well, the Nara heir just sighed in dismay at the troublesome blonde that is his teammate. Despite it all, Naruto accepted the praise from both Sakura and Shikamaru. You're up next, Shika. The pineapple-haired Janan groaned and realized that his opponent was already down at the arena and the proctor was calling his name repeatedly. Shikamaru permitted himself a brief respite of thinking it would be best to simply throw in the match and be done with this troublesome endeavor. Up from the stands, Asumo was visibly concerned as he could practically hear his Janan's complaints. And Kurenai chuckled at the man's misfortune. One of his Janan hid things from him and the other lacked any form of drive whatsoever. Sirio Sully, I'm glad that Hinata will remain a Janan, cause right now she's the only one which is normal. Eventually, Shikamaru sighed and jumped from the Janan stand down the arena as he then observed the girl Tamari using her battle fan as a pole to rest in. In the end, 
This second fight turned out to be quite distinct from the energetic first match. While Tamari used her battle fan to create a stronger wide-ranged attack, but all it ever did was cause an uncontrolled wind typhoon that would slash the trees that Shikamaru used to hide in. Shikamaru, in return, focused on his shadow manipulation, but keeping his distance from the San Kunoichi. In the end, Shikamaru had managed to secure a plan of six moves to trap Tamari in his shadow possession technique, much to the blonde woman's groan at being caught. Though, when Shikamaru had the match in his hand and much to everyone's surprise, save for those who actually knew him, he ended up forfeiting his match over the excuse of being out of chakra. To that, his team and even those who knew him best had mixed feelings. Hinata couldn't help but smile at her lazy teammate just like Choji who was sitting next to Ino. The Yamanaka woman was screaming bloody murder at her friend for what he did. Asuma chuckled in the end, despite wanting the kid to grow some backbone and finish the match. And Naruto, well, Naruto's eyebrow twitches uncontrollably. But nothing topped Tamari's outburst right now as the woman was pissed. How dare you, imbecile, look down on me, how dare you quit on me. She was livid right now. Much to everyone's humor, Tamari's hands grabbed Shikamaru's fishnet shirt collar and shook him vigorously. The Nara, for his part, just sighed as his head was shaken by this troublesome woman. Well, it was a known fact that all Nara men were whipped. As amusing as this show is, I shall call the next match, so please vacate the arena. Tamari looked at the toothpick Jounin and cursed, before leaving Shikamaru alone with Genma. Ah, troublesome woman. Genma had truly heard some rumors about how the Jounin commander married with his wife, now he knew. Next fight was Konkuro from San vs Shino from the Leaf, though everyone was surprised and rather suspicious when Konkuro had simply withdrawn from his match. The observative Aburame just adjusted his glasses as he focused on his opponent, while Shikamaru openly complained that he should have done the same thing, much to Naruto's irritation. Well, next up was Sakura's fight against Dosu. The hunched sound Janan, upon seeing the pink-haired girl, just smirked, before turning to taunt his opponent. Ha! Huh care for a repeat of what happened in the second phase, girl? Sakura just snarled at him, remembering at the time how useless she felt back then when he used that sound gauntlet on his arm. Her eardrum started bleeding and Sakura felt an immeasurable headache. It's not going to be like that, I assure you. Dosu smiled at the comeback or lack thereof. Well, we shall see, Proctor, start the match. Genma frowned at this Janan for daring to order him around, before looking at the pink-haired Janan who nodded back at him. Dosu quickly ran towards Sakura with his metal gauntlet ready. Sakura stood her guard waiting for the frontal assault and immediately blocked the punch. Dosu soon smirked in triumph as he emitted a powerful sound wave from his metal gauntlet. The sound waves alone would once more pierce her eardrums and make her useless in this fight. However, much to his surprise, Sakura wasn't perturbed in the slightest. Frowning at his attack not working, Dosu then focused more chakra through his metal gauntlet and once more used taijutsu in combination with the gauntlet. Once more, Sakura blocked the attack and Dosu used his chakra to manipulate the sound waves. Still, the same result happened, but this time, instead of just defending, Sakura had turned to Taijutsu and kept Dosu on his toes. While the girl couldn't be called a threat in Taijutsu, she was by no means a novice in the area. She managed to land a couple of punches and kicks on Dosu, until one kick was blocked by the metal gauntlet and Dosu used the sound waves once more with the same end result. How are you not deaf by now? little girl. Sakura smirked at his opponent, taking this long to figure out. I remember your technique being quite a pain to deal with. You target the opponent's eardrums to then disorientate me. Because I know your target, I can manipulate my chakra towards that specific area to block your sound waves. Dosu narrowed his eyebrows at that. That goes against his ultimate weapon's edge, though to see an opponent use chakra to protect her eardrums was quite impressive. Sakura didn't allow her opponent to come up with something to use so she went through hand seals and slammed both hands on the ground. Doten Tsuchinami, Earth Release, Earth Wave Technique Dosu was caught by surprise as he felt the ground move akin to waves, forcing him to lose his footing. Sakura had added her elemental supplementary attack with a great barrage of shuriken. Dosu managed to block a few with his metal gauntlet, but most of the projectiles met flesh and Dosu cursed at the pain of his body being pierced multiple times. He later observed as Sakura made more hand seals and multiplied herself in five bunshines. Because Dosu was having trouble keeping still, he was ill-equipped to handle the surprise attack. He later observed the first four replicas attack him in different places and disoriented his position. The last one was the real Sakura. 
Catching the sound Janan by surprise, Sakura used surprising agility augmented by her perfect chakra control and got inside Dosu's defense. Sakura then prepared her arm backwards and screamed at the top of her lungs. This is revenge for the forest of death. Shanaro. The almighty punch hit Dosu's nose with such tremendous noise that echoed throughout the entire stadium, before the sound Janan was catapulted straight to the stadium walls. He was unconscious even before hitting the wall hard. Sakura has improved quite a lot, Kakashi. It's nice to see that the Kunoichi are not falling behind in this new generation. Kurenai was also thrilled to see another prospective ninja in this generation using Genjutsu. She wanted to impress him. The sensei's proud smile was visible in the scarecrow Jounin as the other Jounin looked at him in wonder. Anko and Kurenai were at a loss, but Asuma smiled knowingly. Ever since Naruto first taught her the more advanced chakra control exercises, he had also helped a great deal with her taijutsu. It's funny how Sakura calls Naruto her senpai, even though they are the same age. She really looks up to him and wants to impress him. As a sensei, Kurenai couldn't be prouder to hear this. She heard bits and pieces about Naruto helping Sakura on occasion, mainly from Hinata. Naruto, for his part, chuckled at seeing Sakura proudly celebrate her victory with her fist raised up in the air. He always knew her chakra control were better than his own. Despite him training in chakra control exercises for longer, Sakura was a natural, finishing exercises with half the time and half the effort that Naruto needed. He had no doubt that Sakura would make a fine tuning as well. Not to mention that she was already using elemental ninjutsu as well. Sakura then bounced back inside the Janan box and quickly approached him. Naruto Senpai, did you see that? I beat him. Naruto had shown her a full out smile and even showed a thumbs up. Congratulations, Sakura. I was surprised to see you using Doden, how long have you been hiding that from me in our training? Sakura was still smiling and even more thrilled for the praise. Oh no. Kakashi Sensei tested my chakra affinity when we started training. After that, he taught me earth chakra manipulation and even taught me some techniques. Naruto really was not surprised that the girl managed that in only one month. Well, color me impressed. Your chakra control is indeed outstanding. Back at the arena, Genma just stood there nonchalant like he is prone to be most of the time. The crowd was cheering loud at the fight so far and even he was getting pumped as well. The next round would start in about 10 minutes, thus allowing the audience to stand up, buy something and come back. Also, it worked for the Janan to recover somewhat. Still, the Jounin Proctor looked at the chart he had of the tournament matches and smiled. Next match would be Naruto vs. Tamari. Seeing the kid in action once more would be quite fun to see. Okay, the interval is now over. Will Uzumaki Naruto of the Leaf and Sabaku no Tamari of the Sand please join the arena? The mention of both names made the audience pumped and Naruto couldn't help but snort at them for the sudden change of heart. Once both blonde shinobi stood face to face, the Sand Kunoichi smirked confidently at her odds. I trust you won't do the same as your idiotic teammate did just now. Naruto deflated at her first words. He was indeed taking responsibility for Shikamaru's laziness. But then again, Naruto wasn't about to accept an enemy criticizing his friend. Oh, I'm still embarrassed that he did that, instead of defeating his opponent. If it was me, you'd be on the way to the infirmary by now. Tamari couldn't help but take a step back by the casual way he had spoken just now. She felt the weight of his threat as well as the notion that it was not an empty threat. Despite it all, the Kunoichi felt her blood pump at the matchup. Konkuro, from the Janan box, thought his sister was crazy, based on what was going to happen soon. The audience suddenly grew quiet in dire anticipation as the wind picked up between the two blondes. Naruto couldn't help but smile at his opponent's attempt just now. Well, if she wanted to measure who had the stronger wind, then he would be happy to oblige her. No sooner had Genma authorized the fight, Tamari opened all three moons of her battle fan and Naruto went through a sequence of hand seals, much to Asuma's chuckle up in the stands. Fuuten Kamaitachi, Wind Release, Sickle Weasel. Fuuten Daitapa, Wind Release, Great Breakthrough. Everyone in the entire stadium stood up from their seats in awe at the sudden hurricane that gathered from the two attacks, meeting head on. Even Genma had to escape the hell away from these two, or else he would be hit by the concussive force. Tamari snarled at seeing her opponent perform a powerful wind technique like that without needing a fan like she did. However, she was not about to lose a match between winds. The Nara beat her by capturing her with his shadow, but this time they were fighting using her favorite technique head-on, no subterfuge, no foul play. Just plain old technique and element. So, 
she powered through, focusing a great majority of her chakra. However, that only served to anger her as Naruto didn't look winded at all, only completely focused on what he was doing. Her trained eyes soon saw him make more hand seals and knew that she needed to stop the wind current. With this much gale force, an expert wind user could use it to fabricate enough wind swords to slice her up completely. As such, she stopped her technique and soon created a good distance, before throwing a good number of shuriken at Naruto, who dodged it. With the same evasion movement and showing great multitasking, Naruto had summoned enough projectiles to hurl at Tamari. The kunoichi was caught by surprise and had to use her wind jutsu to block the projectiles. Naruto, then, used agility to shorten the distance between them and Tamari had once more reverted to her strategy of keeping him away. Constantly hurling wind gales with her fan, she grew frustrated as none of her attacks landed a hit. Naruto was using evasion techniques with no clear pattern and Tamari once more kept going. She was soon fed up with hitting nothing but air and gathered as much of her remaining chakra as possible for one last technique. Performing a backflip in the air, Tamari then swung her fan with as much strength as she could muster. Fuut no Komaitachi, wind release, great sickle weasel. From her fan, a terrific gale force surged, and Naruto had stopped moving instantly, as he had taken the huge hurricane into account. The entire audience, at this point, was having trouble hanging on the edges of their seats at this fantastic ninjutsu display. The Janan were in awe at what Naruto was displaying in these exams as most had never seen him displaying such power before, not even Shikamaru and Hinata and they were his teammates. Hinata, in particular, became afraid about Tamari's technique now as it looked like Naruto would be caught head-on by those ferocious and dangerous winds. Naruto, for his part, admitted to being surprised at the strength behind Tamari's attack right now. Thinking quickly, Naruto went through a quick series of hand seals and used the water bullet technique aimed towards the ground. The water torrent helped propel his position far away from the wind blasts, but the trees behind him all suffered the worst fate, being sliced into multiple pieces. Tamari saw the movement and snarled. She kneeled on the ground panting for breath. Naruto took advantage of that and charged with his sword in tow. Tamari, look out, Kankuru shouted and the girl looked in surprise as the sword glowed with wind chakra just as Naruto jumped up in the air to deliver a vertical slash with the promise of killing her, slicing her in two. Positioning her fan in a desperate move to stop the attack, Tamari's eyes widened to impossible proportions as her fan was cleanly sliced in two before her very eyes. So surprised was she that it took her a few seconds to realize the sudden pain on her forehead from Naruto's technique. A thin line of her blood was noticeable and Tamari had kneeled on the ground terrified at the realization. By the strength of her opponent's sword strike, Naruto could have easily sliced her in half if he so wanted, just like he did with her fan. Her eyes trembled as they met with Naruto's ice blue ones looking down at her. If it was me, you'd be on the way to the infirmary by now his boastful words before the fight came surging as Tamari was frozen on the spot. Right now, she was at his mercy and that frightened her. To believe that another could make her feel like this, just like, just like him. Perhaps you should go and check that wound, Tamari-san. And just like that, the threat to her life subsided and Naruto retrieved the sword. She was so shocked that she didn't even hear Genma's words declaring Naruto the winner. And as the medic nin approached, she found that her legs were having trouble sustaining her body. The crowd then roared in cheers at the fight just now. The Sandaime Hokage saw Naruto calmly walking away from the arena with a smile. In his keen eyes, Naruto had earned the promotion in this very fight when he used a water ninjutsu to help him escape Tamari's technique. Using brute force pumping chakra in a technique isn't what's required of a chunin, but rather cunningness and technique. To this day, Hiruzen has trouble understanding Naruto's sudden exponential growth. A fine chunin candidate you have there, Hokage Dono. Hiruzen looked at his fellow cage and smiled, not wanting to reveal his own surprise at Naruto's skills. Indeed, Naruto-kun is one of Konoha's pride, Kazekage Dono. Your daughter has also shown great skill in wind ninjutsu. Yes, now I can't wait to see how young Naruto-kun fares against Gara. Should he reach the finals? Hiruzen smiled, wanting to see that as well. Back in the arena, now was Sakura's fight against Shino. Unfortunately, for Sakura, she had used too much chakra in her fight against Dosu and Shino managed to win his fight by using his bugs to suck the last of Sakura's chakra. The last fight to decide who would face Gara of the sand in the finals was waged between Naruto and Shino. But Shino didn't have many tools to use against the powerhouse known as Uzumaki Naruto. Shino had even attempted to use his bugs, but Naruto took quick care of those using an exploding tag attached to a kunai. 
the damage to Shino's hive was too much for the Abarame and Shino later forfeited the match. The Uzumaki Janan had even apologized for his actions, but Shino dismissed any need, before leaving the arena. Okay now will Gara of the Sand join us in the arena as we move on with the final match of the Chunin exams. Seconds before Genma announced the final match, the crowd went mad in even more anticipation. Naruto observed as Gara's body turned into sand from the Janan box and then appeared in front of him. The final standoff began as both finalists stared at each other. Chapter 17, Invasion As the two last combatants faced each other, the crowd remained silent in complete anticipation for the fight to come. So far, Gara's skill, from the audience's perspective, remained a mystery, but Naruto's, well, most of the audience, despite hating his guts, had to concede that the QB brat had solid skills. As such, for now, the entire audience wanted to see more of Naruto's skills. However, they also wanted to see him being beaten just as much. The Janan from Konoha were also in dire anticipation as they were the few along with the Jounin that had witnessed exactly what Gara was capable of. So, the Janan were torn between wishing for Naruto to quit and to see the blonde Janan being pushed into revealing even more than what he had revealed thus far. The Jounin, for their part, also witnessed what Gara was capable of in the preliminaries and some even knew the precise similarity that Gara shares with Naruto. However, their focus right now wasn't so much on the soon to begin standoff, but rather the more subtle changes that occurred in less than a minute. Kakashi, for his part, looked at some of the seats in the audience which were previously taken by regular civilians and now were taken by members of the Anbu Corps, all of them dressed in hooded overcoats. It seems an attack is imminent. Asuma casually pointed out, while lighting up a cigarette, earning a subtle nod from Kakashi. Anko and Kurenai were also wary of the sudden replacement. Eight members, two platoons are too few, what is Lord Hokage thinking? Anko turned to her brunette friend who raised the concern, as Kakashi surmised. It can't be helped. Without knowing how or when the opponent would make their move, it can't be helped that the Anbu are dispersed and deployed in different areas. The other Jounin quickly concurred, before their focus returned to the final match. Kurenai paid special attention to her ward's mannerism. She was surprised to see a tense shoulder and rigid posture from Naruto, though considering just who his opponent is, it's understandable to play it safe for now. A different behavior wouldn't belong to someone worthy of the promotion. Still, a small part of her couldn't help but worry about him. Don't worry Nai-chan. Kurenai turned to Anko, who was showing a full-out grin and confidence. I know that the Gaki is still due to show everything he can do equals 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 at the arena equals equals equals. Down at the arena, Naruto eyed his opponent with key focus, getting a thorough read at his chakra. It was nothing short of mayhem in his sensory perception as Gara looked to be barely able to keep it together, threatening to burst from his coils at any moment. Also, Naruto was working his mind through a suitable strategy here. He remembered seeing the older Konoha Janan named Rock Lee's fight against Gara in the preliminaries. While Lee appeared at that time to be winning the fight, it all went sideways the moment that Gara trapped Lee's limbs with his sand and crushed it into multiple pieces. Naruto still remembered to this day the agonizing sound mix between bones breaking and pain-filled screams. As such, he couldn't allow himself to be caught by Gara's sand. Aside from that, Naruto could use his own agility to get inside Gara's sand guard, though it would be the same as what happened to Lee. This match was different from the others, because Naruto couldn't see a clear weakness to exploit. He would just have to plan the field carefully along the way and react when needed. Still, the maniac look on Gara's face was intriguing. Is there something you wish to say to me? You certainly look like you're in a personal vendetta or something. Gara just kept looking madly at him, though. You're strong. Naruto narrowed his eyebrows at the rasped tone of voice. Facing opponents like you is what makes my life meaningful. Gara then chuckled some, making both Tamari and Konkuro shiver slightly while Gara continued. Killing you, hearing your bones break one by one by my sand, just feeling your blood running down my sand, you'll be amongst many whom I will use to feed my mother. The entire stadium felt the weight of these words as the civilians started to sweat at the amount of killing intent emitted by Gara. Hell, even the Janan in the arena were feeling the strain. Naruto, though, just widened his eyes momentarily, having felt this immeasurable fear before and the chakra similarities so much that he could practically hear the low growl from the Kyubi no Kitsune. This fight just escalated from tough to downright dangerous if Gara was truly someone just like him. Genma was busy just chewing the senbone as he eyed both Naruto and Gara. Clearing his throat, the Jounin stepped forward and lifted his hand upward to make the move down and initiate the fight. 
However, before he could authorize the fight, Gara had quickly maneuvered his sand and attacked Naruto. The Konoha Janan was caught by surprise and took the direct hit like a hammer. Genma frowned at the cheap shot, while the crowd gasped at the noise. Naruto, still in mid-air, recovered his wits and removed his sword, slashing the sand in one move, before landing on the ground and clearing the trail of blood from his mouth. Naruto looked quickly at Genma, wondering if that was a legal move, before having to dodge the relentless sand assault. He gathered wind chakra through the sword and was using his agility while slashing the small grains of sand with his sword, while the crowd had their own opinions of what happened. Up from the cage's booth, Hiruzen noticed the Kazekage chuckling and puffed on his pipe. Quite up to Sonagakura Shinobi's reputation to rely on trickery like this, wouldn't you say Kazekage dono? Both of Sunagard snarled at the comment made by the Hokage, though the Kazekage just chuckled. What can I say, Hokage dono, there isn't much fairness in a fight between Shinobi. Hiruzen resolved himself to merely make throat noises in acknowledgement, before turning to the arena as Gara worked furiously and keeping Naruto on his toes. Naruto, for his part, kept up his focus while at the same time using his agility to dodge the sand projectiles and using his sword to slash when he couldn't dodge in time. It's time to begin the first assessment of Gara's weakness. Right after dodging the last attack, Naruto had quickly made some hand seals and subtly invaded Gara's chakra system. The Tsune Janan had to blink twice as his perception awareness shifted. The audience began to wonder why Gara was attacking nowhere, but Kurenai smirked proudly at Naruto. His movement was so efficient that she couldn't help taking deep pride at. It took Gara two seconds to realize that he was trapped in a genjutsu, before he broke it. However, that was all Naruto needed as he got within the enemy's defense and turned the tables around using kenjutsu. Like it happened with Lee, Naruto's strikes met the resistance of Gara's sand, but Naruto knew that would happen. He kept attacking from multiple directions and in passing wind chakra through the sword, Gara was surprised, just like Tamari and Konkuro, to see the sword piercing Gara's first line of defense and attacking the second line. His body became full of sand cracks, before Gara gathered all the sand and used it to blast Naruto away. Naruto, still in mid-air, summoned a couple of shuriken and exploding tags, before hurling them at Gara. The Tsune Janan used his sand to defend himself and Naruto once more took the opportunity to shorten the distance, using relentless sequence of Kenjutsu moves, until one horizontal sword slash aimed at Gara's chest came rather close from hitting actual flesh. Once more, Gara used the sand to blast Naruto away, but this time, his head began to hurt like hell and Gara started screaming at the pain of feeling the Baiju's chakra coursing through his system. The Tsune Janan Baki snarled, thinking it was too soon for this to happen. Tamari and Konkuro did so as well, with Tamari also remembering her own fight against Naruto. No, mother, please, I'll kill him for you, I'll get his blood for you, no. Naruto this time saw the powerful chakra erupting from within Gara's coils, before having to use all his knowledge and chakra control to further augment his limbs to evade the faster and stronger sand blasts. He cursed as the sand managed to dig a hole in the ground and he wondered what would happen to him if he allowed himself to get hit by that. The Jounin, from the stands, could also feel the power up and looked at one another, wondering if they should stop this fight. The Kijas were looking at the fight as well, with Hiruzen narrowing his eyes, worrying for Naruto's safety. It appeared that Gara was struggling for control of his own body, while the sand relentlessly chased Naruto's position. Hinata and Sakura gasped in worry for Naruto as one of the sand blasts came close to hurting him badly. Naruto, then, lost his step and used his other foot and even his hands to steady his position. Everyone gasped when the sand towered over Naruto, completely blocking the sun, threatening to pound the Konoha Janan. One hit from that would have easily broken every bone in his body. Kurenai had to use every fiber of her Jounin training not to scream his name, urging him to get a move on quickly. Seeing no other way out, Naruto went through a quick series of hand seals. When it comes to life and death situations, it becomes necessary, in the end. Suit and Suijin Heki, Water Release, Water Encampment Wall he blasted a strong water jet stream that took Gara's sand blast away. Not done and making just about every high elite Jounin and above widen their eye sockets, Naruto allowed the droplets of water from his previous attacks to linger around him, as he stretched both hands forward. Subtly closing his eyes, Naruto expanded the feel of the water chakra in the atmosphere, aided by his previous attack. Once he was sure that he had enough grasp on the technique, Naruto opened his eyes and joined his hands together in a praying motion, manipulating the chakra within his coils. The entire audience gasped as a considerable swirl of water began to form around Naruto. Sutan Suishuha, 
water release, water shockwave. Naruto, with a mighty scream, flared his chakra as the ravaging pillar of water erupted like a geyser skyward. The considerable amount of water formed by this mere Janan was enough for many in the audience to wonder about the absurdity of it all. To use this amount of water for a jutsu and without a water source to gather from, was unheard of, well, not unheard of as only the older and more experienced shinobi in the area could remember another shinobi with this same expertise. Certainly, one Hiruzen Sarutobi, was having trouble keeping it together right now as the water geyser wave smashed on Gara and dragged him towards the wall. This much water made his sand heavier, thus his body was that much heavier as a result. Gara just had to use his frail limbs to swim upward from fear of drowning. As the water dissipated, a panting and kneeling Gara then snarled at the cracks around his sand armor and decided that enough was enough. With his sand, yet more hardened after Naruto's water attack, he closed himself inside like a cocoon, but not before summoning the third eye technique to check on his opponent's moves, while he prepared. Equals 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 the village outskirts equals equals equals. While the fight was raging on, a team of Anbu were performing routine patrols around the village. The higher-ups knew that something would happen any time now, so the scouts increased. One Anbu team jumped from tree to tree and then went towards the ground, using agility to scout the most terrain possible. Still, nothing appeared out of the norm, so the team moved to a different location. One of the members with the sparrow mask stopped, though, certain that he had heard something. The Anbu scout, however, soon moved along after being called by a superior. However, if he had decided to check it out, this man would have spotted many shinobi from sand and sound, hidden by the village's dense foliage. All of them are just waiting for the signal to begin. Equals 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 at the arena equals equals equals. Back at the fight, Naruto observed the cocoon in front of him, wondering why Gara chose this venue of the fight. Just what protecting himself would matter, if Naruto didn't attack, then this fight would go on endlessly. The Konoha Janan then tried a few different attacks. Shuriken, Kunai, all weapons simply ricocheted from the cocoon. Not even a kunai with wind chakra did much damage. Naruto, then, hurled a rain of exploding tags attached to kunai and it made a huge explosion. Once more, it barely made a dent to the ultimate protection. Coursing wind chakra through his sword, Naruto then charged the cocoon with extreme agility. Dodging the sand spikes that emerged from the cocoon, Naruto unleashed a great sequence of sword slashes. However, despite him being faster than the spikes, it didn't seem like his sword was making any dent to the cocoon. And keeping this up would do nothing but tire him. So, he took some distance from the cocoon, Naruto turned to analyze just what he could do to get through that ultimate defense. Quickly going through all of the techniques he had, Naruto then chose a specific venue, though he didn't know if it would work. One thing he did know is that he needed a considerable amount of chakra. Not only that, but he needed to be precise he needed to accumulate it and then released it right upon impact to deliver the bigger punch. Thus, placing his sword in between his hands, while focusing on the ram signal, Naruto remembered the exercise that Asuma Sensei made him do before the end of the training month. As such, the bearded man in question chuckled as he saw the wind chakra erupt from Naruto's sword. Interesting. Kakashi, Kurenai and Anko all turned to the bearded shinobi. Naruto is sharpening his wind chakra like I instructed him to. He needs something to pierce that armor, after all. Visualizing the wind chakra lines grinding with each other, Naruto then closed his eyes and worked through the pain caused by the strain in his chakra coils. When he opened his eyes, he looked at the sword and saw the wind chakra around the metal, behaving madly. Once he was sure that he couldn't improve on it, Naruto then took an even greater distance, going as far as reached the wall behind him. He needed as much propulsion as possible for this technique to work he needed the added momentum to further increase the damage. Once he charged chakra through his legs, Naruto almost vanished from view, with only dust being visible in each of his steps. Never before had he ran this fast, as he focused his eyes on any movement coming from Gara. At this speed, it was hard to react fast enough, though he had a backup plan if Gara managed to counterattack. Quickly evading the hundreds of sand spikes that threatened to skewer him, his sword then exploded in wind chakra, as Naruto got within Gara's guard. Few Uten Senpukin, Wind Release, Whirlwind Fist. No sooner had Naruto's wind-covered fist reached Gara's cocoon, it sounded like a cannon blast added by a hurricane as Gara's cocoon was hurled straight towards the back wall, while the wind slashes made quick work of the first and second layers of the sand protection. The audience gasped when the final layers of the cocoon slammed against the wall, as sand then sprawled all across the field. 
Gara's eyes widened at the pain of his body being slammed towards the wall, with blood dripping from his forehead. That was the last straw of his self-control, before Gara screamed bloody murder at the sight of his own blood. No, my blood. You took my blood. Gara then tried holding his throbbing head, but to no avail as the sand started dancing around him. Naruto then looked surprised as Gara's eyes shifted and even his skin turned into a grotesque desert-like color. At the arena bleachers, one dark hooded Anbu looked around, going through a single hand seal. The crowd then wondered what was going on when a rain of feathers dropped from the skies. Those who recognized the situation immediately managed to dispel the illusion, but the majority just fell asleep immediately. The Jounin sensei looked at one another and nodded, already in preparation for what was going to happen. Up towards the cage's booth, the Kaze Kage looked slowly towards the Hokage and the Hokage did the same thing, seconds before the two Suna guards initiated the plan, using smoke bombs. This made the fight in the arena stop immediately as everyone looked up to see the smoke. That was the signal for the invading forces to begin, as thousands of sand and sound shinobi invaded the village. In the arena, the Jounins observed as the Anbu team went towards where the Hokage was in order to protect him. Naruto observed it all going on and then looked at Gara, who was still holding his head, trying to take back control. At this precise moment, Tamari and Konkuro jumped down and stood in front of their brother to guard him. The Konoha Janan snarled at them, piecing some pieces together and advancing to take quick care of both. His move made Konkuro and Tamari on high alert, seeing as neither could do much to stop this guy. Naruto threw a horde of kunai and shuriken at them and Konkuro used one of his puppets to block the projectiles. However, the puppet user flinched as he saw Naruto on the verge of slicing his head off. When they heard metal hitting metal, Konkuro opened his eyes to see Baki parry Naruto's sword, before keeping on the offensive against the Janan. Take Gara and run, Baki yelled at them, before turning on Naruto once more, but before he could much, Baki had to block an incoming Senbon. Genma then shunshined in front of Naruto to show Baki that he was the opponent here. The three San Janan took this opportunity and jumped away from the arena. Genma stood facing Baki, but he slightly turned to Naruto. Uzumaki Naruto, this marks the end of the Chunin exams, though it's clear that you already have Chunin level skills. Go and rendezvous with your Jounin sensei for further instructions. Naruto needed no further and jumped towards the arena bleachers where the Jounin were busy fighting sand and sound enemies. Equals 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 with the Hokage equals equals equals. As soon as the team of Anbu arrived at the roof, the one with the white hood instructed the other teams to protect the lords, while his team moved to protect the Hokage. From the smoke, the two Suna guards attempted to keep the Anbu occupied, but the Anbu commander made short work of them with two kunai, before ushering his team to jump ahead and protect the Hokage. No sooner had they moved, both the Hokage and the Kazekage emerged from the smoke, with the Kazekage holding the Hokage by the edge of a kunai. As soon as they landed, four blurs emerged from presumably dead bodies scattered among the roof, positioning them in a rectangle formation with the kijas in the middle. They had similar clothes, three boys and a girl from the looks of things. The Kazekage gave the order as soon as he saw the Anbu team move, before the Sound 4 team all made a praying move on the same time, yelling in unison. Ninpa, Shishienjin, Ninja Art, Four Violet Flames Formation. Four pillars of light erupted towards the skies, then said lights joined with one another, forming the purple barrier, just as one of the Anbu attempted to pass by the defense. Trying to barrel through, his body was caught on fire and rolled back down the roof just as the Anbu team arrived to his location. The leader with the white hood snarled at the usage of a barrier. The enemy was crafty and managed to isolate the Hokage. Equals 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 arena bleachers equals equals equals. The Jounin Sensei, Kakashi, Asuma, Kuranai, Anko, and Gai, watched transfixed as the barrier ninjutsu lifted and trapped the Hokage inside. Kakashi and Gai, in particular, attempted to move away, leaving Anko, Kuranai and Asuma to deal with the trouble in the arena, when a bunch of sand and sound chonin appeared, next to the Anbu who performed the genjutsu. One second was all it took before all hell broke loose as the enemy began to attack the civilians, as well as the Jounin. This was the scene that Naruto arrived to, trying to find either Asuma-sensei or Kuranai to receive his next set of orders. With his sword in hand, Naruto turned in time to avoid a couple of kunai that would have pierced his back and parried what appeared to be a sound shinobi about to kill him. The enemy had superior height and superior strength superior, but Naruto managed to divert the man's kunai and use the sword to carve a deep wound to the man's stomach, before Asuma came and sliced the enemy's head off. Naruto, stick close to us. 
We shall provide your next set of orders. Naruto nodded at his sensei as he then moved together with his sensei to where the other Jounin were battling the enemy. As he arrived, Naruto caught both Kurenai and Anko looking at him, with a subtle nod. Considering the situation they were now in, that move was enough praise for Naruto. He, then, saw both Kakashi and Gai deal with three or four Suna Shinobi, before all Jounin managed to catch a respite to provide the Jinan his set of orders. Kakashi was the one who showed a positive smile with his only visible eye closed at the blonde Janan. And with him being the most senior shinobi amongst the group, he was the one who provided Naruto with his directive. Uzumaki Naruto, I would say congratulations are in order, but now we don't have time. This is an A-ranked assignment for you, Chunin candidate. As of right now, you'll be responsible for the Janan's coordination in three of the village's sensitive areas, the academy, the hospital, and the library. All the Jounin sensei here are giving you command over the teams, right now, the civilians are the priority. Get a move on. Naruto allowed himself a few seconds to understand the acknowledgement all the Jounins gave to him, before his eyes briefly searched for his Janan peers amidst the crowds. The Jounins all then watched as Naruto summoned five cage bunshines next to him, before four vanished with a shunshine to different locations. At this point, neither were surprised with the Janan's movements anymore, though they severely doubted that he would remain a Janan for long. Anko, though, only smirked and approached the only clone that remained. You're indeed full of surprises, Gaki. I'll grab one clone to help me with the civilians here and take them towards the shelter. The clone nodded and walked closer to the trench coat wearing Jounin. Before Anko left, though, she turned to Kurenai. Having that many fights and even having enough chakra to summon five cage bunshines, Naruto-kun has lots of stamina to go on and on, wouldn't you say, Nai-chan? The illusion user just had to roll her eyes at Anko's little innuendo. It still baffled the brunette that even now her best friend could find the time to make jokes like these. Get a move on already, Anko. Naruto, stay together with me. They are targeting the civilians as well. Protect the civilians, while we take care of the enemies, one by one. Anko chuckled, before she and the Naruto clone left. The real Naruto nodded at Kurenai's orders before sealing his sword and unsealing his immense repertoire of shuriken and kunai, hurling them expertly towards the enemies, stopping them from targeting the civilians, while the Jounin took quick care of them afterward. Equals 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 with Naruto clone number 1 equals equals equals. The first clone had navigated immediately towards the other bleachers where Hinata and Yakumo happened to be sitting down. Shikamaru happened to be there as well, when he arrived. Naruto-kun. The clone nodded and immediately scooted down as well as he relayed the order given by the other Jounins. Hinata, Shikamaru, we need to go and check the academy and help with the students' evacuation. Yakumo, you're free to tag along if you wish. Both girls nodded at the mission, while Shikamaru sighed in dismay. Man, wouldn't it be best if we stayed here, though? The academy teachers are Chonin, much more suited to this than us. The noise of kunai hitting kunai made the picture clear that perhaps Shikamaru was masquerading his fear with his usual boredom, though Naruto could be wrong about that. Nevertheless, he had the perfect motivation for the Nara Janan. In fact, both he and Hinata knew enough about their lazy teammate to know just what Shikamaru dreaded the most. Oh sure thing, Shika, you can stay right here, while Hinata and Yakumo will follow me. I then shall report to Asuma Sensei about your choice and said choice will be on my report. Well, you can grasp what would happen next. Of course I can, ha, huh? did I say that I hate you today, Naruto? Despite the actual invasion going on, both Hinata and Yakumo giggled at the reaction. Not verbally, but I bet you thought about it multiple times to count, now let's get a move on. Hinata, you take point with your Byakugan. We need a clear path of enemies towards the academy. Yakumo, use your Genjutsu to mask our presence from the enemy. Shikamaru shall use his shadow to capture anyone that tries to attack us and I'll deliver the killing blow. Team 10 added by Yakumo acknowledged their mission as Hinata activated her eyes to find a proper path towards the academy. Equals 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 with Naruto clone number 2 equals equals equals. The second clone went to Kakashi's team and found Sakura aiding Sasuke and Kiba in dealing with a couple of sound chonin. Naruto noticed that Sasuke was doing quick work with his Sharingan, leaving Kiba and Sasuke to supplement the team's heavy hitters. The Naruto clone then unleashed a couple of shuriken, killing the one San Chonin that threatened to attack Sakura's unprotected back. The pink-haired Janan turned in surprise when she heard the noise of metal-piercing flesh, flinching at the possibility of the attack being directed at her. 
she spotted Naruto approaching as soon as she turned. Senpai, thanks for the save. Naruto clone nodded and then relayed everyone the mission from Kakashi Sensei. As he expected, though, both Sasuke and Kiba vehemently questioned his leadership. So why are you the leader, you're not even part of our team, Naruto? Well, it's not like he expected them to take his word at face value here. And a part of being a chonin means that sometimes he needed to enforce his leadership. However, now was not the time to bicker as any minute wasted here meant the possibility of lives lost. You're right, Kiba. I'm not a part of your team. But Kakashi Sensei did place me in charge of the Janan's coordination and we need to go assist the hospital staff and evacuate the injured. As such, I vote for Sakura to lead us. The team's only female member looked at him in surprise. Me, but Senpai, I. You are the one who knows your teammates best and from the three of you, I believe you're the best qualified to lead them. Kiba would act recklessly for sure and Sasuke would try to do everything by himself. Hey! Kiba barked in denial, but was ignored by his teammates. Not even Akamaru had his masters back right now. Sasuke at least attempted to have a comeback ready, but he truly would, do things by himself. So, the broody Uchi had just settled for a HN in response. Still, he was far more interested in demanding an explanation from Naruto than this invasion. What I'd like to know, Naruto, is why you didn't show everything you can do when we were sparring. Sakura at this point just grunted at Sasuke for bringing this up now, while already acknowledging that she would be team leader of this assignment. Naruto, for his part, sighed at the Uchiha and it seemed like Sasuke was really waiting for an answer here. Why Sasuke, so that you could activate your Sharingan and copy my techniques? I'm not that stupid, you know. The Uchiha grunted at the accusation. Though, he tried to activate his eyes while seeing Naruto's fight and cursed that Naruto's affinities were different from his. He could try them sure, but it wouldn't be as effective. HN, whatever, let's go, Sakura, what's the plan then? Sakura swallowed nervously for a bit as she eyed her three male peers staring back at her. Though, Naruto Senpai gave her his vote of confidence and relayed her orders. Equals 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 with Naruto clone number three equals equals equals. The third clone had a much easier time convincing Kuji and Shino of Kurenai Sensei nominating him as in charge, as they needed to head towards the library and help the workers to secure all vital information from the enemies. However, Naruto's enemy in this group was none other than Yamanaka Ino. Hey, what the hell, Naruto? If anyone should lead this team, then it should be me. I'm the leader of this group. The Naruto clone blinked a couple of times at the tone of bravado taken by the Yamanaka, even though it was clear that the girl was shaking in her boots right now. Turning to Kuji, all he got from his big bone friend was a resigned shrug. It was Shino, though, who came to Naruto's rescue, before he needed to open his mouth and convince the Tsundere Yamanaka. I don't believe that Naruto-kun would waste his time coming here and give us orders. Plus, it's quite logical that Kurenai-sensei would give Naruto this assignment, considering that he is by far the strongest Janan of our class. Hey Shino, you'd pick him over your own teammate. Such betrayal of trust. Naruto was marveled at Shino's ability to openly confront Ino by a mere lift of his eyebrow. Ma, Ma, Ino, let us follow Naruto's command for this mission. Shino's right. Naruto-kun wouldn't have come here, if he didn't have express orders from her. Ino, though, relented once Kuji vouched for Naruto. Ah, not you too, Kuji. Fine, what's the plan, then, leader-sama? Naruto ignored the snarking remark. I appreciate the vote of confidence, Shino and Kuji. Even you, Ino. The Yamanaka merely crossed her arms and looked the other way with a snort, much to Naruto's amusement. Kuji and Ino will stick close to me, Shino, can you use your Kikaiku to attack any enemies that try to attack us? I don't believe that the library will be targeted much right now, but there are still workers there that may need assistance. The Abarame merely adjusted his glasses and acknowledged the order as the team marched with him up front, clearing the path towards the library. Equals 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 with Naruto clone number 4 equals equals equals. When Uzuki Yuagao first awakened this morning, her mind was dull. She had appreciated Kurenai and Anko's help yesterday, trying to be there for her, but they were performing an already failed mission. For as she really wanted one person to be there, not them. No matter how much she loved her friends, seeing the mangled corpse of her fiancé was a sight that will be forever lodged within the deep abyss of her mind. And truly, if something other than Suna invading Konoha, she would have sincerely remained indoors and simply allowed the others to carry the load. 
as she understood who the enemy was, something had awakened deep within her. Something that as an Anbu, she was trained to ignore. However, even though Shinobi and Kunoichi can't be allowed to act driven by emotions, at the end of the day, Shinobi and Kunoichi are still humans. As such, a woman can be allowed to take revenge from those who killed her fiancé. Right now, as the destruction continued around the village, Yuagao had permitted herself a brief moment by the hero's monument to mourn for Hayate's death. Her team, her brothers-in-arms, stood behind her, just waiting for their team captain to say her goodbyes, before beginning their assignment. Still kneeling, Yuagao whispered her final words, before narrowing her eyes and placing her Nico mask. She turned and was about to deliver the order to her team, when she heard a familiar voice yelling for her. Niko-sensei. The Anbu turned to see Naruto approach the team. Naruto, what are you doing here? Where are Kur and I and the others? Naruto had felt her chakra in complete disarray and wondered what happened to his Kenjutsu teacher. She and the other Jounin sensei had instructed me to protect the civilians, I had just helped evacuate those that remained in the commercial district, when I sensed your chakra nearby. Right there, Naruto once more felt her chakra shift, wondering why his sensei's emotions were tampering with her chakra like this. In their training, Niko was so composed throughout their training, rarely portraying anything. It was hard to imagine her like this. Are you okay, Niko-sensei? I can sense that your chakra is in complete disarray. Her Anbu team looked at one another, surprised at what Naruto had just said. Yuugao, for her part, allowed herself to overcome her dark thoughts for Hayate and the war for a brief second and placed a comforting hand on his shoulder, remembering that above all else, Naruto was a censor. I'm sorry for not being able to see your matches today, Naruto-kun. I trust that you're taking good care of your sword like I instructed you to. Her tone of voice still carried the composure and the respect, but Naruto could tell there were traces of sadness in it. He nodded at her, though, focusing on the conversation topic. The exams went fine, until this madness started. Well, not that you guys really need it, being an Anbu and all, but I can tag along and provide help. Beneath her mask, she managed to make a thin line smile at the concern. I trust that you'd be an excellent addition to the Anbu forces one day, Naruto-kun, but you should keep up with the mission you've already received, save as many civilians as possible and direct them towards the shelters. Understood, Niko-sensei. Yuugao nodded, before issuing everyone to proceed. Naruto then watched as the Anbu vanished. The clone then looked around, trying to feel for weaker chakras to rescue. Equals 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 with the original Naruto equals equals equals. The rhythm was frantic. Naruto couldn't allow himself even a second of respite from fear of allowing the enemy to kill one civilian. His hands began to feel numb from overthrowing the projectiles from a distance, but right now, there was simply no time to rest. He had only enough time in between strikes to report to Kakashi and the rest that his mission was successful with all the civilians and even the academy students taken into the shelters, where the four clones that led the Janan met with Anko and Iruka. Now, only one clone still remained out there, so Naruto couldn't tell how he was doing. The Scarecrow Jounin simply grunted at the report, focusing instead of keeping scores between him and Mito Guy to see who would deal with most enemies. Asuma had already left the premises, leaving Naruto under the watchful care of Kurenai. Sarutobi Asuma was tasked to head straight to the village gates and assist Iviki and the others there to take care of the three-headed snakes that were terrorizing the village buildings. As such, Naruto and Kurenai remained together for the rest of the battle. Naruto-kun, I shall update your new set of directives, aside from guarding the civilians, you shall be responsible for delivering the killing blow to the enemies. Naruto looked at his sensei like she was crazy, before she elaborated, with a focused grin at him. Don't worry too much. I will be using my genjutsu on them to disorient their surroundings and senses. However, you can't allow yourself to hesitate here. Let's go. Nodding along, Naruto included the new set of directives as he stood next to Kurenai as she went through hand seals to target one or two targets at the same time. He could see the genjutsu taking effect and summoned his sword once more to take the killing blow. The look of sheer panic when the enemy was no longer under the effect of Kurenai's jutsu and realizing that a sword had just pierced his chest would remain in his brain for Kami knows how long. Still, he just couldn't allow himself to hesitate here. One less enemy to deal with equals to one or even more of the villagers live saved. Kurenai, for her part, needed him to understand that he was no longer playing in the little leagues here. Because of his performance in the arena, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that he would be promoted. As such, these assignments will from now on be a constant for a full assault shinobi like Naruto. 
and by the looks of things, he was behaving like a professional the entire time. Equals 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 with the Hokage equals equals equals. Hiruzen Sarutobi, still held by the Kazekage's kunai to his throat, just watched the village fall under attack. Well, this was unexpected, to think that after everything our villages went through, that Suna would betray Konoha like this. The Kazekage, for his part, merely chuckled at his fellow cage. The treaty is simply a camouflage to make the enemy let down their guard. From this point on, the course of history will change and Suna shall emerge victorious, Hokage Dono. Despite the weapon inches from his throat, Hiruzen just levels the stare back at the Kazekage. Your words mean you're starting an open war against Konoha? You should think clearly, Kazekage Dono, there is still time after all to take a step back and for us to resolve this matter without more need of bloodshed. With time, one Hiruzen Sarutobi grew accustomed to taking the path with the least amount of casualties. It wouldn't be the first time. The Uchiha coup, the incident with the ambassador from Kumo and even the life-altering decisions from the last great ninja world war. Though, come to think about it, Hiruzen Sarutobi truly wondered if he would ever be allowed to pass along the hat to someone else in life. Minato-kun, you should have been the one dealing with this. The Kazekage, for his chance, closed his eyes briefly and then laughed long and hard this time no longer talking with the Kazekage's voice, but someone else instead, someone whom Hiruzen recognized instantly. Perhaps one gets addicted to peace as one grows older, Sarutobi sensei Your. The Kazekage chuckled as he then removed the mask, revealing the identity of the true conspirator of this mess. Orochimaru, Chapter 18, Sensei. When the hidden village in the leaves had awakened this morning, none of its citizens even dreamed of the possibility of being in the midst of such chaos. Hell, the last time this ever happened was 13 years ago when the QB attacked, leveling most buildings with a mere flick of its nine tails. Still, it came as a surprise to most when the very same target of the hatred generated by the Fox 13 years ago was practically seen in multiple locations, assisting the Shinobi force and protecting the villagers from the onslaught they were facing right now. Because of this, many of the villagers were safely taken towards the village shelters in safety. However, while they all were protected for the meantime, the tension in the air was still palpable. The reason being that they could still hear the thunderous earthquakes and destruction, meaning that the village's shinobi were still courageously fighting against the invaders. Outside, the many chonin from the village were being literally manhandled by the joint forces of Suna and Otto that plowed through through the main gates. The enemies were more numerous than the defenders, at least two to one and many of Konoha's chonin were falling victim to Suna's finest. Equals 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 Orochimaru x Hiruzen equals equals equals. While the village worked hard in order to protect Konoha from the invaders, Orochimaru and Hiruzen just stood in the same pose for a while, with Orochimaru holding a kunai close to Hiruzen's throat. For those who were born yesterday, it appeared life-threatening, to have an S-rank shinobi holding you hostage. However, to one Sarutobi Hiruzen, this scene was nothing new. Especially since this is something he has been waiting to happen for a long time ever since he caught his students' illicit practices. I knew that this day would come eventually. The snake merely smirked while holding his old sensei. Though, you won't take my head off that easily. Ku, 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 you should hurry up and choose a god I'm Hokage, Sarutobi sensei, after all, the consequence of time eventually reaches us all, right? Even you, who should have retired a long time ago. Despite the situation, it was quite humorous to hear that coming from his student. That's very true, though I don't suppose you would underestimate me, Orochimaru. But I'd rather believe that all this, Hiruzen said, gesturing to the chaos down the arena. Is not all because of a petty grudge. You don't seem like the type for that. The snake Sanin just chuckled and released his hold on his sensei, before walking away. Orochimaru had allowed a brief respite of his intentions, considering that he enjoyed the view right now. No, I guess you can say that I get no pleasure if something doesn't move like a windmill that doesn't turn. Removing the Kazekage's blue hat and letting his long black hair fall, he continued the contemplation. Certainly, it has an appeal once in a while, but this era of supposed peace is quite dull, wouldn't you agree? For me, it's not worth even looking at it. So, I had decided to move the windmill a bit, you know. Destroy the leaf village, imagine the chaos that would ensue in the elemental nations once the great and majestic Konoha falls. Hiruzen just observed the little monologue going on. Despite it all, it brought a sense of comfort for the senior shinobi to see that his most prized student was still the same as before. Ha, huh, I see, I don't suppose you'd be that appreciative of living in a world without wars. Said world does not exist, 
Sarutobi Sensei. Orochimaru's answer came more automatic than he intended to be, though said introspection lasted less than a second, before his maniac grin resurfaced once more. It came and went faster than anyone could breathe, but for a seasoned shinobi like Hiruzen, it was like it happened in slow motion. It was true that the senior Hokage did not believe in a world without wars, having grown up in the midst of the first two great wars. However, Hiruzen did cherish these peaceful times, as he could see the next generation of shinobi grow into a more prosperous settlement, at least until the next conflict arrives and he would be forced to throw his shinobi force into chaos once again. The image of Naruto strangely appeared in his mind at this exact moment. But not the Naruto of today, rather the younger and exuberant blonde bundle of joy that caused nothing but trouble in the academy. While this Naruto has indeed grown as a shinobi, a part of the grandfather mentality in Hiruzen still wished to see the old Naruto hanging around, perhaps painting the Hokaye's monument or even making his Anbu detail chase the kid around the village. After the brief trip down memory lane, sensei and student stood face to face sizing each other up. Well, rather Hiruzen was frowning while Orochimaru was smirking, but it was all the same in the end. Soon, the tiles in which they were standing cracked under the force of their chakra-powered dash as Hiruzen immediately went through a sequence of hand seals. Ninpa Kora Shuriken, Ninja Art, Tal Shuriken. Orochimaru observed as many tiles left the roof and turned into Shuriken from Haruzen's technique. The snake then laughed and jumped to the air. His tongue turned to a large viper that attacked Haruzen and lodged its fangs in Haruzen's neck, making the old man flinch and the snake Sanin laughed, joking about his sensei's old age. Orochimaru then used the snake to drag his body towards his sensei, considering the amount of venom that he was injecting in Haruzen's bloodstream. In mid-distance, though, Orochimaru frowned as Hiruzen's body turned into mud and melted away. Releasing the snake back inside his mouth, Orochimaru then landed on the ground and looked around for his sensei, before his eyes turned right, right where Hiruzen appeared with a finished hand seal sequence. Doten Doryu Taiga, Earth Release, Earth Flow River The place where Orochimaru was standing turned into a mud river as the snake Sanin was instantly dragged down the roof. Is this it, sensei? Orochimaru just chuckled at being dragged, while doing hand seals, but before he could finish, Hiruzen beat him to it, with a sequence of his own. Doten Dori Yudan, Earth Release, Earth Dragon Bomb. Orochimaru looked startled as a dragon head emerged from the mud river and unleashed a full bombardment of mud balls at him. Still, it didn't look as threatening, but Hiruzen had other plans as well, making even more hand seals, before unleashing a fire beam technique that mixed with the mud bombs. The result, Orochimaru was set aflame, screaming in pain, much to the Anbu detail's amazement at seeing the Hokage use two elements mixed together. When the mud river vanished and there was no sign of Orochimaru anywhere, Hiruzen just narrowed his eyes, visibly irritated at his student. Stop the stupid act, Orochimaru, please don't treat your old sensei like this. The hollow laughter of the snake echoed in the clearing, until Orochimaru emerged from below the roof, while a smile was on his face. Yes, very good sensei. Though, I think I deserve better coming from you. Did you truly think that this level of jutsu would be enough against me? Hiruzen, though, merely tisked at the comment. So, how about we stop playing around, sensei, or are you so desperate to finish this and go save this pathetic village? The Hokage frowned at the small jab. To believe that he would hear this from his own student was like a punch to the gut, he truly needed to be present and protect the village, not waste his time in this pathetic fight. Still, it didn't look like he would be going anywhere, not with Orochimaru and this two-line barrier technique that his students' lackeys created around them. In the end, Hiruzen had to consider that the village had the means to protect itself without him for a while. So, grabbing the fire hat for a while, Hiruzen permitted himself a moment of relaxation as he inflamed his chakra coils, ready for the true fight. Ha, huh, you do have a point, Orochimaru. Though, I would refrain from underestimating Konoha if I were you. You should know that better than anyone, how we operate, Hiruzen said his final words, before removing his Hokage robe and revealing his battle clothes. Orochimaru did the same thing, before both inflamed their respective chakra to the maximum as the roof started to shake and the dust began to lift. As student and sensei stared at each other once more, neither seemed perturbed about the combined onslaught of their chakra clashing with one another. After all, what happened before was merely a warm-up equals 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 throughout the village equals equals equals. While the s rank shinobi were battling it out, the hidden village in the leaves were still busy dealing with the invaders. Still, 
considering that most of the villagers and even the dignitaries from other villages were safely protected, it was finally time for the real force of Konoha to show its true colors. As such, while it appeared that the Suna and Otto Shinobi were having it easy, they were still due to face most of the Jounin and Anbu force as well as the major clan heads. So, when said force erupted and faced the opposition, the Suna and Otto forces were easily overpowered, and most were simply dumbfounded over what happened. Yuagao's Anbu team were seen dispatching the enemies left and right, with supreme agility and effectiveness. Though, Yuagao's sword swings were filled with ferocity, far above what her peers did. The other Jounins were also busy with the village structure's protection, easily countering whatever jutsu or weapons the enemy could throw at them. The clan heads were also doing their part. Hayuga Hyashi was seen in a clearing surrounded by no less than ten shinobi from Suna, before he started spinning into a massive kaiden, rotation, that dragged all of the enemies into a chakra hurricane. The now last Ino Shika Cho trio composed of Nara Shikaku, Inoiki Yamanaka and Akimichi Kuza were busy using their clan's respective skills to rid the village's commercial district of enemies. With Kuza using his body expansion jutsu, he managed to grow his body into amazing proportions easily topping the village buildings. With but a swing of his bow staff, he could create hurricanes by a swing alone, expelling the enemies. Nara Shikaku, standing on Kuza's shoulder, gladly appreciated the shadow casted by Kuza and managed to link his own shadow to the group of enemies. With but a small hand sign, Shikaku's shadows crawled over the enemy's bodies, reaching for the neck and quickly snapping them. Last but not least, Inoiki Yamanaka was using his mind techniques to turn the enemies against each other. The members of the Hyuga clan were quickly closing the invaders' Tenketsu and capturing them. One Inuzuka Tsume and Inuzuka Hana were seen dashing on rooftops with their canine familiars and killing most enemies they could get their hands on. Most other clan shinobi and kunoichi were quickly dealing with the invasion force. However, what was still left unchecked were the huge snake summons, composed by giant three-headed snakes. The summons' tails were destroying the walls and buildings left and right and Morino Aviki's squad clearly were in quite the situation. Seeing as none of Aviki's shinobi had a summon contract to deal against these monsters, they were reduced to what the shinobi could do, which was very little in fact. We have to hold them off, somehow, Aviki shouted to his teammates, but he was treading on thin ice as to what even he himself could accomplish against the summons. It all changed, however, when everyone heard a shout. Kushios, Yatai Kazushi no Jutsu, Ninja Art, Food Cart Destroyer Jutsu. When next they realized, the three-headed snake was smashed by a giant white toad carrying two swords on its back. After the smoke and dust cleared, Iviki looked up at the toad's head to see a man with long white hair, crossing his arms. Long time no see, Iviki. The lead interrogator could feel the sneer from Jiraiya's tone from afar as he then reached for the toad's head. Jiraiya-sama. Iviki greeted the toad shinobi, before kneeling in deference. Thanks for the assistance. Though, I believe Hokage-sama needs it more. Jiraiya was surprisingly quiet as he processed everything that was going on. The toad Sanin then looked towards the arena where he knew that Orochimaru and Hiruzen were battling. He very much wanted to go there and assist his sensei in kicking the snake's butt, but he remembered his orders given by Hiruzen himself. Quickly closing his eyes to ponder, Jiraiya then turned to Aviki. For now, let's focus on dealing with these pests. So if you please make yourself scarce, Aviki, I have some snakeskin to slice. Iviki frowned at the dismissal, but now was not the time as he simply jumped away just as Jiraiya caught movement from the forest in front of him. Looking closer, he could spot three teens, one female and two male, leaving the village instead of approaching it. That in itself was strange, considering that no respectable Konoha shinobi would even think of fleeing. Which meant that those were Suna shinobi. With a predatory smirk, Jiraiya did a small dance, before finishing with a pose. Gamma Hero, you're free to have your fun with the snakes. Jiraiya didn't even wait for the toad's acknowledgement, before he jumped away from the toad and charged in pursuit. Meanwhile, at the arena, Naruto was now having the company of a different ally in dealing with the opposition, most of them Otto Shinobi. Kurinai and the rest of the Jounin took advantage of the Janan's help and assisted the Anbu detail in evacuating the dignitaries from the arena and even Konoha. If anything happened to them, the village would lose resources as these dignitaries were high-profile clients. No matter the circumstances, Konoha was still hosting the Chonin exams and were, thus, responsible for the dignitaries and nobles' safety. And while Jiraiya had summoned building tall toads, Naruto had summoned his own partner, Gamat Tsurugi to assist. Bringing in a heavy muscle fighter, because he was running low on chakra and couldn't keep up on his own. Back down in the arena, 
Baki and even the disguised Anbu I the Toad Warrior. Though Kabuto didn't express any reaction, Baki was another story altogether. While facing Genma and a few other shinobi, Baki counted on some of the dignitaries being killed and thus Konoha would be blamed because of it. Being an elite jounin from Suna, Baki was made aware of how much revenue Suna lost because of Konoha. Hell, this was precisely the reason why Suna invaded the village in the first place. However, the elite jounin recognized Konoha's strength and realized Suna's folly. Perhaps, now only the Aichibi could provide them with something. Equals 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 Hiruzen X Orochimaru equals equals equals. No sooner had they flared their chakra to the brim, both superior shinobi dashed to close the distance. Hiruzen grabbed a lone shuriken from his pouch and hurled it at Orochimaru, before going through hand seals. Shuriken cage bunshine no jutsu, shuriken shadow clone technique. Afterward, the lone shuriken turned into dozens, while Orochimaru went through a sequence of hand seals of his own. Kushio Seto Tensei, Summoning, Impure World Resurrection. Hiruzen immediately cursed his old student for daring to use this technique on him. As he saw the first and second coffins rise in front of him, Hiruzen frowned when he saw the third one rise. Doing hand seals of his own, Hiruzen managed to cancel the third coffin from rising as well, just as the shurikens embedded on the first two coffins. Orochimaru just chuckled at the vague but useless attempt to stop him. Despite the third coffin not being useful, the first and second ones were more than enough for what he wanted to do. The Hokage was starting to sweat profusely, considering that he knew precisely whom Orochimaru had brought from the dead. Truly, from the atrocities the snake had committed, this one easily topped it all. When the coffins opened, Hiruzen stood face to face with two of his own predecessors, the Senju brothers, Hashirama and Toburama. The snake was visibly thrilling to see the look of pure shock coming from the Hokage. So, what will you do now, Sarutobi Sensei? The corpses belonging to the first and second Hokage slowly walked outside the coffins, like zombies at first. Their eyes were devoid of life and even many of the usual expressions and mannerisms that were familiar to Hiruzen were present. Hashirama Senju was exuberant, expansive, and could easily attract everyone to his cause. Toburama Senju was calm, collected, and rarely talked unless it was necessary. Well, Toburama didn't look much different than when he was alive, but Hiruzen knew his sensei better than most. Once Hiruzen Sarutobi could just picture himself much younger looking up to these two as his role models. Now, thanks to his student, he was able to meet them once more, however, this was not the meeting that Hiruzen wanted to have. Not by a long shot. Hashirama-sama, Toburama-sama. The two previous Hokage then stopped as they heard the familiar voice, though both clearly were struggling to realize what was going on right now. After all, seeing an old Sarutobi Hiruzen could be quite surprising. It's been too long, Saru. Hashirama commented on it, but Hiruzen noticed that it still lacked the old Senju Hashirama's mannerism. The Naidaim Hokage, for his part, though, kept on introspective as he stared at the older version of his successor. He was about to comment something about the Sandaime Hokage, when his brain instantly got assaulted by memories, memories that didn't belong to him, nor even something about his life. Memories about himself staying inside a dark and humid cave, the same cave that he had placed the marking with his cage bunshine sealed inside, so that one of his students could find and carry on his legacy. Memories of a blonde kid with a familiar chakra first showing up, memories of Toburama tutoring this boy, named Uzumaki Naruto. Memories of Toburama training Naruto in many aspects of the shinobi life, until the last memory of Toburama sealing his knowledge in one giant scroll. That all happened in less than a second, but all that transpired on the outside was a simple uncharacteristic blink, followed by a grunt as the geezer Sarutobi had a conversation with his brother. Edo Tensei, ha, to believe that I of all people would be used by the very technique I created. One thing Toburama realized was that despite this foe bringing him and his brother back to life, Toburama had zero to no control over his movements, except his mouth apparently. Playing along for now, Toburama barely turned to see the one who dared use his technique on himself. Edo Tensei, so this young man had summoned us using this prohibited technique? Hashirama was also looking back at Orochimaru, before he turned and faced Hiruzen. So this means that we have to fight you, Sarutobi? Orochimaru merely chuckled as he approached the two Senju brothers with two sealing tags strapped to two kunai, one for each summon. Hashirama, though, wanted nothing but to sigh in dismay, in real life, though, because he didn't have full control over his actions, all he could do was mourn the situation. There are always fights, no matter the era you live in. For this, we're truly sorry, Saru. 
Toburama kept quiet, as he tried assessing the situation. It's truly vexing that he didn't have control over his body or else he would teach this youngster a lesson in manners. However, the Naidaim Hokage found himself wondering what happened to Naruto. Hiruzen, though, was livid at this point. Damn you, Orochimaru, no good will come of playing with the dead like this. Orochimaru, though, only laughed as he placed the kunai inside the brothers' heads. You're a fool if you truly believe I care about that, sensei, now, I believe you have more pressing manners than trying to appeal to my consciousness. As soon as the kunai got inside and Orochimaru made a hand seal, smoke erupted from their bodies as their body's usual color came back slowly. However, and much to Hiruzen's utter shock, despite them being identical to his heroes, they were no more than mere puppets to Orochimaru's machinations. Hiruzen truly felt his old age right now and even more so, after he saw Orochimaru's actions. Because at the end of the day, the student's wrongdoings are the master's responsibility. Even more so, when Hiruzen had the power to stop it and did nothing. Toburama at this point felt his own consciousness fade slowly and concluded that this ceiling tag must be suppressing his soul as well. Hashirama, at this point, was already a mere puppet, but Toburama had but a small window of consciousness for one final thought, just before he too became a mere puppet. I am sorry Saru. With those parting words, the Senju brothers then vanished and charged straight at Hiruzen in Taijutsu. Despite the senior shinobi knowing that they were not the real ones, it still pained him to fight like this. Still, Hiruzen Sarutobi wasn't appointed by the Naidaim Hokage as Sandaime Hokage for nothing and blocked all of the Hashirama's attacks, before hurling him across the rooftop. Toburama, then, came from up top with the same strategy, but Hiruzen did the same, grabbing Toburama's legs and hurling him towards Hashirama's location, before going through hand seals. Here I come. Gathering enough air inside his lungs, Hiruzen finished the hand seal sequence and ignited the air inside his lungs, releasing it all in one great white fire beam. Cat and Karyu Enden, Fire Release, Fire Dragon Flame Bullet. The deeply concentrated white fire beam charged at the previous Hokages like a mad train, taking most of the tiles in its path. However, the Naidaim Hokage merely went through a small sequence of hand seals, before gathering water inside his lungs. Suit and Suijin Heki, Water Release, Water Encampment Wall. Hiruzen stopped his technique as soon as he saw the geyser of water from his sensei's mouth, instantly dousing the flames. Hiruzen saw as droplets of water still hovered in front of the Naidaim Hokage, before the man made a simple praying hand seal, molding his chakra. Hiruzen had to blink twice, not to observe a strange pattern of this follow-up ninjutsu. Because he had seen one Uzumaki Naruto performing the exact same thing in his fight against Gara. The water started forming around Toburama like a small water typhoon at first, before climbing towards the heavens as the man exploded his chakra with a shout. Sutan Suishuha, Water Release, Water Shockwave. The tidal wave created by the Naidaim Hokage was quite threatening indeed, but Hiruzen didn't wait two seconds before spitting mud on the ground and lifting a tall earth wall to block the incoming wave from dragging him away. Down at the arena, Uzumaki Naruto was observing his toad companion deal with the last of sound invaders, when his sensing skills tingled. This feeling, it couldn't be, but how was it possible? The last time he had sensed his sensei's presence was a long time ago. As soon as he looked upward, he saw the water geyser skyrocketing. The Janan gasped at the sudden occurrence and looked around. At this point, Kurinai and the other Jounin had already dispatched the dignitaries and the arena was clear of enemies, after Gamatsurugi's help. Quickly eating a soldier's pill to replenish some of his chakra, Naruto could feel more chakra presences on top of the arena. Reducing his chakra to a bare minimum to avoid detection, Naruto swiftly climbed through the castle wall, until he took shelter in between the rooftops. Hiding behind one of the structure pillars, Naruto could see the team of Anbu behaving like spectators. He wondered why the Anbu were just sitting there, doing nothing, when he sensed the barrier lifted by four individuals. When his eyes landed on the man who was single-handedly responsible for the shift in Naruto's life fighting against the Hokage, Naruto's heart plummeted. To see his sensei once more after so long, only to see him fighting for the enemy instead. Just what's going on here, why is sensei fighting against the Hokage and who is the other guy with the long black hair and red armor? Still, Naruto couldn't understand why Toburama sensei was acting like this. His brain was working furiously, trying to remember his training with the man as well as the scroll containing the Naidime's knowledge. While he was doing so, he could see his sensei using water ninjutsu left and right to pummel Hokage Gigi. Even the other one, so far with nothing but taijutsu, but the sound of his attacks easily reached Naruto's ear. 
The Jinan could only flinch as he saw this strange man punching the Hokage in the gut. Then, as he saw the Hokage kneeling on the ground, trying to recover his breath, Naruto shuddered at the sudden amount of chakra being used, what's worse, he could feel the mix of earth and water chakra used at the same time, which meant. Wait, earth and water at the same time, a keke genkai, okami. Naruto saw the vines growing from within the rooftops, before full trees appeared, charging against the Hokage. Shit, that's the shot I'm Hokage, sensei's brother. But, how could the previous Hokage be used like this, until Naruto recalled reading about a technique in the Nidaim scroll. A technique that dealt with space-time ninjutsu called Edo Tensei. A technique that according to his sensei allowed the user to summon the dead, using a living human being as a sacrifice. The memory of reading it was scarce, since Naruto had yet to dabble in space-time ninjutsu. So far, he had only grazed the theory behind it and his head hurt just trying to understand it. However, he remembered that the Nidaim had only explained the method in which to release the technique. He remembered the hand seals, though Naruto started doing it just to practice at first. When he was satisfied with the sequence, Naruto closed his eyes and reached out for his sensei's presence. As soon as he did so, Naruto sensed another person's chakra in the mix. The area was filled with powerful chakras all at once, so it became hard for Naruto to lock on his sensei's chakra. The shot I'm's wood technique had allowed a full-sized tree to emerge on the rooftop and the Hokage was trapped by the trees. The Naidaim Hokage was just standing by his brother's side, looking up at the Sandaime. Okay, perhaps once I flare my chakra, I will be discovered. So, I only have one chance for this to work. Going through hand seals and flaring his chakra, Naruto ignored the fact that everyone around instantly turned to the location he was in and locked on his chakra with Toburama Sensei's. Wake up, Sensei! Edo Tensei, Kai, Impure World Resurrection, Release. For a while, nothing seemed to happen, until the back of the Nidaim's head started burning. Orochimaru wondered what the hell happened all of a sudden as he had lost his connection with the Nidaim Hokage. Hiruzen, who was about to do something to escape from the Shadaim's constricts, wondered when life suddenly returned to Toburama Sensei's eyes. Toburama, for his part, then looked at his hand and started flexing it and moving his arms freely. Without Orochimaru's control to hinder his movements, the Naidaim Hokage smirked as his senses returned to him. A full-out smirk soon appeared on his mouth as his senses came back to him and with that, he was able to sense the presence of his student, hiding nearby. Ha! Huh, to believe that the Gaki had grown this much already. What's the meaning of this, how could you recover control? Toburama looked at the snarling Orochimaru for a moment, before he used his water-severing technique to slice Hashirama's trees that were trapping Hiruzen. The Sandaime Hokage landed close to his sensei, also wondering how this happened all of a sudden. Though, when he noticed Toburama, Hiruzen wondered why the man was looking in another direction and smiling. Quickly following the line of sight, Hiruzen was shocked to see a smiling Naruto. What was stranger was that Hiruzen saw recognition in Toburama's eyes. Saru, now there is no time for explanations. I shall deal with my brother, while you teach this Orochimaru some lessons in manners. Hiruzen then turned to the snarling Orochimaru and nodded, despite still wanting to know just how Toburama sensei came to know Naruto-kun. His senior mind was racing a mile a minute, already forming the puzzle of one Uzumaki Naruto. How Naruto suddenly improved in the academy, how Naruto had learned to use elemental ninjutsu at such a young age and quite similar to Toburama sensei's techniques. At least, the water techniques. Naruto's growth curve became geometrical and Toburama sensei, somehow, was the one responsible for it. I don't know how, but I'm glad to be fighting by your side once more, Toburama-sama. The Naidaim nodded, though the water user legend frowned. Stop wasting time and get going already, Saru. With that, Toburama vanished and engaged in a fight against Hashirama, earning a chuckle from Hiruzen. It's been what 40 or so years since we last spoke and you're still lecturing me, how nostalgic. Then, Hiruzen turned to the fuming Orochimaru. I trust that you'll finally face me on your own, Orochimaru. The snake Sanin tisk seeing his plans ruined somehow. He did sense someone else using chakra for a second, but he couldn't know who interfered with his plans. Naruto, for his part, was working profusely and almost blocking the last remains of his chakra from being used. This fight was between Hokages and S-rank Shinobi for heaven's sake. He was just lucky that no one caught him using the technique or else he would be toast right now. Back to Orochimaru, he saw no other alternative than to face his sensei head-on. Senju Toburama was the creator of this technique, 
so he must have released himself from Orochimaru's control, meaning that he now became the enemy. This battle had started hugely in his favor, but now he was at a severe disadvantage here. Still, he would work towards his goal of killing the San Daime and he had just the means to do so. Hiruzen observed as Orochimaru pulled out a sword from his mouth and frowned. He knew this sword of course and he also knew not to underestimate it. Doing some hand seals and sacrificing some blood, Hiruzen called upon a weapon for himself. Equals 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 with Jiraiya equals equals equals. Jiraiya just watched as the kid Janan from Suna managed to summon the Baiju Uaichibi. Jiraiya had effortlessly tracked them and captured Tamari and Konkuro. When he was beating the kid Gara, the kid saw no other move possible but to bring forward the Baiju trapped inside him. However, Jiraiya couldn't help but grin, already knowing who to call for assistance and knowing how much Game Ubuntu will complain about it. Jiraiya then saw as his opponent had put himself to sleep, before the creature screamed in glee about being released. Ha, huh, so Suna had decided to use every possible tool to kill us. It's good that I don't need to defeat you, Aichibi, but merely to force your Jinchuriki awake. Sacrificing blood, Jiraiya went through hand seals, before Gamabunta emerged in all his grace. Jiraiya, how dare you, call me to deal with the Aichibi. The perverted Sanin just chuckled. Sorry there Bunta, but Gamahiro is actually busy at the moment. The toad chief hummed in annoyance, before eyeing the sand creature. You'll owe me big time for this, Jiraiya. Gladly, now would you please dodge. The toad grunted as he saw the Aichibi's belly expand. When Aichibi then slammed his chest with his hand, a powerful wind blast erupted from the Baiju, leveling most of the forest with it. Bunta then was reduced to jumping mostly as the same attack happened more and more, forcing Bunta to use his own water bullet technique to counter the Aichibis. The fight between monsters made the forest tremble as Bunta used his heavy weight and nimble legs to jump and evade the onslaught of wind bullets. Jiraiya, on top of the toad, frowned as those wind bullets forced them at a distance. He needed to shorten the distance and wake the kid up, though that was proving difficult. It was perhaps time for some heavy weaponry and Jiraiya at least hoped he wouldn't kill the Jinchuriki with it. Bunta, give me some oil. Jiraiya went through hand seals and pumped his chest to gather as much air as possible, while Gamabunta did the same. Cat and die endin, fire release, great flame bullet. The toad then released a steady stream of oil beams that merged with Jiraiya's fire technique. The end result, the gigantic flame beam enveloped the Aichibi fully in what could only be described as hell on earth. The searing burn caught Gara head on as the pain of being burned alive forced himself awake. With a battered body and almost without chakra, Gara had no way of providing a counter as Jiraiya had quickly jumped off of Bunta's head and placed a seal on Gara's forehead sealing the Baiju's influence. The Baiju's scream echoed in the clearing as his sand body slowly crumbled as Jiraiya had safely captured the falling Gara, before Bunta secured their fall. Equals 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 Hiruzen x Orochimaru equals equals equals. Toburama's water jutsu battled against Hashirama's wood techniques. Toburama knew that his brother would be unstoppable normally, but without his consciousness, Senju Hashirama was beatable. As such, Toburama then charged at his brother and engaged in taijutsu. While doing so, Toburama swiftly placed exploding tags all throughout Hashirama's body. One by one, Toburama ignited the explosive tags, forcing his brother's body to almost vanish, before the Edo Tensei technique ran its course, reforming his body. It's time for you to go back, Aniki. Then, like Naruto did, Toburama went through hand seals, before locking on his brother's chakra, releasing the effects of the Edo Tensei. The usual brightness of Senju Hashirama soon returned and he could finally greet Toburama properly, despite the situation. Glad that you somehow took control of this awful technique of yours, Toburama. The Naidime grunted, remembering the earful he received from his brother when he created this technique. Yeah, though I can't take the credit for that, Aniki. Hashirama nodded, apparently knowing to whom Toburama was referring to. The brothers truly wished to continue the conversation, but Hashirama's body started to glow showing the end of his binding in this plane. With his body leaving this plane of existence, Toburama observed a teen girl with a strange headband, dead, used as a sacrifice for his brother's summoning. Senju Toburama considered himself a pragmatic man, but he always had grievances about going forward with this technique. Despite coming up with it, Toburama had never come to use it, precisely for this reason. Using a human sacrifice like that would be crossing the line and that just wasn't what Konoha was about. Looking at the fight between Saru and the one who used the Edo Tensei, Toburama then saw as Saru's black staff slammed hard into the enemy's body. 
The noise of bones breaking was all too familiar as Orochimaru had no choice but to order his team to release the barrier and facilitate his escape. The Anbu team began the pursuit, but one of the sound four spilled what appeared to be a spider's web and ensnared the Anbu team. Hiruzen just observed his old student fleeing and frowned in disappointment. When he noticed Toborama looking at him with his arms crossed, Hiruzen permitted himself a brief time of nostalgia at seeing this exact pose a long time ago. Though, before he could approach his sensei, Hiruzen stopped dead as he saw one Uzumaki Naruto approach the Naidaim Hokage. For some reason, Hiruzen found himself stuck where he stood as he looked at the scene of his grandson figure looking up at the Naidaim Hokage and the Naidaim Hokage looking down at him. Both were smiling deeply. Toburama Sensei. Naruto was about to express his happiness at seeing his mentor once more, but Toburama stopped him by ruffling his hair with a smile on his face. I can see you have grown stronger, Naruto, I expected nothing less, from my legacy. The Janan beamed at the praise, despite being quite uncomfortable. Usually, the water whips would have already hit him by now. Naruto was surprised when Toburama's body started glowing white, just like what happened to the first Hokage, which meant. You're leaving, Sensei, but I wanted to talk to you more, I, worked hard to study your scroll and managed to improve, just like you said. Toburama smirked, while allowing his student to finish his rambling. I, am still struggling with Fuinjutsu and space-time ninjutsu, though. Toburama could still see Naruto's eagerness to improve, just like when they first met. Indeed, the boy was full of potential and Toburama could attest that the Uzumaki has barely tapped into it yet. A part of him truly wished to remain and better guide his student, though. Seeing this potential realized and seeing his accomplishments in the future would be such a thrill to Toburama, but unfortunately he was on borrowed time right now and it didn't make sense for him to entertain this thought. His student would be perfectly fine by himself and Saru was here to help guide the Naidime's legacy. Yes, those will come with time, I'm sure. Now, unfortunately, my time here has to be cut short, Naruto. Me being here is unnatural as I'm sure you know. Toburama then saw Naruto's saddened nod and smiled, placing a hand on his shoulder. He saw the tears on Naruto's eyes at having to say goodbye once more. There is no need to shed those tears, my student, so wipe those off, immediately. Despite the heavy words, the tone was light, so Naruto did as commanded by his sensei and looked up once more. Now, I will repeat what I said to you once before I go, my legacy, train hard and commit yourself into learning more and more, but above all else, use those skills I taught you to better protect Kanahagakur and its citizens. That needs to be your goal above all else. Still saddened but moved by his sensei's parting words, Naruto then smiled and showed an excited fist to the Naidime. I shall make you proud, sensei, I shall carry on your legacy and do my utmost best to protect Konoha. Toburama nodded as he allowed his spirit to be released from the body that was used as a sacrifice. Before returning to the land of the dead, he turned to Hiruzen who was being attended by a couple of medic nins and was observing their conversation, transfixed. Saru, I believe it's high time for you to appoint a successor. There is no sense in clinging to the title once you're no longer in your prime. The Hokage chuckled at the advice mixed with heavy criticism as per the usual as he watched the spirit of Toburama fade and the male Janan from sound appear, dead. Hiruzen knew that, without Naruto there to release the Edo Tensei, to which the senior shinobi was still dumbfounded that the blonde shinobi even knew about it, he doubted his chances of survival. Obviously, someone younger than him would be better able to handle what happened. Perhaps, it was high time to focus on finding the god I'm Hokage, though right now, Hiruzen had to work over the consequences of Orochimaru's actions and Suna's betrayal. Still, as the clouds moved and the sun graced everyone with its presence, the old man Hokage had thanked the heavens that Konoha had survived through yet another test. Chapter 19, Aftermath A week after the invasion ended, it was mayhem for the village hidden in the leaves. It was hell indeed for most of the village's forces as they had to deal with the aftermath of the event. As such, the Hokage's administration building staff was in a frenzy, as Chunin left and right were pushing papers, dealing with damage reports and worst of all, accounting for the casualties, both shinobi and civilian-wise. It was especially frustrating to believe that this same time yesterday, no one actually believed that an event of this nature would occur. Certainly, Orochimaru of the Sanin would be capable, sure, but Suna, up to this point, the village hidden in the sand was perhaps the only ally of Konoha out there. The other villages either despised Konoha or tolerated the so-called tree-huggers. Suna was the only one who had actually declared them as the village's allies. 
which is why it was so frustrating to one Hiruzen Sarutobi as he saw the piles of paperwork grow endlessly, mumbling curses for every Chonin that dropped a report over the never-ending pile. Together with the shinobi leader were the village elders as well as the Jounin sensei of the rookie teams that were enrolled in this frantic exams. So, Homura, I take it that Sunagakur has sent a written missive for us, so why don't you enlighten me, old friend, please tell us all the cards they had decided to play. Kurenai, Kakashi and Asuma were simply kneeling in the far corner of the room, while the grey-haired elder dealt with the political side of this ordeal. Although, to Kurenai, being the least experienced of the three, it was a first to see the third fire shadow of the village this pissed off. She could really feel the veined anger dripping in each and every word that came out of his mouth. Homura, the elder in question, cleared his throat and opened the message sent by their supposed allies. Well, Hokage-sama, it has been confirmed that indeed Orochimaru had killed the Yondaime Kazekage and impersonated him. According to the message, Orochimaru, disguised as Kazekage, had influenced their decision to invade us. Though, obviously, there is no clear apology or intent of reparation, it's quite shocking to say it out loud, Hiruzen, but they are demanding that we release the captured Tsuna Shinobi at once. It's said that this entire invasion was due and only due to Orochimaru's machinations. The Hokage was busy just puffing his pipe, while frowning. Well, it wasn't a lie per se, as much as it pained Hiruzen, his once favorite student had started all of this and Hiruzen knew enough about how the snake operated. Probably, Orochimaru had infiltrated Tsuna long before making a move on the Kazekage. From that point on, it was merely child's play for him to work his way and perform his plan with none being the wiser. What shall we do, Hiruzen? Tsuna must pay dearly for their transgressions. The other elder Koharu, demanded of their leader and the Hokage had actually concurred with her. Reparations shall be placed into effect, Koharu, of that I have no doubt. The elder woman nodded and Homura as well though all three knew how thin their path now was. Push too little and Konoha loses its image and prestige, push too much and they risk forcing Suna's hand to send in even more battalions and prolong this pointless debacle. In the end, his advisors knew just how Hiruzen would play this. I'm not inclined to use the hostages as leverage, but Suna must face the repercussions of their actions. The fire daimyo has already demanded an explanation from the wind daimyo, so Suna shall already receive even less mission requests. Aside from this, despite not explicitly saying in their letter, they knew we do have their Jinchuriki in custody, plus the Kazekage's other two children. Homura and Koharu nodded in acceptance at Hiruzen's line of thinking. Indeed, leave it to me, Hiruzen, I shall begin the negotiations in earnest. Hiruzen nodded at Homura, nominating him to deal with Suna. Granted, though, please keep me posted on the conversations. The male elder bowed in acceptance and quietly left the room, together with Koharu. With the elders gone, only the three Jounin remained inside the room with Hiruzen. After dealing with Suna, now was time to handle the results of the exams. Despite the invasion occurring, the Chunin exams proceeded as per usual with Naruto clearly being the favorite to win the final match against Gara when the invasion started. The three Jounin had seen Hiruzen's attention shift towards them, egging them forward to start the subject that pertained to their responsibilities. Not only towards their prospective Jenin's display, but regarding the invasion as well. As such, it was expected of them to write reports from both events. Ah I see, said reports were at this moment being read by the third fire shadow. So, Kakashi, care to explain why you believed it wise to place Naruto in charge of the other Janan? Asuma and Kurenai looked briefly towards the grey-haired Jounin, before the man in question explained. The Hokaye's tone didn't indicate being displeased with his decision, so it was merely procedure. Hokage-sama, considering his versatile usage of the cage bunshine to be at various positions, plus the respect he had from his peers, I had given him an A-ranked mission to guide the other genins and protect Konoha's most sensitive areas. The original one stayed under our tutelage in the stands and I have to say that he has carried out his directives to the fullest, sir. Most of the nobles and visitors were unharmed and Janan Uzumaki Naruto has even managed to form a well-coordinated duo with Kurenai to deal with most of the sound shinobi, after the visitors and nobles were secured. Hiruzen just hummed as he then turned to Kurenai for her side report. True, Hokage-sama, Janan Uzumaki Naruto worked flawlessly in a teamwork effort with me, where I would capture the sound nin in Genjutsu, while Naruto used both his shuriken jutsu and kenjutsu skills to strike the killing blow. Despite the woman appearing formal about the subject, Hiruzen could pick up some hints from her tone. Something amongst the lines of respect and even pride, from the looks of things, though he didn't comment further as he turned to Asuma for his take on the blonde Janan. 
Above all else, he's a natural. There was no hesitation in his movements, nor it appeared that he was even winded even after the high-level battles he had endured. Hiruzen also had reports from plenty of other Chonin, Jounin and even Anbu about one Uzumaki Naruto. It seems his clones have left quite an impression as well, helping the other civilians and guiding them towards the shelters and even protecting the village structures. Not to mention the awestruck revelation about who was actually responsible for his growth. It has been a week since the invasion and Hiruzen was still having trouble coming to terms with what happened. But, that occurrence aside, it was quite obvious that he would be promoted. I see, so I assume that his promotion is a unanimous decision from you three, then? Kakashi and Asuma nodded resolutely, but Kurinai decided to further explain her reasoning. Frankly, Hokage-sama, I'm still baffled by how many skills Naruto has at this moment. Hiruzen worked his poker face to the extreme at such a comment. Considering who taught the kid, then Kurinai's frank statement had merit. This may sound far-fetched, but considering the rate of his growth, I wouldn't be surprised if he became Jounin material in another two years or so. Just like Kakashi and Itachi were at his age. Hiruzen's obvious frown and disapproval was justified, despite Kurinai not backing off her proud statement. Throughout the village history, there were plenty of prodigies who grew up in skill too fast and ended up losing themselves afterward and Hiruzen didn't want that for Naruto. Duly noted, Kurinai. Young Naruto-kun indeed shows promise, but let's see how he performs in the field as a chonin. Now, any more Jinan worthy of the promotion? Hiruzen was looking at the files of Haruno Sakura and Aburame Shino, while Kakashi and Kurinai spoke in their regard. Haruno Sakura has also displayed great growth throughout the exams and she managed to create a suitable strategy to fend off against her opponent. While her chakra reserves still need improvement, it's safe to say she is ready for the promotion. I'd advise though that she is paired with more experienced shinobi for a while, before she can assume a more leading role. Hiruzen nodded as he studied Sakura's file closely. Kakashi's request wasn't unprecedented, of course. Not all chonin were natural leader material right after the promotion. As it was mostly peaceful times, there was a learning curve to be followed and Sakura could further improve her skills, following a more experienced Chonin. Of course, now Kurinai, please talk to me about Shino. Shino is like his father, driven entirely by logic and never loses focus in a mission. He focuses on the small details that make the mission easier and he's a born tactician as well. Actually, he and Naruto can form a good pair. Kurinai had talked in length with the other Jounin about this. Actually, Shino would only replace Shikamaru in a Chonin level mission. The Aburame's bugs would aid Naruto's sensor skills in a tracking mission and would also assist Naruto in fighting against enemies with Shino's bugs taking advantage of the enemy focusing on Naruto and subtly drain the enemy's chakra in the meantime. Hiruzen acknowledged the duo and made a side note to test them as soon as possible. Well, at least, this exam was fruitful, with one rookie Janan from each team getting the promotion which is one blessing these old bones could take out from the tragedy that has befallen us. After all, the leaf shall burn bright in the end with the next generation showing its will of fire. For now, despite them being promoted, for the remainder of this year, they shall still take missions with their Janan teams. But, I also shall place them in C to be ranked missions from time to time. Please relay the news for them that the promotion ceremony shall occur by this same time tomorrow. Dismissed. The Jounins easily noticed the emptiness of Hiruzen's words. But, then, again, neither of them knew precisely what was going on in the Hokaye's mind at this moment. The turmoil of so many events happened at once, the weight of the losses sustained bearing down on his shoulders. The fact that all of this happened because of his own students' actions, but there was one more crucial aspect that weighed on Hiruzen's consciousness. As such, Hiruzen barely noticed when the three Jounins bowed and quickly left in a shunshine to relay the news to their Janan in person, leaving Hiruzen alone or at least he wished to be. Oh come on, sensei, please stop moping, it's not like you could have prevented any of this from happening. The third fire shadow puffed continuously on his pipe, wishing that his other student would leave him alone for the moment. Jiraiya, I don't have time for your shenanigans, right now. Leave me be. As if on cue, the perverted Sanin shifted from his favorite spot by the office's far window. Jiraiya knew how the leader felt in the aftermath of this invasion. It was the same thing that happened in the Great Ninja World Wars. When Hiruzen had to bear the responsibility of the wrong decisions he had made throughout the wars. Still, the Sanin knew what was truly going on in his sensei's head at the moment. You know that the kid saved you in the end, right? Is this what you're feeling right now, you truly thought that you'd die for the village and then you were saved? 
Jiraiya actually swallowed nervously when he heard the snarl from Haruzan's throat. This was the first time that he had seen his sensei lose the usual decorum and vent. To sacrifice yourself for the good of the village, Jiraiya, is the highest honor for a Hokage, besides me, all previous Kijas had done so. Breathing a little more easily now, Hiruzen still continued. It was true that Naruto-kun had saved me by releasing Toburama-sama from Orochimaru Zeto Tensei. But, Hiruzen then closed his eyes and took a deep breath, before resuming. I'm tired, Jiraiya. I don't know how long I can carry this out anymore. One thing before Sensei left, he said that I needed to appoint a successor at once and I agree. Jiraiya then frowned once Hiruzen's questioning eyes were aimed at him. Oh, don't look at me, Sensei, I'm not Hokage material. Hiruzen couldn't help but chuckle, but it lacked any humor. I know, as good a Hokage as I know you'd be, I know that you'd dread taking the position. A Hokage must let go of his own life in favor of the village's welfare, after all. Plus, I can't sacrifice your spy network. Jiraiya right now saw his sensei carrying the weight of the world right now in his somber expression. I must appoint someone, and the list is quite short. That was an understatement, as Jiraiya knew that only two names would have met Hiruzen's criteria and one was rather young at the moment. You're thinking about her, aren't you? Hiruzen nodded, this time some life coming back in his eyes at his student's quick thinking. Indeed, though I still have to see how to broach the subject. Jiraiya smirked at that. Yes, knowing how she would react to it, made sense to consider all possible scenarios beforehand. Well, I guess you can take your time about this subject, now how about the kid? I take it you have yet to tell everyone below the Anbu rank and myself what truly happened. Unfortunately, young Naruto-kun will have to bear one more S-rank secret link to him. Jiraiya understood, of course. The mere existence of someone being called as the Nidime's legacy was risky. If the knowledge that Naruto acquired from the Naidaim fell on the wrong hands would spell trouble to everyone, no doubt. It was quite astonishing to believe that Amir Janan had knowledge on one of the Naidaim's most dreadful creations. Though, Jiraiya knew that Hyerzen was due to have a sensitive conversation with the brat. Do you wish for me to stay here when you talk to him, tomorrow? Hiruzen shook his head. Hell, if there was anyone out there who had as many secrets involving Naruto as Hiruzen did was the perverted Sanin. No. This is something I must do on my own, Jiraiya. I owe him at least this much. Your time will come as well, I assume. The usual grin turned into a flat line smile as Jiraiya took the swift jab and left the room via sunshine. The reaction was warranted, of course, but Hiruzen truly wanted to be alone at this point. Equals 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 next day equals equals equals. Naruto had awakened this morning, not sure what to expect. He had heard from Asuma Sensei that he was to meet the Hokage this afternoon for an announcement. The Jounin was rather cryptic about the reason for such a hearing with the third fire shadow and Naruto started wondering what the old man wanted with him, of all people. Right now, Naruto knew that in the grand scheme of things, only Chunin and above would be called upon to assist in the village's post-invasion details. Above all else, the village needed revenue for the reconstruction and thus the Chunin and above Shinobi were being dispatched to fulfill the village's mission backlog. Fortunately, or unfortunately, for the village, both the Chonin exam's results and the fact that Konoha had won against two villages, only served to improve its image to the point that mission requests were flowing in endlessly. Some of the Jinan were already sent to clean up the D and low C ranked missions. Hinata and Shikamaru had joined in some of these missions together with their respective clans. Sasuke and Kiba were also lined up for some heavy hitting assignments. Actually, the only Genins who weren't called in for missions were Naruto. Sakura, and Shino. Naruto had met Sakura yesterday for some light training and she had complained about Kakashi Sensei not saying anything, aside from Sakura also being called into the Hokaye's meeting. Right now, Naruto had put on his usual clothes, with a new addition, formed now by the lack of any kunai or shuriken holster. Now, he had drawn summoning seals in multiple places to help him have better access to his weapons, should the need arise. Leaving his apartment, it didn't take long for him to reach the Hokaye's administration building. Along the way, he could see the destruction caused by the invasion, as well as the construction workers repairing the damage. When he got inside, Naruto was surprised to see Asuma there waiting for him. Asuma-sensei, ah, what are you doing here, ah, am I in trouble? The bearded Jounin was about to greet his strongest student for the day, when he sweat dropped at the excessive worry in Naruto's face. Relax, Naruto, it's anything of the sort. 
The blonde Janan walked closely to his Jounin sensei as Asuma then placed his arm around his neck. As to why I'm here, well, it's not every day a Jounin gets to gloat about one of his Janan getting promoted to Chounin in their first year, you know. Naruto looked up instantly at his sensei when he heard the word Chounin, when the Hokaye's office doors opened, revealing both Shino and Sakura carrying their own version of the Chunin vest, followed by Kakashi and Kurenai sensei, as well as a man that looked like an older version of Shino with a white overcoat and sunglasses. Naruto senpai, look, I got promoted, no wonder you're here as well. It was thanks to you that I received this vest, after all. Kakashi deflated at Sakura's proud comment, earning a chuckle from everyone. Congratulations, Sakura, you too, Shino. The now Chounin Abarame barely nodded, adjusting his glasses, showing his acknowledgement to Naruto's praise. Shino, then, walked away with his father, while Kakashi accompanied the beaming Sakura to celebrate her promotion together with her own parents. Naruto only realized that he was alone in the hallways when he looked around and saw no sign of either Asuma or Kurenai sensei, nearby. A bit of an apprehension dawned on him, as to what would follow next, when he heard the commanding voice of the Hokage. Janan Uzumaki Naruto, please get inside, so we can begin. Swallowing nervously for a bit, Naruto got inside the Hokage's office and only then did he see that he wasn't alone with the Hokage. Both Kurenai and Asuma stood by the wall close to the door and both were smiling proudly at him. Naruto paid special attention to the fact that he was still due to talk to Kurenai about all of this. Looking at her, though, the ravenette Jounin only nodded to him and ushered him to step forward to meet the Hokage halfway. Behind the Hokage, were the proctors from the exams, Morino Iviki, Mitarashi Anko, and Shiranui Genma. While Naruto had never interacted with the stern proctor from the first exam, he could be considered to be on almost friendly terms with Anko and even had a small interaction with Genma, when the invasion started. He remembered the lack of another proctor and sighed sadly for Niko-sensei's loss. He was still due to find her in the village somehow and see if she needed anything. Okay, this will be short, but let us begin, Uzumaki Naruto. The Janan stood at attention at the Hokaye's professional tone as he was busy reading the final report on his desk. Your overall performance in the exams was beyond exemplary. Morino Aviki here could attest to your mind strength and knowledge in gathering information. Mitarashi Anko could attest to your ability, as well as your Janan team, to work together and overcome the adversities. And last but not least, Shiranui Genma had attested your prowess on the battlefield. I, personally, believe that if the invasion had not occurred, then you would have been victorious. Aside from that, your assistance to the Jounin Sensei's throughout the invasion as well as your leadership towards your fellow Janan show that you have both the skills and quality of a Chonin. Naruto just stood in awe as heard the Hokaye's report about him. This time, one Hiruzen Sarutobi had foregone the stern visage for the new addition to his Chonin forces and smiled dearly at the young man that stood before him. You have earned this title, Naruto-kun, and it gives me great pride to award you the promotion. Now, here is your Chonin vest. The young man was still astonished, but he approached the Hokage to grab the vest, despite blushing a bit when Anko showed her enthusiasm by yelling with her fist high in the air. Yeah, way to go, Gaki. A small nod of recognition from Naruto as he wondered that perhaps he could consider Anko a good friend. The trench coat wearing Jounin had then began to laugh awkwardly when both the Hokage and Aviki openly glared at her for her display, earning a chuckle from Kurenai. Naruto, then, tries the vest on, adjusting the size, before bowing to the Hokage. The act of respect came as a surprise to the aged leader, but he shrugged it off and only smiled. Thank you, Hokage-sama, I shall make Konoha proud. Becoming a Chonin, Naruto-kun, means that you will be called for tougher assignments from here on out. You shall sometimes be called upon as a leader of a mission, either leading fellow Chonin or Genins. Naruto nodded, looking the Hokage in the eye showing that he had acknowledged his new set of responsibilities. However, Naruto then wondered why the sudden change in Hiruzen's face as he ordered everyone to leave for him to converse alone with Naruto. The others were startled somewhat by this, especially Asuma, who until now was responsible for Naruto as a Janan. Though, he followed the rest out of the room and closed the door. Naruto was surprised then when he saw the Hokage go through a known sequence of hand seals, before four blurs that Naruto always sensed inside the Hokage's office, vanished as well. As soon as the Anbu protection left the room, Naruto saw a string of kanji filling the entire room, before vanishing from sight. I trust that you recognize what I have done, Naruto-kun, surprisingly enough, we are both fellow students of the same man. 
It took less than a second for Naruto to realize that perhaps he was right in thinking that he was in trouble right now. Ah yes, you have sealed the room, preventing any sound from leaving the room. The aged leader nodded, feeling his age at the moment and Naruto was considered an experienced sensor enough to know that. I take it you're disappointed with me, Gigi. The overall silence coming from the Hokage was screaming in Naruto's ears. You know, when I first realized that you were improving in the academy, Naruto-kun, I was happy. Proud even as I could see that your hard work had finally brought fruits in the end. However, you stopped talking to me like we used to, back then. Naruto took a deep breath at that, knowing that indeed, the old man was right, but Hiruzen was not finished. You suddenly decided to keep it to yourself, you must have decided that, perhaps, you didn't want to talk to me anymore. But, even then, your growth had only improved, and it was astonishing, to see how much you have grown in such a short amount of time. But, now, you and I both know the real reason for your growth, don't we? Naruto felt the accusing eyes of the man that just now told that he was proud of Naruto's Chonin achievement. What I want to know, Naruto, is why you had decided that I couldn't be trusted with the fact that my own sensei was tutoring you this entire time. Right now, Naruto wasn't talking to the Hokage, but to the man who helped him a long time ago. To the man that gave him shelter when no one else did, to the man that looked at him when everyone gave him the cold shoulder and pretended he didn't exist. Taking some seconds to remember those awful days of his childhood, how one day Naruto was alone in the woods trying to catch a fish, only for this sweet old man to sit by him and tell him stories. This old man who then helped him by taking Naruto away from the orphanage and giving him an apartment, even if it barely had the essentials of a home, at least he had somewhere to call home. But, on the other hand, this old man had also, had also. You know, before I met Toborama sensei I truly didn't know much about myself. None of the teachers in the academy bothered with me. Hiruzen just stood there with both hands holding his chin as he allowed his surrogate grandson to talk. They didn't try to teach me the basics, whenever I tried raising my hand to ask something, I would be kicked out of class. Even when the shinobi training started, neither much bothered to tell me that the reason I was struggling in my chakra control was because I simply had too much to control. Hiruzen kept his mouth shut about that. If it wasn't for Toborama sensei explaining that to me in the beginning, I probably wouldn't have passed the minimal requirements to pass the academy. And you, Hokage Gigi, had never explained that to me, either. When Toborama sensei told me that I am a Jinchuriki of the nine-tailed fox. Hiruzen this time slightly opened his mouth in surprise. I first wondered why I didn't hear this from you, Gigi. You asked me why I didn't trust you, but here I found out that the reason I was so hated by everyone, the reason why people simply ignored me, the reason why no one wanted to talk to me, was because I housed the very reason of their pain. I house in me the one responsible for killing their family, their child, husband, wife, sister, brother, father, mother. This time, Hiruzen had enough decency to look down in shame. I asked you back then, do you remember, I asked why I was treated like this by everyone and you didn't tell me. You kept this from me, Gigi. So, yes, I can say that I didn't trust you with this secret of mine. Not to mention that I didn't trust what the village would do to me, if they knew the truth. I see. Gone was the accusing glare and now Hiruzen understood, though perhaps he felt that explaining his reasons would be too late, but he tried anyhow. You're right, I should have told you the truth, Naruto-kun. Naruto, though, merely shrugged his shoulders, as if he didn't care anymore, but still Hiruzen continued. Keeping this from you was wrong, but my intention was to at least give you a normal childhood. After the event, I gave everyone the order to not speak about the subject and I also ordered the parents to not discuss this to the next generation, in hopes that you would be able to make friends and have fun. Naruto, this time, snorted in derision. Well, I guess that backfired, ha, huh, he mumbled, though Hiruzen heard it nonetheless. Indeed, Hiruzen had failed to acknowledge the level of the village's hatred towards the fox. True, it did. Naruto at least felt appreciative that his grandfather figure didn't waste both their time hoping to make up for bad decisions in the past. Just so you know, Gigi, I don't expect an apology, perhaps, I did a long time ago, but not now. And I get the feeling that you're not expecting an apology from me, either, concerning Toborama sensei I guess we can both state that both subjects are water under the bridge. Hiruzen this time took a look at the young man, a good look that Hiruzen did for what he perceived as a judge of character. The vest on top of the clothes that were actually similar to what Toborama sensei wore a long time ago, actually brought a smile on Hiruzen's life. I guess Naruto-kun may truly be your legacy, Toborama sensei You're right, 
Naruto-kun. You're absolutely right. Then, I shall dismiss you, I trust that you're quite eager to celebrate the promotion with your friends. Just one thing, though. I had labeled your training under the Nidaiman S ranked level secret. Naruto looked at the old man straighter this time, acknowledging the meaning behind this, but Hiruzen continued. You know as well as I do that Senju Toburama has acquired a lot of sensitive knowledge, knowledge that he may have bestowed upon you. If that information were to reach our enemies, such information would certainly be used against the village and I can't have that. As one of the village's proud Chonin, I believe you can uphold this directive. Naruto nodded, all too at ease with holding this secret. Certainly, Hokage Gigi. It would remain just like this conversation never happened in the first place. So, I take it only you and the Anbu know about it? Jiraiya is aware of it as well. At Naruto's eyebrow lift, Hiruzen elaborated, with a straight face and easing the flow of his chakra. One of his lifelong assignments is to run Konoha's spy network and he needs to follow up on any leaks of the village's secrets to the enemies. Naruto looked at the old man for a short while, wondering if that's the truth or not. In the end, the now promoted Chunin just doesn't care much at this point. Oh okay, I see, well, you're the Hokage and he's one of the Sanin. So, would that be all, Gigi? At this point, the silencing seals on the walls rescinded. Yes, Naruto-kun, that's all. Hiruzen just observed the fine young man Naruto has become as he turned his back on the Hokage and walked away. Despite the talk, Hiruzen wasn't sure if he would ever recover Naruto's trust. Not to mention that he still felt a bad taste in his mouth for once again having to lie to this grandson figure, hoping beyond hope that he wouldn't have to bear the responsibility for telling him in the future. Equals 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 with Kurenai equals equals equals. As soon as Naruto stepped outside the Hokage's administration building, he looked around and saw nothing out of the ordinary. The imagery was practically the same as when he got inside the building earlier. There was destruction in some of the buildings and also the workers were seen repairing it. Also, a few villagers were seen passing by, with children playing amongst themselves. However, there was something itching in his brain, as if something was direly amiss in this whole scenario. The now promoted Chonin quickly manipulated his chakra and smiled, before quickly disrupting the flow. You're still taking too long to recognize my genjutsu, Naruto-kun. The imagery of Kurenai appeared by his side with her arms crossed and a smile on her face. Well, it's not like I expected to keep my senses high inside the village, but I did take more or less five seconds to disrupt upon leaving the building. The ravenette sensei just shook her head amusingly at that. You're a Chonin now, you're not allowed to use that excuse anymore and I would need only one second to slice your throat. Despite everything, Naruto didn't feel anger coming from her, just plain amusement. That's true, I guess I'll have to be on the lookout from now on. Can't have you sneaking up on me, huh? Kurenai, then, placed a comfortable hand on her waist in response. Precisely, now, do you have any plans on celebrating your promotion? None, actually. I don't know where Asuma-sensei is, and Shika is on a mission, since yesterday. Plus, I don't know if Hinata-chan is back from hers, yet. Sakura must be with her team, celebrating her own promotion. Kurenai smiled at that. Oh, Hinata-chan arrived just this morning. She and Yakumo are at home and both are dying to get the chance to congratulate you on your promotion, if you want to join us. I also believe that Anko will be there as well, though I believe she is more interested in mooching whatever it is in my fridge, Naruto laughed and nodded at the invite. Sounds good. Equals 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 next day equals equals equals. On the next day, the Hokage held a special event to honor the lives of the shinobi and Kunoichi who died protecting the village from the invasion. As he made the small speech in consideration for the lives lost, Hiruzen felt every bit of his age, especially knowing that these lives lost were due to one person and one person only, the one that he failed to stop, many years ago. As he was saying the words, he felt empty. As if he was looking down upon him and wondering who this person was. In a ninja war or in a mission, casualties are unavoidable, it was an occupational hazard. But this event was nothing of the sort. It has occurred because of the whims of someone whose reason relied solely on wishing to see things in motion, in the snake's own words. A part of Hiruzen was still having trouble accepting that such a reason was valid. However, it sure came as automatic when he announced the words, as the skies wept for the victims of this tragedy. As such, let us all pray for those who sacrifice their lives for the good of the village, for the will of fire burns brightly in them and in all of us. Buildings and walls may crumble, but as long as we look out for our loved ones, the village hidden in the leaves flame will burn stronger than ever. 
the Hokage stood in front of the pictures of the shinobi and kunoichi who perished in the invasion. Beside him, were the elder counselors Homura and Koharu. And besides them, were rows and rows of shinobi and kunoichi, wearing black outfits in mourning. Equals 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 at the memorial stone equals equals equals. One person, though, stood far away from the ceremony, holding a bouquet of flowers. A solemn Uzuki Yuagao walked slowly towards the monument made in honor of the shinobi and kunoichi who were killed in the line of duty in the past. Her eyes had simply lacked any form of spark right now, as taking vengeance on some sound and even some suna jounin, could hardly count to appease her broken heart. As she heard the gongs echoing in the distance, at the event made by the Hokage, Yuagao kneeled close to the monument and laid down the flowers, before praying for her deceased fiancé. Words alone couldn't begin to describe the love she had for Hayate and the unfathomable pain in her chest, but all she could write now was to wish that wherever he was right now, that he was at peace. It was at this moment, that Naruto approached, having sensed the presence of his sensei, nearby. While he had never seen her without the Anbu outfit, his sensor skills allowed him to know where she was. When she got up and realized that she wasn't alone, she sighed in dismay, though her eyes remained the same as she still faced the monument. You shouldn't try to see me without my mask, Naruto-kun. Right now, Naruto's chest ached as he saw the turmoil that still marked her chakra, now that he knew the reason why. I'm sorry Niko-sensei, ah, I sensed you nearby and I wished to see how you were doing. The minute those words left his mouth, Naruto felt like slapping his forehead for such insensitivity. Stupid, how do you think she's feeling, she had just lost the one she loved. Yuagao, however, decided to turn and show her face to her student. Worrying about him finding out her identity was actually the least of what was in her mind right now. You shouldn't have bothered coming here, it's not like you have any obligation to try and comfort me. Naruto flinched, but still approached his sensei. I know that you had helped out as a favor to Kurenai sensei, but I don't know, I truly valued your help, back then. I know I can't do much, but at least I wanted to come here and express my condolences for your loss. For a moment, Yuagao just kept looking at him, or rather at his feet and Naruto understood that perhaps she didn't want to talk much about it. Yuagao, for her part, in fact didn't, and for as much as she wanted to throw all caution to the wind and berate him for his attempts, she just couldn't. I appreciate it, Naruto-kun. Yuagao even showed a slightly less dejected visage when she realized that she was not looking at her Janan student anymore, but at a recently promoted Chounin instead. I heard that Hokage-sama has promoted you, congratulations. Naruto looked surprised for a moment, but nodded in appreciation. Oh yeah, ah, well, it was thanks to your help as well as everyone else's. Yuagao this time managed a small subtle smile at that. For some reason, I doubt that you needed much help to begin with, but I appreciate it. The woman then turned briefly to the memorial stone and then towards her student. Hayate had died, protecting the village. And she above all else wanted to honor her dead fiancé, by perhaps passing along his techniques to the next generation. So, after surprising Naruto with her arm around his neck, a walking Yuugao simply stated. Naruto-kun. As they walked, the student looked closely to Yuugao's narrowed eyebrows as he suddenly wondered about the sudden shift in demeanor. I may have helped you back then as a favor to Kurenai-chan, but as of today onward, we shall continue your training on a permanent basis. Naruto just kept looking questioningly at the woman, who wasn't even looking back at him, she was just looking ahead, suddenly feeling much more at ease, knowing that she had found a purpose once more in life. A purpose to make sure that the Gekko clan's techniques will live on. To make sure that Hayate-kun will live on, even if through Naruto's sword. Chapter 20, Life as a Chonin. The negotiations with Sunagakura occurred smoothly, after it became known that Orochimaru was the true conspirator. All the hostages were immediately released in exchange for due monetary compensation for the destruction. Also, Sunagakura was restricted from taking any missions in Fire Country for at least two years. The terms were harsh, since part of the reason that Suna went to war in the first place was because of the lack of revenue. However, their hands were tied in the end. If they didn't collaborate, then the wind Daimayu would be within his rights to even disband the hidden village entirely, taking his businesses elsewhere. The Kazekage's children were a special item used by Homura to negotiate even further monetary compensation. Of course, Hiruzen was firmly against it in the beginning, but caved in the end. It's not like he would lose any sleep over the subject. Two months had passed since Naruto's promotion and things got hectic from here onward. Training, missions, training, missions and rarely did he ever have some time for himself nowadays. 
if right after the invasion he was complaining that he wasn't getting called for assignments, now he was itching for some time off. As it happened, because Sunagakura's missions were reduced, Konoha's more than quadrupled and the Chonin and above Shinobi were working non-stop to lower the mission request pile. As such, the newly promoted Chonin Uzumaki Naruto got called plenty of times. Missions with his teammates, following Asuma Sensei's directives to the letter in terms of leadership. Missions with Kurenai Sensei, either alone with her or with her team now full with Yakumo and Shino's place. Even missions when Naruto was nominated leader, either with fellow Chonin or his Janan peers. One mission in particular where he, Sasuke and Kiba had to gather medical supplies for the hospital in a nearby village. The mission started as a simple C-ranked, but bumped into a B-ranked, as there was a missing nin from Kirigakura involved, harassing the local villagers. Having a full assault team paid off in the end, but the Uzumaki Chonin suffered having to exercise his leadership. I have found a newfound respect at Kakashi Sensei and Sakura for dealing with those two on a daily basis. The pink-haired Chonin had gotten wind of this specific mission and couldn't help but concur how much of a handful Sasuke and Kiba were sometimes. Especially, when both were gunning to prove themselves in Naruto's eyes. Aside from missions, once Naruto became a Chonin, his training had also received a promotion. Once he learned how to make weight seals, he had applied it to all four of his limbs. Every day, or on most days, he would get up early in the morning and do his routine which consisted of running around the village, agility courses and a couple of muscle growth exercises. By 14 years old, Naruto's body was on its path to become that of a well-rounded fighter. With well-developed muscles, but not too much that would hinder his agility, the Chonin trained diligently in every aspect. His physical exercises were added by meditation in the end, when he would feel for his ever-growing chakra capacity. Because of this, his chakra training exercises were also a priority. As he grew in height, weight and skills, his chakra would follow its own growth as well. Sometimes, he trained by himself. Sometimes, some of his peers joined him. Sakura, Sasuke, Hinata and Shino were regular companions. While Sakura and Hinata were already used to training with him, Sasuke wasn't an ever since Naruto's display at the Chonin exams and the fact that Naruto helped him awaken the Sharingan, the Uchiha had firmly elected Naruto as his rival. They would fight in most shinobi skills as Sasuke was getting special lessons from Kakashi about his newly discovered affinity for lightning. While Naruto had the advantage with his wind and water combo, Sasuke used this disadvantage to his favor, sharpening his elemental control and even learning Kakashi's special technique called Chidori. Naruto had to admit that it was a powerful execution technique, with the only downfall being that without the Sharingan, such a technique would leave the attacker too exposed for a counterattack. His ninjutsu repertoire would never be as extensive as Kakashi's, for as the Naidime constantly drilled in his head that mastering a short list of techniques from each element is always better than simply being adequate at a lot. The Sutan Swaryu Udan, Water Release, Water Dragon Technique, and the Sutan Daibakufu, Water Release, Great Waterfall Technique, were the techniques Kakashi used against Zabuza. Those two would represent the pinnacle of heavy offensive and grand scale techniques in water manipulation but even though he decided to train in these techniques, it wasn't something that he saw himself using, unless he was in quite a pinch or one of his teammates. The Fuutan Kazikiri, wind release, wind cutter technique, on the other hand, was much more subtle and much more efficient as an offensive jutsu. Plus, the more he practiced with it, the more he managed to hide the wind cutter, becoming quite the lethal technique. Asuma Sensei had personally tutored him in learning the last one. The Chonin had also practiced many times with both Kurenai and Yuagao, in Genjutsu and Kenjutsu, respectively. The Naidime scroll focused more in Ninjutsu, space-time and Fuuinjutsu, so it was rather lacking in those other areas. Right now, Naruto was sparring against Yuagao as both parried their swords in the middle, before both evaded and Yuagao used Chakra to approach him in fast succession. Naruto blinked once and his sword sensei immediately appeared by his side, threatening to carve a hole in his stomach. Moving quickly, the Chonin blocked Yuagao's assault and initiated a sequence of his own, keeping the sensei on the defensive. Summoning a couple of shuriken, Yuagao was surprised at the move, but deflected the projectiles with ease. Waiting for less than a second, she then saw her student Shunshine to her right and flipped her body, before landing a strong kick at his chest. The surprised Naruto went flying a couple of meters, before skidding towards the ground, as he observed his sensei. You appear slower than before, Naruto-kun. Your shunshine still needs work as well. Naruto tisked at the provocation, he was still getting used to the weight increase in his limbs, which relied on his chakra. 
Maintaining the seals activated as well as focusing on other tasks such as the sunshine made its toll on his body. Still, Naruto merely nodded and vanished once more in a sunshine as he this time coursed chakra to his limbs as well. The metal noise of a sword parrying a sword made Yugao's eyebrow lift slightly and her grip on her sword tightened as she supposed that her student had now taken things seriously. Much better, now, you'll have to keep this up for at least an hour. Naruto didn't complain. He never did, training was far too enjoyable to waste time complaining. However, the look of complete apathy in her eyes still bothered him. Well, it's not like there is a specific timetable for grief, is there? Both Anko and Kurenai had often commented with him when the three were together either at Kurenai's house or at the Dengo stand. When Yugao was not busy in Anbu, she was drilling Naruto relentlessly in his training. As such, it was rare nowadays for the three girlfriends to simply hang out together like they used to. Anko even asked Naruto to try and talk to Yugao in one of his sessions, while Kurenai doubted that she would listen. So, once Naruto and Yugao met in the middle, Naruto then felt her wrist relax, showing the end of their training. That's enough for now, Naruto-kun, rest for a bit. Releasing a sigh and relaxation, Naruto quickly activated one of the seals in his sword and passed chakra through it to fix the small dents on the steel. It still amazed Yugao to see the chakra conductive metal glow in a bluish hue. It showed that her student took good care of his sword, which actually brought a smile from the sensei. Focus on easing your chakra now, Naruto-kun and massage your sore muscles. Yuugao had by this time returned her sword to its scabbard as she observed the post-practice ritual. Will do, Yuugao sensei thanks. Ah. The Anbu sensed the student's discomfort suddenly and urged him to go on. Anko did ask me to relay a message to you. Yuugao released a sigh in dismay at that. She knew that she had been distant from her friends ever since Hayate's death, but she also wasn't in any way ready for what her two best friends wished for her. Let me guess, she wants to invite me for lunch? dinner or some drinks to just talk? Well, from her harsh tone, it appeared that Kurenai was right. Yeah, pretty much. Naruto replied, while scratching his head. Well, they both miss hanging out with you, sensei. I know that Anko may be a bit much sometimes, but I bet that Kurenai sensei could be easier to talk to. I'll think about it, Naruto-kun. Now, I won't be able to resume our sessions throughout the week. My team has a mission starting tomorrow. Naruto nodded, already collecting himself from the ground and bowing in respect for his sensei. Okay then, we'll continue once you come back. Yuugao merely nodded as she observed him leaving for the day, before using a quick shunshine and heading straight to the Anbu headquarters. Equals 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 at the Hyuga compound equals equals equals. At the end of the day, the sun has begun its descent, bringing the soothing orange hue in the sky, while it was still warm. At the Hyuga compound, it was a quiet atmosphere as it usually was. The clan members at this time were getting ready for their respective night activities, but the clan grounds were mostly empty at this point. Empty except for one Hayuga Hinata, who was busy practicing her Jukin with as much splendor and tenacity as possible. The last mission her team went on was two days ago, so the reserved girl had decided to practice her Taijutsu forms in preparation for future assignments. With her Dojutsu activated and her chakra circulating throughout her Tenketsu, Hinata went through the rigorous forms of the Jukin, added of course with some new movements that she had trained together with Naruto, more defensive ones. So caught up on her training, that Hinata didn't know that she had an admirer looking. Hanabi was literally awe-aspired by such beauty and strength at the same time. The drops of Hinata's sweat, somehow, lingered in the air for the orange sun to illuminate, making it sparkle. Her older sister's focused eyes closing the imaginary enemy's Tenketsu points. It was times like these that little Hanabi remembered the days when they would play together. Before becoming a Janan with her teammates, Hinata often struggled to uphold the standards of the clan. Hanabi even remembered when her sister came to her room one day, completely bruised and battered, but still offered to play with her. Hinata was so tired that day that she just fell asleep soon afterward. Hanabi giggled at the memory of herself covering her big sister in a blanket and snoozing together. When Hinata's hands then started glowing blue, while maintaining her juke and strikes, it was perhaps the most beautiful image Hanabi has ever seen. Her grace was still there, but, her strength, there was simply no way Hanabi could avert her eyes now. Nay Sama, back then, you had this beauty and strength, but the clan had tried to extinguish it, they couldn't, though, not you. As Hanabi observed, she also couldn't help but admire the smile that appeared on her sister's face as she stopped training. She was looking down at her hands with so much pride. The elder sister, for her chance, 
wiped the sweat off her forehead and turned to walk back to her house when she saw Neji there, crossing his arms. Neji Niazan. Neji, as per usual, just stood there, looking at her in scrutiny and before Hinata would eventually cower under such a stare, but right now, she just stood there, waiting for him to speak. Is there anything you wish to talk about? Neji, for his part, remembered the fight they had at the preliminaries and how close the match was. Then, with a relaxed smile, to which Hinata caught on, Neji walked past her and then turned to face her with a juke in position. Having a sparring partner helps us improve, Hinata-sama, so, allow me to be yours. Hinata at first wondered about the time, since she was supposed to meet with Yakumo-chan shortly to hang out with her, but this was the first time that her cousin had openly taken an interest in training with her, certainly her friend wouldn't mind if she was a couple minutes late. Hi, Neji Niazan, let's go. Hinata responded with a smile as she had also fallen into her taijutsu stance as both activated their byakugan and charged. Equals 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 with Kurenai equals equals equals. When night time came, Kurenai was busy fixing up a stew. The moon was full tonight and she has decided to camp for the night and travel back to Konoha in the morning. She, along with two others, were escalated for a B-ranked protection mission towards river country. The client was a wealthy merchant that traded silk all over the elemental nations. Her other teammates were composed of two chonin, one male and one female. The ravenette Jounin then heard three barks all of a sudden and sighed in dismay at having to feed them. One of her teammates for this mission was Inuzu Kahana, Kiba's older sister. Kurenai had admitted to enjoying the ferocious Kunoichi's company, who acted a bit much like Anko, though a bit less sadistically than her snake charmer friend. Though, in this mission, they were caught by surprise and alone Kunai ended up injuring Hana's leg. The mission was successful of course, but because of her injury, they couldn't use the usual shinobi speed back home. Bark, bark, bark. Would you three cut it out already, your food will soon get here, geez. The hounds were salivating at this point and Kurenai once more exhaled. Where is Naruto-kun with those fishes? Nearby their camping site, a small lake was seen, with the surface completely flat, before Naruto emerged from within, fully clothed and with his catch of fish inside a fishing net. He was dripping wet and his clothes were very heavy. With a simple ram hand sign, Naruto then expelled wind chakra through all of his tankatsus, in order to dry himself. When he was sure that he was completely dry and his clothes were as well, Naruto smiled and walked towards the camping site. Quickly deactivating the few winjutsu that created a barrier around their team, Naruto walked closer to the fire. Hey Kurenai-sensei, I just brought the ah, uh, hey! Kurenai flinched knowingly when Hana's three hounds all but jumped on him and stole one fish each. Hold on there, at least leave some for us, humans. The Jounin laughed at the scene of Naruto wrestling to secure at least one fish each for the human members of this mission. Damn, they could just wait a little bit. Naruto then approached the Jounin in charge of the mission and took a seat on a log nearby the place where they built the fire. Well, you did take too long, they were getting antsy. Kurenai commented while mixing her stew. Sorry, I had to jump in three lakes just to find enough fish for us six, how is Hana-san doing? This was the second time that Naruto had teamed up with Kiba's elder sister for a mission. On their first mission, he had to accompany her and other members of the veterinary's office to secure a wild white wolf that was terrorizing a small village near Konoha. It was the first time Naruto had seen Hana's triplets in action to safely control the animal. Since then, Naruto could safely attest that he preferred her over Kiba. Of course, being the elder sister, she quite knew how annoying her little brother could be. Plus, her dogs had taken a liking to him as well. In the mission, they were ambushed by a couple of Iwa missing nins and some thugs. While Kurenai rushed to secure the client from one of the missing nins, Hana and Naruto had to handle the thugs and the other missing nin. Fighting them became a pain, since they would always go underground. And going below ground, made Hana's hounds worthless and Naruto's sensor ability couldn't pinpoint the exact hidden location. Even so, both Chunin moved the second that the enemy rose from the ground, except that he managed to graze Hana's leg considerably, before Naruto managed to injure the missing nin with his sword, slashing the enemy's chest. Since Kurenai managed to kill her opponent, the thugs and the second missing nin escaped, though with Naruto's attack, he doubted that the enemy would be able to live. In the end, Naruto had to carry the injured Hana on his back, towards the end of the mission. Though, he at least learned just how inexperienced he still was. A way to flush the enemy upward would be to learn Doden and Jutsu, but he only had knowledge in Sutan and Fuutan. He needed something to use against these types of situations. I had just checked up on her, she's resting for now. 
why don't you prepare the fish for us, while I will take this stew for her, Naruto-kun. Naruto nodded and with a kunai, quickly cleaned his catch. With a nervous scratch of his head, Naruto supplied the parts of the fish that humans didn't eat to the dogs, which had already finished their own and apparently wanted more. When Kurenai appeared with an empty bowl, Naruto was just waiting for the three fish sticks to be done. She then took a seat next to him, as he took two and gave one to her. Thank you. They ate dinner quietly and Naruto grabbed the last fish to split with Kurenai, before the dogs could steal it, much to the blonde's complaint. Kurenai could only laugh at the scene. It seems they like you. Yeah, I have the food, don't I, at least, Akamaru was more polite. At the mention of Kiba's dog's name, the triplets glowered and Naruto only lifted his eyebrows in wonder at that, before turning to Kurenai. So, another successful mission, ha, huh, Kurenai-sensei. The Jounin nodded in approval at that, though she wondered why he was smiling so much. Indeed, now, why are you smiling? Well, I did say I was hoping for the promotion, so I could start going on tougher assignments with you guys. The sensei understood as she noticed how fulfilled he was at being acknowledged in his missions. And she acknowledged that with his vast skills repertoire, in regards to Genjutsu and Fuinjutsu, the missions were carried out much more efficiently. Certainly, the decision to promote Naruto for the Chunin position was easy. Like Asuma said, he was indeed a natural. Naruto, for his part, also enjoyed the elevated pay that came with the missions that were a boon to his finances as well. With enough money, he could even decide to move to a better place in the future. Then, he remembered something and turned to address the beautiful raven at Jounin. Ah Kurenai sensei Kurenai then turned to him. Did you Agao sensei reach out to you, I talked with her about what you and Anko asked me too, but she was still reluctant. As a matter of fact she did, ha, huh? she told me about how much of a nagging student she has, trying to make her reach out to her friends. Naruto blushed slightly at that, before Kurenai continued, now observing the fire. She didn't want to talk much with Anko about it, well, not like she opened her heart out to me, either but I was more relieved to see that she has been trying to cope with her loss. Naruto and Kurenai both looked down at that as they felt for their person of interest. While Naruto was perhaps too young to learn what it's like to lose a loved one, Kurenai was no stranger to the feeling. You don't get to be her age with her experience and not learn the feeling of loss. Everyone does in one way or another, at one point in life. Well, I really wished I could do something to help her. Kurenai looked at Naruto from the corner of her eye as he continued. But I just don't know what to say, or even if there is something that needs to be said in these situations. There isn't. Naruto then turned to see the red eyes reflecting the dancing fire as the sensei seemed introspective. Words alone don't have that power, Naruto-kun, you may open your mouth and try to be as comforting as possible, but it's not enough, it's never enough by itself. The best you can do for Yuugao right now is like I did, be there for her, grief has its own time, you can't rush it, neither can you pretend like it didn't happen. I'll tell you something, though. Kurenai now had a gentle smile as she looked at him. She has told me how much effort and dedication you're placing in your Kenjutsu tutorship. Yuugao Chan respects that, she is investing in you, Naruto-kun. So, keep doing what you always do, work hard and show her that you're dedicated to learning everything she's teaching you. Naruto nodded resolutely at that, knowing that he could do at least this much, to honor Yuugao's time, just like he honored every teacher he had up to this point. Of course, well, that goes without saying, I always try my best, you know. That much was true, in her book. To this day, Kurenai was still due to meet someone with such an impressive growth rate. What was more impressive was that his growth was due to his work ethic and tenacity as opposed to others in the past who just abused their superior intellect. Many Uchiha, Hayuga and even some of the Nara clans came to mind. Because of this, Kurenai became rather curious to simply know what's next, what outstanding new skill will he display next for her? Oh and what are you working on now? Without a Jounin sensei anymore, you're free with your schedule. I admit that I'm rather curious about what's next on Uzumaki Naruto's list of skills. Making a thinking pose, Naruto relayed what he has been doing since promotion. Well, nothing much. Yuugao sensei has been drilling me in Kenjutsu and its training demands a lot of physical exercises as well. So, I came up with a morning routine for physical training as well as chakra control exercises. The woman just placed her right hand under the right side of her face and crossed the other arm as she heard him relate his work ethic for her to marvel at. Still, she had noticed a pattern in his explanation. She knew about some side projects of his as he came to call them. Ha, huh, still hiding things from me, ha, huh, what, 
no new ninjutsu, B ranked, A ranked, S ranked. Naruto learned not to flinch at such accusations with an ease smile. Perhaps, he would talk to her freely in the future, but for now. Oh, of course, I have practiced a couple B and A ranked Suten ninjutsu and even one B ranked Fuuten, but those were mostly to increase the repertoire, nothing major. Right, A ranked, nothing major, Naruto laughed at her snort in derision. Well, it's getting late, Naruto kun, so let's. Kurenai was about to get up from the log and retire for the night, when Naruto stopped her. Ah, if it's possible, I'd like to ask you something. Kurenai nodded and returned to her seat. Back when you were saying about Yugao sensei and grief, for a moment there, you were lost in thought. The moment he opened his mouth, the eyes returned and Naruto saw it, when he asked. I'm sorry if it's something you don't wish to talk about, but, ah, well, you know about my life, but so far, I know almost nothing about yours, it seems a bit selfish on my part. Kurenai then fixed her hair behind her ear and turned to him. In terms of training and counseling for him and the others, she was always open to talk too, but right now, Naruto could see how tense and closed she became at his mere question. He felt some apprehension to perhaps ask something that would risk losing their bond, but he really wanted to know about her. Well, what do you wish to know? Naruto just took a couple of seconds, forming the words in his mind, so a dead silence ensued for some seconds, with only the burning wood making its usual noise. Is there a Yuhi clan, I mean, do you have a family? No. Naruto looked at the fast response as Kurenai seemed to be in another world right now. At least, not anymore. I was an only child, my mother died when I was very young and my father died, fending against the QB. The image of herself as only a Janan trying to argue with her father, only for the man to trap them in a barrier so that her generation could not assist in the fight against the monster. Kurenai was so engrossed in her own world that she didn't realize the effect her revelation had on Naruto. Not another one, please, not her, not her as well. The dread he felt suddenly at the notion that the very creature he housed was responsible for her father's demise. If possible, it was like Naruto just housed the man's soul inside of him, haunting him, weighing him down, he felt like a ton of bricks was on his shoulder right now and his shoulder trembled. I'm sorry. Kurenai had woken up from her own world in surprise at the pain gasped from him. Naruto-kun. She was surprised and scared at the notion, no, he couldn't be taking responsibility for this, could he? I'm sorry that you have lost your father because of me. Kurenai now regretted telling him that, as she held his shoulder firmly. You have nothing to apologize for, Naruto-kun. However, his constricted expression told her otherwise. No, I know that the fox's doing was its own doing, but it hurts. Kurenai now looked at him with even more worry. It hurts to know that the very being responsible for the death of your father is inside of me. I'm responsy. Whatever Naruto meant to say, he couldn't as Kurenai suddenly embraced him. He could feel her chin on his shoulder, he could feel her tender arms around his neck, but most of all, he could feel her tears. Kurenai's tears were for her father, for as she loved him more than anything. However, her tears were also because of the pain that Naruto must be feeling right now, carrying this burden, not only for her, but for everyone who lost a loved one's lift because of the QB. Stop, Naruto-kun, please, you don't have to bear responsibility, not for me, not for anyone whose life was altered by the fox. A little sob escaped as she concluded. You were just born that day for heaven's sake. But, as Kurenai released the hug, they looked at each other's eyes and Kurenai could see the tears fall from his eyes as well. No buts, enough, already. She caressed his cheeks and cleaned the tears from his deep ocean cerulean eyes with a smile. My father died protecting the village, Naruto-kun. That's the memory I have from him, my utmost memory of him. The Chonin wiped the tears from his eyes as he then listened to Kurenai talking about her father with such respect. My father loved Konoha more than anything. He was a firm believer in the will of fire preached by Sandaime Sama and above all else he always believed that the current generation should learn to pass on the will of fire to the next. He is the sole reason I love tutoring so much. To see the next generation grow and carry on the legacy. The way Kurenai described it made Naruto remember the Naidaim Hokage and his last words of wisdom before being released from Orochimaru Zeto Tensei. He must have been a man of valor, then. Kurenai smiled and looked up at the bright moon as the fond memories of her father resurfaced. That he was, indeed. And let me tell you something. Naruto then looked at her, being mesmerized and transfixed by the sight of her eyes looking at the moon up in the sky. My father would have loved taking you under his wing. I really would have liked meeting him. 
the Jounin just nodded with a fond smile, while looking up above, wondering if her father was looking down upon her. Then, both just stood there, observing the skies, before Kurinai went inside Hana's tent and Naruto resumed his guarding duties. The seals he had placed around the camp would alert him to any possible threats. Later into the night, Kurinai had woken up and relieved Naruto to get some rest, before they returned to Konoha, carrying the wounded Hana. Equals 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 with the Hokage equals equals equals. On the next day, Hiruzen Sarutobi resumed his workload as usual. Reports were flooding in with mission reports, inner village communications and overall negotiations regarding the village's ongoing repairs after the war. However, one subject now was many times more important. His successor. After his conversation with the Naidaim, Hiruzen had thought of two possible names for him to choose. Well, it was three, but Jiraiya would never take the job, so Hiruzen was down to two. Hatake Kakashi was a well-suited candidate, for sure. He had the respect of all of the Jounin and even the Anbu. In terms of age, Kakashi was at the same age as the Yondaime when he was appointed, so age wasn't the issue. However, there was something that still kept Hiruzen from fully nominating Sakumo's son for the position. Hiruzen still remembered talking to the Yondaime about what they could do to ease the pain of Kakashi's sorrows after everything that happened in his life. However, even after all this time, the aged leader still wasn't sure that the Scarecrow Jounin had surpassed his traumas. Hell, it's not like she surpassed her own trauma as well. Hiruzen's second name was none other than his third student, Senju Tsunade. Hashirama-sama's granddaughter and one of the heroes of the Great Ninja Wars, she had everything going for her to be appointed as the god I'm Hokage. Her set of trauma lay in her losing her little brother and her fiancé because of the war. Ever since then, she has been roaming throughout the elemental nations adrift, trying to make sense of her life. Still, in between Tsunade and Kakashi, Hiruzen was certain of his choice. Kakashi was already Hokage material, but he needed more time and more experience to overcome. Now, he would have to count on Tsunade's teammate to first convince her to come back to Konoha, which was a mountainous hill to climb in itself. An Anbu then morphed inside his office. Hokage-sama, we haven't found traces of Jiraiya-sama anywhere, sir. Hiruzen had just nodded at his Anbu personnel. Jiraiya had ways of knowing when the Hokage needed to speak with him. It's okay Tora, knowing him, he's going to arrive shortly, dismissed. The Anbu then left the room, as soon as another smoke cloud erupted and Hiruzen observed the irritated expression of his wayward student. What the hell, sensei, I was busy. Hiruzen did nothing but snort at what exactly Jiraiya meant by being busy. I do apologize for keeping you away from this village's brothels, Jiraiya. However, by the easy smirk on his face, Hiruzen was everything but apologetic. The time has come for us to seek her. Oh, so you finally decided. And you wish me to find her and bring her back, I take it? Hiruzen nodded. If I were to send anyone else, it wouldn't be as effective, not to mention that right now, only you and I know her best. I would gladly go myself, but I can't, so that leaves you, Jiraiya laughed at that, it would have been an amusing scene of Tsunade being scolded by Hiruzen and being brought in by force. Still, he always kept tabs on her general location through his spy network. It would be fun to see her once again. Still, Jiraiya wanted to take this opportunity and take care of something important. Sure thing, sensei. Is the kid available to come with me? Hiruzen lifted his eyebrow in question and Jiraiya smiled. I've been meaning to teach him one of the Yondaime's techniques. Hiruzen frowned at that, the Yondaime Hokage was famous for two techniques, the Hiraishin was of course off the table, so that leaves. Jiraiya. I understand that Naruto-kun is showing more promise than I realized, but teaching him such a technique. Jiraiya, however, was absolute in his endeavor. He needs it, sensei. Hiruzen still frowned at that, even if he knew what Jiraiya was alluding to. Ha, huh, fine, he returned yesterday from a B-ranked mission. I'll call him. One looked to the side and the hidden Anbu left to send Naruto the message for yet another mission. Appreciate it, oh and a Hayuga would be a nice help, can't always keep up with Tsunade once she decides to escape. Equals 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 with Kurinai equals equals equals. The day after Naruto and Kurinai returned from their mission with Hana, the Genjutsu specialist looked at the night sky from her apartment and truly wished to do nothing tonight, but take a nice hot shower, place her comfortable nighties and just sleep. Just moments ago, one Naruto clone rang the bell from her apartment and told that the real one had been called to the Hokaye's office for yet another mission, this time with the Sanin Jiraiya and Hinata. Kurinai just wondered when he had time to get some rest, but he did wish for more missions. 
Though, she did relay a message to the clone for the real one that they would continue their conversation when he returned. On their way back from their mission, Naruto still wished to know more about her past and surprisingly some of her hobbies. It was quite odd, but the conversation turned out to be quite nice. Now, what to do? Well, tonight, I shall just focus on myself, no training, no missions, no. Hey Nai-chan, open up. I know you're in there. Kurenai visibly deflated as she was clearly about to hope that Anko wouldn't come and drag her for something. Still, her annoyingly best friend kept pounding on the door relentlessly. All right, all right, I'm coming. As soon as Kurenai opened the door, she was surprised to see Anko there with a huge smile and the reluctant Yugao behind her. What did you do, Anko, storm inside the Anbu headquarters and drag her away by force? The snake charmer just nodded with a huge smile as she looked at Yugao. Yeah, I got tired of waiting, so I decided to intervene in my own way, now, come on, put on some sexy clothes and let's get some drinks. Kurenai once more deflated at her friend's energy. I swear Anko, sometimes I don't know who has gotten more energy, you or Naruto-kun. Come in, I'll get dressed. Anko and Yuugao got inside as Kurenai went to her room. Oh, how's the golden gaki, you guys just returned from another mission, right? Yeah, we did. Kurenai yelled from her room. But apparently Hokage-sama has sent him on another just today, which reminds me, Yuugao chan he asked me to tell you that he won't return for at least two weeks. Understood, thank you. It looks like Hokage-sama is investing in him. Anko could see that Yuugao's frown turned into a proud smile, just as Kurenai returned with her usual outfit. It seems so, now, let's get going, already. I was still due to take a nice relaxing bath and sleep, you know. Kurenai then ushered the two ladies out of her apartment and closed the door, before following her friends towards the bar. However, and much to Kurenai's dismay, Anko ended up dragging them to a rather crowded place and ordered them nothing but dengo and sake. Before long, the snake Jounin had abandoned them on their own, going Kami knows where with Kami knows who, leaving Kurenai alone with the slightly drunk Yugao next to her. I'm sorry Yugao chan but well, you know how she is. There are times when Anko's approach made more sense, but Yu Gao's wounds were still fresh for that sort of approach. It's okay, it's not like I have anyone waiting for me at home, Kurenai. The Genjutsu user nodded in sympathy, as the two ignored the excessive noise and even a couple of guys who tried their luck in asking them out. In fact, could we leave, and I don't know, take a walk somewhere, otherwise the next imbecile who dares to approach me will have his balls sliced in half. Kurenai's sweat dropped as she dully imagined the woman taking her sword and doing just that before the aforementioned male realized what happened. Let's go, I trust that Anko can pay for this one, not like we had much to begin with. Yuugao nodded and both women relaxed upon escaping from that awful establishment. However, Kurenai looked briefly to the side only to see a distraught friend looking down, with empty eyes. The two walked casually throughout the rather empty streets of Konoha, until they climbed a long set of stairs towards a bench hidden beneath some trees. So, Kurenai, how was he in your last mission? The Genjutsu user looked in surprise as Yuugao was still looking down with lifeless eyes, but she was choosing to talk about Naruto instead. Ah, you wish to talk about Naruto-kun, but? Kurenai then stopped talking, once Yuugao released a sigh. Talking about his training, thinking about his training, training him, keeps me focused, at least. Even throughout missions with my peers, I just perform them like I'm not even there, Kurenai-chan. Getting Naruto up to speed and developing him as a shinobi is one topic we share in common and something we can talk about. Aside from him and you too, there isn't much going for me, at least not anymore. What about Kakashi? Senpai has his own demons to overcome as well and I had not talked to him once, since he left Anbu. I see, well, the mission went fine in the beginning. Yuugao then listened as Kurenai delivered her report, especially about Naruto's contribution, since it appeared that Yuugao's interest was solely on him. A part of Kurenai enjoyed talking about her missions with Naruto, but she really wished that her friend would confide in her to discuss her feelings. After all, it was her and also Naruto's desire that Yuugao managed to overcome this with time. However, even if it's about Naruto, it was good that Yuugao hadn't shut herself off, entirely. Equals 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 next day equals equals equals. It's been one day since Jiraiya left with Naruto and Hinata on their joint mission to find the other member of the Sanin, Senju Tsunade. After walking a bit, the team composed of a Sanin, a Chonin and a Janan appeared in a small village where a food festival was going on. 
No sooner had they stepped inside the festival, Jiraiya had ditched them, telling them that he would have to gather information, so Naruto and Hinata were free to do whatever they wanted. Hinata just blinked a couple of times as they watched one of the respectful Sanin walk away with a big and goofy smile on his face, slightly drooling as well. She was more confused when Naruto released a sigh next to her. Ah, Naruto-kun, is there something wrong? Well, considering his hobby of peeping at women, I wouldn't be surprised if he would try doing just that. Naruto then looked around and then looked back at his teammate. So, Hinata, is there something you'd like to eat? This appears to be a food festival, after all. It's on me. Hinata then opened a smile at the offer as she followed Naruto around the vendors. They tried different kinds of food and Naruto realized in surprise how much of an appetite Hinata had. By the time they finished, the Jinan was blushing terribly while holding a bag of tiakas and some cinnamon rolls. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun, but it's been too long since I've been to one of these festivals, and I wanted to try it all. Naruto only smiled though as he had three dango sticks in one hand and tea in another. In the end, Anko had dragged him and Kurenai way too often to eat dango and they oftentimes debated which food was better, dango or ramen, much to Kurenai's dismay on most occasions. It was best that the snake user wasn't here right now, or else he would have to see her smug face at seeing him eating her favorite food instead of his. No need to apologize, I did offer, after all. I appreciate it, everything was quite delicious. Naruto smiled at his teammate, before both stopped in front of an establishment, when both heard Jiraiya's laughter and voice. Ah man, I knew it. Wait here, Hinata. The Hyuga girl blushed as she looked upward. Ah Naruto-kun, I don't think we can get in there. Naruto looked up and then back at Hinata. Well, guess you're right, but we're on a mission, he just can't ditch us and goof off. Hinata then looked as Naruto walked inside the brothel and heard Jiraiya screaming at him to scram. Seriously. Hinata heard Naruto screaming back. Just what kind of information would you get from a brothel of all places? We are looking for a woman, for heaven's sake. Ah, what do you know, you brat. Hinata then watched as Naruto left the establishment with an irate look on his face. Kurenai and Yuugao sensei had indeed warned him about the pervert's true nature. So, what do we do now? Naruto looked at Hinata and wondered about that himself, with a shrug. Before he could answer, though, Naruto and Hinata observed as two men wearing trench coats approached the brothel and started screaming at the still drunk Jiraiya. Naruto then went inside and looked just as Jiraiya focused chakra on the palm of his hand, a swirling sphere of amassed blue chakra and slammed at the grey trench coat man's stomach. As soon as the sphere hit, the grunt was sent spinning away and trashed the vending tent that was located in the back. I trust that you observed the technique I just used, ha, huh, Naruto? The Chonin observed the injury from the man with the trench coat and then at the now sober Sanin. What was that, I had never seen anything like that, it was chakra shape manipulation, wasn't it? The Sanin smirked, unsurprisingly. It seemed the apple didn't fall far from the tree, after all. I take it that you wish to learn it? The giddy eyes that returned was also a boon as Jiraiya understood from both Asuma and Kakashi that Naruto enjoyed learning about ninjutsu, above all else. What is this technique? The Sanin hummed as he took a couple seconds to explain, giving the needed suspense. Why, this is none other than the Rasengan, one of the Yondaime Hokaye's creations. As expected, the Chonin's eyes widened considerably and his mouth started drooling at the prospect of learning a technique from the Yondame. After the entire debacle, Naruto, Jiraiya and Hinata were up on a hill overlooking the town where the festival was taking place. Though, both Naruto and Hinata wondered why the Sanin had purchased a bag full of water balloons. Now, there are three steps needed to learn this technique, though, I will only explain the technique once you master the first two steps, now watch carefully and then you'll have to replicate. Naruto and Hinata observed as the water inside the balloon started moving uncontrollably, without a clear pattern, but Jiraiya's hand didn't move at all. Of course, Naruto could sense the usage of chakra from the Sanin, though he couldn't see the pattern. Then the balloon popped and Jiraiya smiled, seeing that Naruto was observing the entire time. Well, carry on, I shall return to my information gathering mission. Both Naruto and Hinata sweat dropped at that, before Jiraiya left. Naruto observed the water balloon for a while and began to focus. Ah Naruto-kun, just what should I be doing in the meantime? The Chonin looked at Hinata and cursed, seeing as the Sanin ended up focusing more on him, than Hinata. Turning to think for a while, Naruto then observed Hinata and that alone made her blush at the attention. For now, 
I guess we are stuck waiting for him to gather the information of Tsunade's whereabouts, so we're stuck here for now. Hinata nodded, since that part was obvious. So, perhaps, I can teach you how to rile your chakra. To her wondering look, Naruto explained. I gather that your clan are masters of chakra control, but normally the Jukin does not require strong bursts of chakra, just small bursts throughout your fingers, right? Hinata nodded and then Naruto smiled. Well, activate your Byakugan and look closely at my hand. Using a ram sign, Hinata activated her dojutsu as she observed Naruto's closed fist. Her eyes then widened in surprise when Naruto's hands were encased in strong blue chakra, before his chakra began to grow, until it extended from his first and glowed stronger. Hinata even had to deactivate her Byakugan as Naruto's bright chakra almost blinded her. While I train the Rasengan, you can learn how to rile your chakra like I did. I know you tend to use your skills mostly for defense or counterpunch, but I'm certain that once you learn it, you can add a lot of new uses for the Jukan. Wow! That was the only word Hinata could think of as she looked at the smiling Naruto. Hidden from view, Jiraiya just observed the two and smirked, before truly leaving to truly gather information this time. Equals 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 in Konoha equals equals equals. Standing over the walls that surround Konoha, two individuals wearing dark cloaks with red clouds overlooked the mighty hidden village. It was surprising that the village had suffered so little damage, considering that it was invaded by two hidden villages. Oh, they did manage to avoid annihilation and it seems, said the taller one, though he was mostly gauging the reaction from the other guy. It seems Orochimaru's plans were foiled in the end, and it appears that his desire to kill the Hokage has backfired somehow. How pitiful. The taller one turned to gauge the other's reaction. Is that pride I sense in your tone? Oh what's it called, the will of fire, isn't it, Kukaku? It was surprising to hear it from you. The smaller one responded with only a HN sound, earning a chuckle from the other one. So, should we go in and search for our target or what? No, since Orochimaru failed to kill the Sandaime, it would be too much of a risk to face him in battle. Let's go. The taller one then chuckled, before both vanished, but not before the full Tomoe Sharingan I revealed itself in the smaller one's face. Chapter 21, Tsunade. After Jiraiya taught Naruto the first steps of the Rasengan, the three fell into some sort of pattern in this mission to search for the other Sanin, Senju Tsunade. They would move from town and Jiraiya would first ask Hinata to use her Byakugan, which was already quite advanced for her age. The villages they passed by were small in comparison to Konoha, so Hinata was able to use her eyes to inspect everyone and by everyone, she meant everyone. Everyone who possessed higher than average chakra capacity was her target. Jiraiya knew that Tsunade had a traveling companion with her at all times, so Hinata's search pattern involved pinpointing anyone with higher than a Janan's level of chakra. So far, no such luck. After reporting that only civilians and low-level thugs were visible, Jiraiya would leave Naruto and Hinata alone and search for the town's brothels. Throughout the travels, Naruto had decided that only learning the Rasengan would be quite a waste of his time. So, as the original attempted the first method by making the balloon explode, he had summoned a few cage bunshines for other endeavors. Hinata was amazed to see that the four Naruto replicas had the same signature as the original, even the same chakra capacity. One of the clones ended up focusing on her, overseeing her training with the chakra riling, so that Hinata could strengthen her chakra and improve the damage done by her Jukin. Of course, that would be too easy, so another clone was keeping her occupied with projectiles thrown at random directions, forcing her to keep her dojutsu activated for her to evade. Naruto's other two bunshines were on top of a nearby small lake improving on their elemental manipulation techniques, water and wind. Back to the original, he was getting really tired of this awful technique. He had already tried many different ways, but none was successful thus far and all he was able to do was pop a single hole in the balloon, not explode it like Jiraiya did. Spinning clockwise, spinning counterclockwise, spinning clockwise and then reversing in the middle, the balloon would contort in multiple ways, but so far, blowing it like Jiraiya did seem to elude him. Naruto prided himself on his chakra control exercises, he had been training in this ever since he had met the Naidaim, but so far, nothing worked and his hands were getting numb from the exertion of focusing too much of his chakra into his palm. Ouch! The original stopped his concentration as he heard Hinata holding her arm, probably from a shuriken that grazed her arm. Come on, Hinata, you have to move faster than this to dodge. The clone that was throwing the projectiles criticized her, though Hinata just nodded and fell into her Hyuga stance once more, riling up her chakra. Okay, Naruto-kun, let's continue. 
The clone smirked and gathered shuriken in the midst of his fingers with a practiced hand as if the projectiles were always there. This second layered training was suggested to her by Neiji, before she started this mission. He had trained like this for the Chunin exams together with his teammate Ten Ten. The Byakugan was a fantastic tool to use, with 360 degrees vision, though there was one angle that the eye couldn't see, thus its main flaw. Such a secret wasn't shared with Naruto, for obvious reasons, but Naruto's ability with shuriken jutsu forced her on her toes, regardless. Plus, she could feel herself getting stronger each time they tried, and it made her blood pump in excitement at seeing her progress. So much so, that her father had praised her more constantly. The clones with the elemental training weren't doing much, other than exerting control over the element. The one with the water element was busy both feeling for the water at the lake, creating small whirlpools where he stood, with his eyes closed and ram seal active. The clone with the wind chakra was focusing on the bird hand seal, extending his senses towards the air currents that passed by the clone. Like Asuma Sensei instructed, the clone pictured the two swords grinding against each other as he molded wind chakra continuously. Everyone was being successful in their training, except for the original and Naruto was getting frustrated, which was a first. Realizing that he was allowing his emotions to cloud his judgment, Naruto stopped and closed his eyes. Well, this technique was the Yondaime's creation, no doubt, it's not something I can just force it. As he closed his eyes and worked to clean his mind of things, the Chonin just focused on what he remembered from observing Jiraiya perform the technique for the first time. It was truly a work of beauty to see chakra swirling like that, contained in a small blue sphere. The energy was swirling in madness from every possible direction, left, right, upward, downward, clockwise, counterclockwise, diagonal in all possible directions. When he next opened his eyes, Naruto decided to do just that, exploding his chakra in all possible directions, while inside the balloon. The clones and Hinata stopped what they were doing as they eyed the original scream, while riling his chakra to the maximum. The balloon contorted in multiple shapes and forms, but it didn't explode. Still, this technique was quickly becoming his nemesis and he would rather blow his hand off than quit right now. When the balloon then started shaping like multiple spikes in different directions, that's when Naruto made one final burst. Splash! The noise echoed in the dark clearing as the rest of his gathered chakra all but exploded outright from his hand, it was enough that made him fall on his butt and he nodded to shut her eyes from fear of being caught by the brightness. Still, as the noise subsided, the clones were dispelled and the Hyuga girl heard it as Naruto was laughing uncontrollably on the ground, despite the burns in his hand from chakra overuse. Naruto-kun, are you alright? The Chonin waved her concern off and got up from the ground. Yeah, Hinata, I was getting crazy with this balloon, you know. The Hayuga smiled, realizing how deep was her senpai's drive in overcoming obstacles. Well, well, what do you know, I didn't know you would be able to finish the first stage so quickly, Gaki. Only two more to go. The perverted Sanin made himself known the second Naruto managed to complete the first stage, earning a scolding from the Chonin for not being helpful at all. Plus, he was gawking at having forgotten that there were still two stages left, he was so happy to have blown that damn balloon, but now, his victory lap was just slapped in the face. So, with a sigh, Naruto then turned to Jiraiya. So, any luck finding a lead or you were just enjoying yourself? Jiraiya, though, looked like he couldn't care less. Ma, ma, don't be like that, you have to enjoy life, you can't be all mission that mission this. A small twitch from Naruto's eyebrow was enough for Jiraiya to smile and explain. Okay, forget I said anything. Well, I have some leads, but not a very solid one. We shall move on to a nearby village and rest for the night, you know, a nice r, &R would do us good. Tomorrow, I can teach you the second stage. Naruto would have complained, but he had exhausted his chakra tonight, with his training and could quite use the rest. Sure, I guess, perhaps a good meal, I'm starving. How about it, Hinata? The girl just smiled and nodded, happy to check in a nice hotel and relax as well. A nice dinner sounds good, Naruto-kun. Jiraiya just smirked and took them towards the village hotel he was staying at. Equals 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 next day equals equals equals. Silk kimonos, a grandiose meal and a nice bed served Naruto and Hinata well, all courtesy of Jiraiya's paycheck. The team then marched towards the next village where Jiraiya received the tip. Naruto's overall mood was peachy, until Jiraiya showed him the second stage. Seriously, at this point, Naruto was about to throw the rubber ball in his hand into Jiraiya's giant head. First phase was rotation, he said, the second stage, power. As they walked, 
Naruto tried again and again, with the same method as with the balloon. Sadly, it didn't work. No matter how much incentive from Hinata, Naruto wasn't getting anywhere. Calling it quits, Gaki? As the next village came into view, Naruto simply negated and sealed the rubber balls for later practice. No, just have to work some stuff in my mind, first. That's all. Jiraiya smirked. In this second phase, concentration on a single point is key. Jiraiya then turned to Hinata, who nodded and once more activated her Byakugan, but as usual, no one was in sight. Jiraiya was frankly questioning at this point whether some of the girls at the brothels were just having a laugh at his expense, throwing false information like that. If I may ask, just why are we tracking her, anyway? Jiraiya looked to Naruto and wondered whether or not to explain the real reason, hell, half the mission was to find her and the other half was to get through her, somehow. Senju Tsunade is one of the Sanin like me and Orochimaru, but she is also the world's best medic, Naruto. Bringing her back to the village could help boost the village hospital and the Hokage wants to talk to her about other stuff. Wait, did you say, Senju? Jiraiya and Hinata saw Naruto's eyes widening in surprise, though Hinata decided to ponder. Jiraiya knew best about what was going on in Naruto's mind right now. Didn't you know, Naruto-kun, we covered the story of the Sanin at the academy. She is the first Hokage's granddaughter and the second Hokage's grandniece. The Chonin nervously scratched his head in slight embarrassment. Now that you mention it, it must have slipped my mind, man, to believe we are about to meet her. Now, Naruto was quite eager to meet his teacher's family member, before he realized something and turned to Jiraiya. But, if she's such an important medic, then why isn't she in Konoha already, running the hospital? The Sanin hummed, knowing that he would have to give them at least the basic story, before finding her. Like all shinobi with a bad history, Tsunade has lost her way, and unfortunately is still struggling to find herself. Naruto and Hinata then heard how she had lost both her little brother and her fiancé to the shinobi war. Though with her fiancé, it was perhaps worse, since she was on the same mission and tried her best to save him, before he died in her arms. Hence why Tsunade had developed a phobia of blood, afterward, and has never treated a patient since. Her fiancé's blood in her hands had scarred her, perhaps for life. Sadly, ever since then, Senju Tsunade no longer cared about the village, she no longer cared about the shinobi world. Naruto and Hinata were both looking down at this point, in solace at her story. Ah Jiraiya-sama, shouldn't we leave her be, then? If she hadn't come back by now, then. In normal circumstances, neither Jiraiya nor Hiruzen would bother her after what she has been through, but circumstances, the real circumstances, didn't play in her favor, at least not anymore. Right now, Jiraiya wasn't acting like his usual goofy self. You're right, Hinata, though no matter how much we sometimes want to escape from our past, we can't run forever. Then, like a switch, the pervert returned to his usual behavior and turned to his team. Okay, enough with the sob story, let's go already. The sooner we find her, the sooner we can return to the village. This time, Naruto laughed and followed the perverted Sanin, with Hinata looking at their backs for a while, before following as well. Eventually, the team arrived in another city and since it was almost getting dark, Jiraiya settled them into an inn for the night, this time choosing one room for him and Naruto and one separate room for Hinata. The pervert was about to leave them be for the day, when he turned and his eyes glued to what appeared to be a beautiful woman with a revealing short dark blue dress, straight black hair and worst of all, winking suggestively at him. Naruto and Hinata then turned to see what was going on, before looking at their so-called team leader. Oh my, would you look at that! such a good-looking beauty. Naruto could only sigh in dismay at Jiraiya for leaving them alone with that giddy look on his face, while Hinata turned to her second-in-command. You know, Hinata, I'm really getting tired of this so-called mission, I just hope that we find Sanade at the next town we go to, or else I will lose it. The Hayuga Janan couldn't help but agree, before she heard Naruto's stomach growl and giggle. We could get something to eat, then, and then come back. Naruto nodded, while placing both hands at the back of his head. Sure, you can choose the food, I doubt there's a decent ramen stand nearby. Equals 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 one hour later equals equals equals. After dinner, Naruto and Hinata returned to the hotel and each went to their respective rooms as the sun began its descent. Jiraiya so far has been a no-show. Naruto was casually lying on his bed while observing the rubber ball that represented the second stage of the Rasengan. First step was rotation, the second step was power. However, the Chonin was at a loss of how to proceed. In the first step, 
he rotated his chakra into multiple directions, until the balloon couldn't hold it. This time, doing the same thing, Naruto hadn't gotten close, the rubber would expand and contract slightly, but the ball's mass just wouldn't bend any time soon. No, Naruto needed something else in this phase, though, he was still at a loss. A sudden knock on his door alerted him, before he sighed, wondering if the pervert had forgotten his key or something. He was about to grab the door handle, when his sensor skills became alert. His immediate perception was that Jiraiya was on the door wanting for him to open it. However, as he closed his eyes, Naruto could sense two presences outside the door, one only almost imperceptible and another barring on ludicrous capacity. Going through immediate safety precautions, Naruto had summoned a cage bunshine and ushered the clone to answer the door, while the original casted a disorienting genjutsu around himself to leave the room as soon as the clone opened the door. As the clone opened the door, his eyes landed straight into blood-red eyes with three tomoe, belonging to a man wearing black cape with red clouds. That's the Sharingan, but, how come, there's another like Sasuke? This was the barely imperceptible chakra and the one next to him was the humongous feeling, a taller man with blue skin and carrying what appeared to be a sword strapped on his back. The original used great agility and slipped past the individuals, while the clone just stared at the men with the black capes. The original just observed the interaction, as he stood from within the hallway. For some reason, he just stood petrified there, wanting to know just who were these guys and why were they after him? The original Naruto flinched as soon as the Sharingan eyes turned to look at him, the real him, while the other just kept focusing on the clone instead. Well, Naruto-kun, I wouldn't imagine you to be knowledgeable in Genjutsu. Naruto released the illusion around himself, figuring that hiding from the Sharingan was useless. The taller one looked surprised, before slamming his sword on the bunshine that was at the door. Hey, who would have thought that this would be the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki? The immediate information came to his brain as he felt the smashing of the taller one's sword hitting his head. Naruto could feel the enormous chakra that this guy had and wondered what was going on here and how did these two know about the Kyuubi or more importantly, how did they know that he housed the nine-tailed fox? Though, Naruto could also ask about the sudden appearance of another Uchiha when Sasuke was perceived to be the last one. Could it be, that this is his brother Itachi? Who are you two and just how do you know about the Kyuubi and me? The taller one was grabbing the hilt of his sword the entire time, displaying a condescending smirk, while Itachi betrayed nothing. Resistance is futile, Naruto-kun, you shall come with us. Naruto at this point felt his chakra being invaded and narrowed his eyebrows, before releasing the genjutsu that Itachi had planted on him, surprisingly enough with a mere glance of his eyes. If the Uchiha was surprised that Naruto had released the illusion, then he wasn't showing it. However, the sudden water drop beneath his neck showed just how much of an effort it was for Naruto to overcome the illusion placed by the Sharingan. It proved just how dangerous this opponent was compared to Sasuke. Nay, Itachi, it would be quite a pain if this brat decides to escape, so perhaps it's better if I rip one of his legs off, you know, as guarantee. Naruto saw the bigger one walk towards him, threateningly. One step was all it took for Naruto to go through hand seals at surprising speeds. Few Uten Senpukin, wind style, whirlwind fist technique. Focusing enough wind on his wrist, Naruto punched the air close to the enemy, sending a gush of wind straight at his position. Though, the enemy was faster and merely placed his sword in front of him with a smirk. Naruto looked surprised to see that his technique was reduced to a mere breeze that barely moved the enemy's hair. Realizing that the enemy was close by, Naruto created distance by running from the walls, while his eyes focused on Itachi and the other guy's movements. He was feeling way out of his league at the moment and it showed by the worry on his frown. Impressive little skills, though not enough, little fox. Despite his tremendous size, the enemy was in front of Naruto instantly and the Chonin went through quick hand seals, before gathering enough water inside his lungs. Suten Suiten no Jutsu, Water Style, Water Bullet Technique Naruto emitted a blast of water from his mouth that catapulted his body backwards and evaded the blue man's sword attack. Going by his fight with his sword was ill-advised as this guy's sword was bigger than he was. As such, Naruto really had nothing else to do here, other than use the big guns and hope beyond hope that his chakra output would be perceived by Jiraiya, though he hoped that Hinata wouldn't try to show up. Itachi and his partner instantly saw as Naruto placed both hands facing forward as the goblets of water surrounded him. Itachi Sharingan was busy analyzing this strange phenomena of a shinobi having such control over the water element, aside from his partner. Itachi's partner was observing with a smirk the entire time. Nay, so you're also adept at water ninjutsu as well, ha, huh? quite interesting. 
Despite the overwhelming threat, Naruto smiled, knowing that after what he was going to do, this entire place would be underwater. Yeah, can't hold back with you too, it seems. Despite the bravado, Naruto was screaming in his head for Jiraiya to show up already. Suit and Suishu ha, water style, water shockwave technique. Equals 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 with Hinata equals equals equals. At this point, Hayuga Hinata was running as fast as her legs were able to. Seeing that her room was somewhat close to Naruto, she heard the commotion in the hallway and quickly activated the Byakugan. As soon as she saw Naruto fighting against two other people, she at first wanted to go and help him. However, one mere look from her all-seeing eye showed that she would just be a hindrance against whoever was after her senpai. As such, the only other alternative she had was to search for Jiraiya and bring him to the inn as fast as possible. A quick stop and Hinata was right in front of what appeared to be another brothel of all places and she heard the boasting laughter of the man who was supposed to be a proud member of the Sanin. Another, hmm, but Naruto-kun needs help. Quickly activating the Byakugan, Hinata saw that the man was simply taking a seat drinking sake while two harlots were giving him a massage. Gathering enough courage, Hinata barged inside the tent. Jiraiya-sama, hurry, two men are attacking Naruto-kun. You have to help him. The pervert was quite inebriated and didn't make sense of Hinata's sudden appearance. That alone made the little girl mad as hell as the veins around her eyes bulged at her anger. Come on, already. Jiraiya then blinked twice, seemingly waking up from whatever trance he was in right now. The girl with the blue dress had also snapped at attention, looking around as if wondering just how she got here of all places. Jiraiya was up and about the second his bearings returned and he vanished from his position with Hinata in tow. Equals 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 with Naruto equals equals equals. After a couple of minutes, the entire floor was a mess. The walls were dampened and filled with sword marks and even scorch marks courtesy of Itachi's fire ninjutsu to break Naruto's water defense. The Chonin was on the ground, with enough bruises and scratches from Itachi's partner's sword. Naruto even attempted to summon Gamatsurugi, but Itachi stopped his hand signs before he could finish the calling. The former Anbu then used expert taijutsu against Naruto, who tried as hard as he could to evade and turn the tables on Itachi using genjutsu as per Yugao sensei's teachings. However, nothing that he did managed to gain him any space for breathing. Not even genjutsu which seemingly worked against the tall guy, but Itachi dispelled it quickly. Right now, Naruto was on the ground panting for breath as Itachi's partner appeared in front of him, with his sword and still had the condescending smirk. Hey, that was quite entertaining, little fox. Perhaps in a couple years, you could provide a better show for us. Naruto looked as the man lifted his sword upward and was about to slice him in equal pieces. At this moment, Naruto flipped and sent a barrage of shuriken at the enemy, however his projectiles were parried by Itachi's, who was focusing on Naruto the entire time with his Sharingan. Despite the threat to his life, Naruto couldn't help but chuckle, remembering when the Nidaim complained about how much of a drag it was to face the complete Sharingan in battle. You know I'm starting to curse those eyes of yours, Itachi said nothing in reply, but his partner was another matter. So, you still have some spunk in you, kid. Though, I wonder why you're not using the fox's chakra to escape. Naruto looked at the man's eyes like he was crazy. Actually, now that he thought about it, Naruto was still determined to see how to do that. The fox did talk about it. Once again, Naruto laughed at the situation while feeling his chakra coils burn like crazy at the amount of effort he had to use. Guess I'm not a good Jinchuriki then, ha. Huh? Kisame snorted humorously at the kid's joke. Ha, huh, indeed, well, it's over. He swung his sword to attack Naruto, before smoke erupted in front of the kneeling Naruto. Kisame felt something akin to steel blocking his sword, wondering what was going on, before a red toad wearing samurai armor appeared, blocking the sword. Hinata appeared next to Naruto and quickly got him out of the way, before checking his wounds, while Jiraiya's eyes were focused on the enemies. Though, looking around, it surprised the perverted Sanin that Naruto ended up facing these two in direct combat. Well, it seems I got here right in time. The Sanin was smirking, while observing the opposition. So, it took you too long enough to show up to target Naruto. Kisame and Itachi both narrowed their eyes at the perverted Sanin. Indeed, Kidnapping Naruto is our organization Akatsuki's biggest goal right now. Hinata looked towards Itachi, wondering why they were after Naruto, while the Chonin was looking at Itachi, this time, managing to breathe easier with Jiraiya here. I won't let you take him. Jiraiya then smiled. In fact, this is perfect, 
as I intend to get rid of you two right now, Itachi said nothing and Kisame snorted as he then advanced to attack Jiraiya. However, the perverted Sanin was waving hand seals even before Kisame's first movements. Ninpa Gamaguchi Shibari no Jutsu, Ninja Art, Toad Mouth Bind Technique Kisame stopped moving as his foot got trapped in what appeared to be a red substance that spread throughout the hallway, until it was enveloped completely. The slick walls even dragged Naruto and Hinata protectively, while Jiraiya just observed his two foes. Kisame's foot was slowly getting dragged as well, before he and Itachi had the smirk that formed on Jiraiya's face right now. It's quite unfortunate, Itachi and Kisame. You two are right now inside the esophagus of a toad from Mount Mayaboku. You can't escape here. Since you're wanted criminals, you shall become food for the toad. The Sharingan user narrowed his eyes at the smirking Sanin as his eyes worked double, trying to understand any weakness to this jutsu. That all took less than one second, before he turned to his partner in crime. Kisame, let's go. The man in question looked at Itachi in question, but when his sword got pulled by the red substance. That was his cue to leave as Itachi started running on the opposite side. Jiraiya, still, with his hands on the ground, issued a command and the esophagus's bowels moved to capture its food. Kisame's sword worked wonders in stopping its advance, but it didn't serve to save them for long as the bowels kept on going, regardless. At this point, a small shred of doubt began to appear in Kisame's visage, as they were right now inside the stomach of a gigantic toad. Itachi just ran, saying nothing, as he focused all of his remaining chakra into his eyes to activate the power of the Mangekyu Sharingan. Jiraiya at first was certain that he had captured these two, when he felt the sudden technique from Itachi, followed by a noise of destruction. Getting up from placing his hands on the ground, the Sanin walked closer to the hallway where Itachi and Kisame left, only to see a gigantic hole at the end, opened by black flames. A couple miles away from the location, Kisame and Itachi were jumping on top of a lake towards a safe location, as Kisame kept looking at the sweaty Itachi. Why did we back off? We could have taken on Jiraiya, together. Itachi, for his chance, tried to cover his breathing so as not to appear weak, but it was a failed endeavor. We're not in a hurry to capture Naruto, Kisame. Plus, I have to rest my body for a while. Aside from having to use Amaterasu to escape their entrapment, Itachi wasn't counting on Uzumaki Naruto fighting back like he did. Hey, still, didn't expect that brat to pull up that much of a fight, it will be interesting to hunt him down, once he gets a few more years. Itachi looked at his partner in crime for a while, before looking forward. Strangely, looking at the way Naruto fought reminded Itachi of the members of the Root Anbu, though he seemed to have full faculty over his emotions. His movements were precise, he had knowledge of how to fight against the Sharingan and his ninjutsu casting speed was way too experienced for a recently promoted Chonin. Not to mention the expertise in Genjutsu and the fact that Naruto had already taken action before he opened the door, which suggested him being a sensor on top of everything else. Who's to say just how strong he could be, once he starts to use the fox's chakra? For a moment, Itachi wondered if that man was training the Jinchuriki and actually trembled at the consequences of his train of thought. We should report at once, Kisame. Back at the inn, Jiraiya had worked immediately to seal the fire, after dispelling the summoning technique. He, then, walked back to where Hinata was treating Naruto's wounds, with what appeared to be a special ointment of her making. You did good, Hinata. The girl looked surprised and then looked at Naruto's cerulean eyes and his fatigued smile. I had a feeling that it was you who found Jiraiya and warned him of what's going on, right? Ah, well, yeah. One look at them with the Byakugan and I realized that I would just be in the way. Despite wondering why Naruto ended up fighting, the girl was beaming at her senpai's praise, while continuing the treatment just as Jiraiya arrived with his arms crossed with judgment. Never would have thought you'd be that naive to think you could face two S-ranked criminals and survive. Naruto took a long breath to calm himself down and then exchanged eyes with the accuser, who had simply forgotten to mention that he was being targeted by S-ranked criminals in the first place. Still, Having this discussion right now in front of Hinata would only lead to more questions, questions that he just couldn't answer right now. Though, he couldn't know just what would stop him more from answering, either the fact that it was an S-ranked secret or the fact that he feared what her reaction would be, if he did talk about it. It would be even more naive to believe that I could escape from S-ranked criminals. That got an amused snort from Jiraiya as he continued. Though, facing a fully evolved Sharingan and a sword that apparently absorbs ninjutsu was quite the hassle. Naruto had a bunch of questions right now, but he would have to hold them for now. Ha, huh, well, we should depart, or else, 
The inn will bring us the bill and I don't fancy having to pay for your mess. Naruto's eyebrows were twitching at this point as the perverted Sanin was clearly goading him. Hinata appeared clueless at the hidden exchange between Sanin and Chonin. Yeah, yeah, let's go, the sooner the mission finishes, the better. Naruto flinched slightly as he placed his right foot for him to stand, but otherwise he felt fine as both the fox's chakra and Hinata's ointment were working its magic. Still, the Sanin wasn't done teasing. Oh, getting tired of me, already, and here I was enjoying our nice little bonding moment, Naruto sighed this time as the pervert now went for the theatrics. Equals 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 with Tsunade equals equals equals. In a not-so-family-friendly city at night, two women were seen inside what appeared to be a gambling parlor filled with slot machines. The first woman had short black hair at shoulder length and wore a long bluish-black kimono. She was desperately standing behind the second woman and both were looking at one specific slot machine, that was now spinning, while wishing madly that they received the jackpot of showing three times the number seven. The second woman, the one who was gambling, is a fair-skinned woman with brown eyes and straight blonde hair that parts above her forehead. A bit more than shoulder length, her hair is tied in two loose ponytails. Her outfit consisted of a grass-green howry with the kanji for gamble on the back, inside a red circle. Underneath, she wears a gray, kimono-style blouse with no sleeves, held closed by a broad, dark bluish obi that matches her pants. While the first woman was eager to see the three sevens appear on the screen, the second one looked like she couldn't care less, while the wheels kept on turning. The reason behind the first woman being so eager, was that they had lost so much money already in other gambling parlors, that they needed to pay the debt. But, the thought of losing once more was also weighing on them, at least the first one. 7. 7. The first two sevens appeared and the first woman was practically screaming for the third one to appear. When the third seven appeared out of the blue, both women showed clear surprise. It seems that luck must show itself eventually, ha, huh, Tsunade-sama? The first woman named Shizun was smiling as she inclined to praise the one and only Tsunade Senju of the Sanin, who for her chance, was busy interpreting what happened. Did I manage to get three sevens? Still, perhaps goaded by the owner and the rest of the customers, Tsunade had decided to take the winnings and gamble once more. By perhaps the twentieth time of the same result appearing and the coins piling in next to her, Shizun was glowing in happiness at her master's luck returning. However, Tsunade was still looking at the machine, wondering if this was a bad omen or something. After all, this was perhaps the first time in a long, long time that she had won this amount of money in one setting. Clearly, something's about to go wrong. Equals 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 with Naruto equals equals equals. The next day, the team walked towards the very next town in their mission called Tanzaku Gai. In Jiraiya's mind, the city would be his teammate's favorite place to be, considering her little hobby of blowing off her family fortune in gambling and even other people's money for that matter. Yesterday, he had thought best to camp instead of going to another inn to sleep. As such, Jiraiya just waited for Naruto and Hinata to sleep, so that he could keep watch. Unsurprisingly, Naruto had awakened a few hours earlier for them to have a nice chat about precisely why Uchiha Itachi and the other guy named Hoshigaki Kisame, whom like Momochi Zabuza, happened to be a former member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, were after him or more precisely, after what he contained. In the end, the Sanin hadn't sugarcoated anything. He told Naruto everything he knew about this so-called Akatsuki organization and the fact that Itachi and Kisame are merely two of the known members. Naruto also came to know that aside from him and Sabaku no Gara, there were seven other Jinchuriki as well. In the end, all Naruto said before going back for more sleep was that he would be finishing the Rasengan by the time they returned to Konoha. Jiraiya already knew that the kid meant business when it comes to training, but there was something different in his look, when he boasted about learning in mere weeks what took years for the Yondaime Hokage to create. Right now, as they walked, while Hinata was openly using her dojutsu and reporting her findings, or lack thereof, to Jiraiya, Naruto was simply staring at the rubber ball in his hand. He only had two bullet points from the pervert regarding the second stage. While the first stage was rotation, the second stage was power and Naruto needed to concentrate on a single point. Hardly, a nicely drawn map to exploding the damn rubber ball, in his mind. As the rubber ball became his entire world, Naruto's mind started reminiscing. You lack focus. Those three words came barging in so fast that the Chonin surprised himself. Going back, when Naruto started training with the Nidaim Hokage, finishing the tree climbing exercise was proving to be taxing on his patience. Naruto, back then, 
would either use too much, or too little and he just couldn't finish the exercise. It was because of this that Tobarama introduced Naruto to meditation and even added the need to keep the leaf glued to the forehead. In order to pass and come back to the tree climbing exercise, Naruto, back then, had to keep the leaf stuck to his forehead for an entire day, while meditating. Ha, of course, that task savage bastard had forgotten to mention that he would be using water whips to keep me from the goal. Still, the memory brought about a smile on the blonde Chonin as he then took another hard look at the rubber ball. Naruto needed this power, he needed this technique against this organization who's after him. He needed this technique, above all else, to help protect the village, just like the Naidaim instructed him to. The image of his sensei smiling proudly at him gave him strength. However, strangely so, the image of a blonde man, wearing a long white cape on top of a Jounin uniform also surged in his mind. It showed the man's back as the winds gently swayed his white cape. Closing his eyes, Naruto stopped walking, which had gotten Jiraiya and Hinata's attention. When he next opened his eyes, both Jiraiya and Hinata felt the sudden pulse from his chakra like a sonar. The blue chakra surrounded his entire body as Naruto narrowed his eyebrows and extended his hand that was holding the rubber ball. Jiraiya at first felt the balloon stir some, already thinking that the kid was still some miles short from reaching the goal, when the pulse got stronger and stronger, as the rubber ball started shaking violently. Ha! Huh. With a final scream and with his hands already shaking from exertion, one final burst and the rubber ball violently exploded from his hand as the gathered chakra then scattered up in the air. Still, Naruto ended up gathering so much that his body was catapulted towards a thick tree behind him, hitting it violently. Hinata was already yelling his name and checking to see if he was okay, while Jiraiya just kept on looking at the kid, no, he couldn't call him that anymore. It was barely a day or two since he had finished the first stage and now he had managed to complete the second stage. Such a growth rate was simply astonishing, first with the summoning ninjutsu and now learning two out of three steps of the Rasengan in less than a week, as he looked at the Chonin getting up from the ground, Jiraiya couldn't help but see the image of another person. HMM, the kid has the potential to surpass even you, Minato. With the final stage underway, which consisted of not only merging the two first stages, by keeping all the energy contained and spinning madly inside a spherical ball of chakra, the three had entered the city of Tanzaku Gai when Hinata once more activated her Byakugan. Jiraiya Sama. The pervert noticed the change in her tone and smirked. Equals 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 with Tsunade equals equals equals. After collecting her strange winnings for the day, Tsunade and Shizun had decided to spend it all in a nice quiet evening of sake and food. Well, Shizun was more for the food as by the amount of empty bottles at the table, it was clear that the female Sanin was more for the drinks. Still, Shizun was still quite happy about the sudden change in their luck as she was commenting left and right about it. Tsunade, however, was still wondering what the world reserved for her now. Still, right now, her only focus was on. Hey, more sake over here, please. Shizun was feeding her pet pig with a sigh, while Tsunade stood over their table, ordering yet another bottle. Tsunade-sama, isn't that enough, tomorrow, you'll wake up with a headache. The Sanin frowned at her traveling companion. Oi, who do you think you're talking to Shizun, hey, where's the sake? The black-haired woman could only complain to herself at this point. However, the mood in the bar all changed once three new people approached their table. Oh, long time no see, Tsunade, drinking and gambling as per usual. The women both turned to see Jiraiya followed by the two youngsters behind him. Jiraiya, Tsunade yelled in her inebriated state, before pointing accusingly at the pervert, now aware of just why she was winning all of a sudden. What are you doing here, ha? Huh? Geez, is that any way of greeting a friend, Tsunade, now, Naruto, Hinata, take a seat and let's have some dinner, shall we? Naruto and Hinata looked at each other and then both looked at Tsunade, who was supposed to be one of the Sanin, looking quite hammered. Though, Naruto kept on looking at her for quite some time as if bothered that something was wrong in this picture. The Chonin took a seat next to Jiraiya, while Hinata approached Shizun and the pig to introduce herself. Ah, hi, I am Hayuga Hinata. Nice to meet you. Shizun was thrilled to meet another person for the first time in ages. And seeing Hinata petting her pig, made her even more thrilled. Hi there, Hinata-chan, I'm Shizun Kato, nice to meet you and this is Tantan. Hinata kept patting the pig, who appreciated it. Meanwhile, Tsunade was still eyeing the biggest threat at the table that was Jiraiya, even after the pervert's meal arrived. However, as per usual, the man's unnerving and playful smirk remained in full force. Her eyes, then, 
traveled to the blonde Cho Nin next to him, who was still staring at her. She was about to berate him from apparently looking at her breasts, when she became aware of his eyesight being directed to her face. Still, she was in the middle of a nice round of sake and didn't have time to deal with this kid. Just why are you staring at me like that, huh shrimp? Who is he, Jiraiya? Before Jiraiya could respond, Naruto just humored her, now realizing what was going on. Why are you using a hen? Suan narrowed her eyes instantly, Shizun got comically worked up and Jiraiya's hands immediately covered Naruto's mouth, cursing the kid's sensor capabilities, while whispering that he would explain later. What did you say to me, brat? Still, Suan was right now quite irritatingly demanding answers, ignoring Jiraiya's attempts to change the subject. Naruto, for his part, looked at the last member of the Senju and tried seeing any resemblance to Toburama sensei However, sadly, he couldn't see any. Nothing, forget I said anything. You asked for my name, I'm Uzumaki Naruto, nice to meet you, Senju Tsunade. Her eyes widened in surprise at the name as she remembered him as the Kyubi Jinchuriki. Dinner then proceeded quietly. Shizun was chatting with Hinata, while Tsunade and Jiraiya were simply drinking sake after sake, while not talking much. Naruto was only interested in the food, now wondering when they will be back in the village, since they had completed the mission. He still had the third part of the Rasengan to finish, after all. Once the food was taken away, the tension returned as both Sanin stared at one another, Tsunade with her eyes narrowed and Jiraiya with a smile. Ah Shizun, why don't you take Naruto and Hinata to book us a hotel for the night? I want to catch up a bit with an old friend. Shizun looked at Jiraiya for a while and then at Tsunade, before seeing her subtle nod. Okay then, let's go then, the inn is a few blocks from here and then we can get to know each other, over some tea. Naruto and Hinata got up from their seats and followed Shizun out of the restaurant. Tsunade was looking at Naruto's back, until the door closed. I apologize for his comment before, Tsunade, I guess he was curious that's all. Tsunade's eyes then returned to Jiraiya, as he urged for another round of sake. I didn't realize you had taken another student under your wing, Jiraiya. Her eyes lacked much focus, but Jiraiya knew that her interest was picked. And considering just who was responsible for the kid, Jiraiya considered using this card in his favor. It's not like Tsunade isn't aware of many of Konoha's S-ranked secrets and the Hokage didn't object to Tsunade hearing about it, if it meant that he could convince her to at least come back and converse with the man. Oh no, young Naruto is going places, alright, but I have only taught him a few things, that's all. Still, Tsunade feigned disinterest and once again, asked the main question. So, spill it, what did you want to talk to me about? Jiraiya snorted and drank some sake. It took a long time to search for her, so Jiraiya wouldn't waste the opportunity to push her buttons. After all, the night is young and counting the number of empty sake bottles, he knew that they could go on for a long time, still. Geez, what's with the scrutiny here Tsunade, it's been ages since we last shared a drink together. Sadly, Tsunade knew too much about her perverted teammate. My patience is wearing thin, Jiraiya. The pervert pacified her with both hands up. Okay okay, easy now, Tsunade, geez, much too serious these days. Tsunade's eyes now picked up on Jiraiya's serious look and paid attention. Did you hear about Konoha being invaded by Suna and Otto? Yes, it's been the talk from these parts for a while now, though I hear that the invasion was foiled in the end. So what happened? Jiraiya's tone became more subtle at this point. Orochimaru happened, Tsunade, not only did he kill the Kaze Kage and force Suna into the invasion, but he did it so that he could get close to Sensei and kill him. Her eyes widened at the news, before remembering the old man. Is he, is he dead? Her whisper was eased up by Jiraiya's smile, followed by him negating. Though, he would be, if not for Naruto. Her look alone explained just how far-fetched all this sounded right now. Ha, huh, just how could a lone Chonin, and a kid at that, be responsible for keeping Orochimaru from killing Sensei? Jiraiya just smirked and told the woman just what their Sensei had told him. When she heard that the very person who had tutored Naruto was none other than Senju Toburama, even if only a shadow clone of the man, Tsunade's mouth dropped and hanged open for Kami knows how long. Uzumaki Naruto was tutored by the Naidaim Hokage, her very own granduncle. Ever since Tsunade was a child, she always viewed the man as unapproachable. Entirely different from her grandfather, Senju Hashirama, who was a sparkling sunshine of hope for everyone in the village. In fact, the few times Tsunade had ever interacted with her granduncle was in formal clan festivities, the kind of which you rarely interacted with people. 
Rochimaru had committed a vile act, Tsunade, bringing Hashirama-sama and Toburama-sama from the dead using a forbidden technique, and Sarutobi-sensei was fighting against both, but would eventually succumb to their combined prowess. It was Naruto who managed to use the Naidime's knowledge to break Toburama-sama free from Orochimaru's control and thus aided Sensei in releasing Hashirama-sama and defeating Orochimaru. Only once more, Sensei let the snake flee. Wow, that's, quite the story, Jiraiya. Indeed, it was, no doubt, Konoha has had enough stories of powerful individuals who are responsible for miracles, even if this one was closer to home than she realized. However, I still fail to understand just what it is you want to talk to me about. If Sensei's fine and all. Jiraiya nodded, all too aware that he wouldn't convince her by simply telling Naruto and Toburama's story. Yes, well, I guess it's pointless to stir you away, Tsunade. The truth is that Sensei wishes to discuss some topics with you. About what? The response already came filled with venom at the prospect of going back to the hellhole. Beats me. Her narrowed eyes felt like one of her punches and this time, Jiraiya truly felt her killing intent. Truth be told, Tsunade, not even he is completely sure at this point. Part of him wishes never to bother you, after what you've been through, however, Sensei is getting old, Tsunade, he is at that stage when he's re-evaluating some aspects of his life and that of the village. And he's quite keen on having this conversation with you. Tsunade snorted at the notion. You talk as if he's offering me the position of the god I'm Hokage. Jiraiya smirked at that. Like I said, he's not completely sure of his intentions at this point, at the very least, he is only interested in having a conversation with you. Depending on how that goes, you would be free to do as you please, afterward. Ha, huh, as if I believe you, Jiraiya. For all intents and purposes, you are sugarcoating this to convince me to come back and never be allowed to leave. A frown appeared on the perverted Sanin as a response. To this day, Tsunade hated the village, but she had never displayed such accusations towards Sarutobi Sensei. Sensei would never do that, and even if those old coots of the council tried something, well, they would have to pass through me, first. Still, Tsunade looked unconvinced, however, before Jiraiya started talking once more, he saw the sudden look of introspection from the medical Sanin. Truth be told, Jiraiya was using his methods of persuasion here, because the level of scrutiny was rather high, though not so much deserved at this point. True that Sensei may offer her the position of God I'm Hokage, but that would only happen once she decided to stay in the village. Okay, we shall go. Jiraiya smiled. But, one foul play from Konoha, Jiraiya, then not even you nor Sensei will be able to stop me from tearing that place to shreds. Ha, huh, you don't have to sell me on it, Tsunade, my jaw has been victimized by that strength of yours one too many times to know you're serious. At that, Jiraiya could see a smile forming on Tsunade's lips. I'll bet. Equals 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 next day equals equals. After the group parted from Tanzaku Guy heading towards Konoha, Shizun was clearly the most excited of the two new additions as she pestered both Naruto and Hinata about names of her peers back in the day. She was ecstatic to hear that Kurnai and Asuma were both Hinata and Naruto senseis when Naruto was a Janan, that is. Shiranui Genma, Naruto vaguely recalled him as the proctor of the last phase of the Chonin exams and Shizun had even blushed a little at his name. Though the woman tried denying it, once Tsunade came up behind him and teased her about it. Still, they were only Janan when Shizun left with Tsunade, so it was more like a childhood crush, more than anything. The group then made a stop once the road indicated a right turn path. The medical Sanin indicated her desire to stop by a hot spring onsen nearby. Hot spring? Yes, turning here, there is a nice hot spring resort we can all enjoy. Jiraiya frowned at the idea. What seems to be the rush anyway? It's not like Sensei is going away anytime soon, a day or two later won't make a difference. Naruto, Shizun and Hinata were all quiet, just waiting for the senior shinobi to decide the path they should take. Jiraiya, for his part, just crossed his arms, indicating that he was against the idea. Still, Tsunade had one last move up her sleeve, as she approached her friend and started whispering in his ear. You know, the hot springs in this place are mixed bathing. Her smile was evident in her face as she saw the instant lecherous visage on his face at the mention. Then, like Naruto and Hinata were now accustomed to seeing, Jiraiya marched towards the right path and Tsunade just eyed him with a smile on her face at her plan working. Well, you know, sometimes it's necessary for humans to take breathers. Let's take a nice relaxing bath, Tsunade laughed shortly and followed suit, next to Shizun. 
Naruto and Hinata followed soon afterwards, both wondering just how long it would take to finally arrive in Konoha and finish this drag. Hell, if their teammate was here, Shikamaru would have complained long and hard every chance he got. Equals 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 at the hot spring resort equals equals equals. It turned out, though, that unlike Tsunade, the hot springs were not mixed today and such, Hinata, Tsunade and Shizun stood on one side, while Jiraiya and Naruto stood on the other side of the hot spring. Well, it was indeed nice to stop by, it's quite relaxing indeed, Naruto said, almost on the verge of sleeping, while hearing the pervert murmuring by his side. Opening one eye to look at the fuming Sanin, Naruto decided to just ignore it and fully close his eyes, while feeling the nice and relaxing waters. Meanwhile, on the other side of the hot spring, Tsunade, Shizun and Hinata were also enjoying themselves, until all three jumped slightly upon hearing the complaint from Jiraiya from the other side, followed by Naruto's voice. Ah Tsuand, you tricked me, there is no mixed bathing in here. What are you complaining about? I'm trying to sleep here. Tsuand giggled hard at gaining one up on her old friend. Equals 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 late at night equals equals equals. Once everyone left the hot springs, it was now time for a nice dinner, of course, paid on Jiraiya's expenses as per Tsunade's insistence. A few hours later, Jiraiya was already passed out sleeping and Hinata and Shizun chose to settle down for the night as well. Tsunade was out of the inn, wearing the resort's robes and taking a quiet stroll around the property, lost in thought about going back to the village once more, even if it was just to talk with the Hokage. It was times like these when Tsunade reminisced at the memories of her loved ones, her baby brother and her fiancé, both tragedies from the Second Great Ninja War. Both had the same dreams and ambitions, but eventually, they all perished, just like the previous Hokages, with Sensei's exception. Along the path, Tsunade then became transfixed by a beautiful sight of a river nearby the inn, glowing under the moon's reflection. As she walked, her eyes became mesmerized as the goblets of water just hovering around the lake, in fact, the water molecules were all hovering around the center of the lake and she could see Naruto dressed in his full shinobi attire, standing in the middle of the lake, with his eyes closed and holding the ram sign. Being an expert medic nin, Tsunade had perfect chakra control. As such, she was surprised when she felt his chakra expanding, until it reached her position. It felt warm, comforting even, before when Jiraiya said that her granduncle trained Naruto, she was dubious, but seeing such level of control over the water element, there was no denying it anymore. Thus, inclining her body towards a nearby tree, she just stood there, watching the show of lights. Then, when she saw him opening his eyes, she gasped when the water droplet stopped hovering and the all-too-familiar sphere of chakra formed in his right hand. It wasn't the same, the energy appeared rotating and it had power, but the usual membrane around the sphere ball of chakra wasn't there, at least not yet. Still, she could see glimmers of said membrane forming around the sphere, it wasn't yet finished, but, it was no less astounding to see the kid on the final stages of the Rasengan. Oh no, young Naruto is going places, alright, but I have only taught him a few things, that's all. Those were Jiraiya's words back then at Tanzaku Gaia Shiai the technique right now starting to simmer from his hand, before Naruto stopped the flow of chakra with a small curse. He was about to call it quits, when he turned and saw Tsunade there, looking at him. She walked on top of the water until being near him. I thought I was the only one awake. Tsunade smiled at the comment. Well, at night is when I tend to have some time to myself to think. That was a nice show, I was surprised to see that my granduncle passed along his techniques to someone at least. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the mention. How, ah, Jiraiya told you about it, ha, huh, just great. Tsunade snorted at the kid. I may not be around any more Naruto, but I'm still a Sanin, there are many secrets I'm privy to, regarding the village. The Chonin still didn't look pleased that another person knew. Okay, well, seeing as it was Jiraiya who must have told you, I guess it is okay, but the Hokage still had declared it an S-rank secret. Tsunade acknowledged the information as she followed him outside the lake, before she saw Naruto grab a small towel and use it to wipe the sweat from his face. I guess I shall head back to sleep for the night, are you going to? The Sanin negated, though she was more interested in having a conversation with him as she was now curious. I would like to ask you something, before you go. Naruto then turned and placed the towel behind his neck. What is it? How was it, training under him? Naruto lifted an eyebrow and Tsunade amended. Despite Toburama Oji being my granduncle, I never interacted much with him. Well, he was strict, that's the first word I would use. Suan nodded, 
getting that impression as well, but she saw the nostalgic smile on his face, which indicated a deeper bond. But, he helped me when no one else would in the village. Hokage-sama always meant well, but he couldn't keep up with looking out for me and looking out for the village. Toburama-sensei taught me many things, despite the short time we've been together. I will always be grateful that he considered me worth his while and I shall carry on the one and only mission he entrusted me with. The fierce look in his eyes at the memory of Toburama's last words still rang true in his mind. What mission is that? To train hard and commit myself into learning more and more, but above all else, use these skills to better protect Konoha and its citizens. Tsunade's eyes widened at seeing those eyes and the proclamation. This village is our grandfather's treasure. I'm going to protect it. Cause I'm the grandson of the first Hokage. The memory of Tsunade's younger brother Nawaki surged. I love this village and my comrades, so I want to protect them. The memory of her fiancé's words back then as both of them had one single dream. To become Hokage of Kanahagakura no Sato. Ha, protect Konoha and its citizens. Naruto looked at her and wondered about the sudden sad smile on her face. Like a Hokage? He then laughed briefly and it got Tsunade's attention as Naruto was now looking at the sky. Hokage? Ha, there was a time when I desired the position above all else in this world. As you grow, you tend to learn just precisely what that job entails. Protecting everyone is the shinobi's duty and is indeed what I work hard for every day, but I do aspire for bigger things, so who knows, perhaps, if the village deems me worthy of becoming Hokage in the future, then nothing would stop me from accepting, otherwise, I would still protect everyone in the village, just like Toburama sensei believed in me. Tsunade eyed Naruto's and saw great wisdom coming from his words, it wasn't a kid boasting about the impossible, but rather a young man with a clear path ahead of him, despite the obvious obstacles. Eyeing his tenacity and dedication to the mission passed by the second Hokage, Tsunade couldn't help but be impressed and see that for a man like Toburama Senju to believe in Naruto, then he must be quite special indeed. Then, surprising the Chonin, Tsunade stepped forward and landed a sweet kiss on his forehead with her eyes closed. Well, keep it up then, Naruto-kun, who knows, perhaps a few years down the line, I can witness your achievements and see for myself, whether or not you shall inherit their dreams. Naruto looked at the woman in wonder, while Tsunade smiled peacefully at him, before departing, but not before a small teardrop hovered in the air as soon as she left the clearing, back to the hotel. Equals 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 next day equals equals equals. When the time came for the group to depart once more, Jiraiya was searching for Naruto, when he found the Chonin staring at a group of trees in a clearing. Deciding to observe for the time being, he watched as Naruto started the first and second steps of the Rasengan in his right hand. His eyes were closed in deep concentration and Jiraiya could feel the magnitude of his chakra being focused on a single point in his right hand. At this point, it was evident that the two stages were already well mastered. Jiraiya's eyes, though, widened slightly as he perceived the thin energy membrane surrounding the swirling sphere of chakra and best of all, the fact that the kid was sustaining it. The look of effort in controlling it all was evident on his face as the Chonin managed to focus on the target that is the set of trees in front of him. As soon as he slammed the now-completed swirling sphere of chakra, the tree exploded into multiple splinters, just like the other trees nearby in a straight path. Despite his lack of breath, Naruto's look of elation at finally finalizing the technique pretty much floored Jiraiya, but a smile was evident on his face as he witnessed it happening right before his eyes.